real quick. Okay, been talking up. for an hour. <laughs> Good and warm. <laughs> 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 All right, welcome to the last podcast, everybody, with Marcus Parks. I'm Ben Kissel. With us, as always, Hong Kong Henry Zabrowski. Oh! I wear, I wear so many tablecloths. It's my shirt and my pants. What are you wearing? Tablecloths. <laughs> tablecloths. <laughs> I, heard, I heard paper clothes. That's fine. Okay, I, that's fine as well. I could just, I could see a Chinese person Is, covered in origami clothing. Uh-huh. That's awful. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm just ignorant of the culture. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. I just don't know if someone could send us pamphlets or just <laughs> but I mean like short things about China or Thailand so that I could actually get some facts mm-hmm. that would really be great okay yeah Do I you need think to you're gonna listen to those though. facts or you're just gonna completely discount them and continue on with your racist attitudes I just need them in sentence forms just one sentence at a time little bits positive Chinese information mm-hmm. right just send them to me that would be really great that's good and that's similar to how you would teach a retarded child about the wonderful culture of China and Absolutely. The Chinese people, which is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to take you down the very slowpoke road of retarded serial killers. <laughs> um, for some reason, it's just been it's been retard week. It, it actually it's been a, like kind of retard month here at Cave Comedy Radio. Well, I definitely listened to the round the last roundtable yesterday, and you guys were talking about retarded criminals, and I was like, oh man, I really want to know how many different retarded criminals there were because you I mean like my family is literally chock full of the mentally. Challenge. I got some in mine as well. Uh, so it's uh, I'm very My familiar with happy them. Happy and healthy. Uh, it's different, which is so weird because you're so crooked and dark. Yeah, <laughs> it is very. Yeah, bizarre. we're so happy and full of life over here. Oh, full of life. Mm-hmm. Hello. I mean, you would really think that your family would have a whole series of different disgusting mutations, just given your oh no, past we're history all, with frogs and, and no, we're all mentally ill. Don't get me wrong, we're definitely all mentally ill. Oh, good. oh yeah, uh, but we're very high functioning. Well, Jackie and I were the only ones that were not uh, mentally. We just don't have any specific. So you're talking? Problems. Do you have autistic uh, people there? Or Down syndrome people? We, what we kind have of kids? What kind of retard are you rocking? We, we have uh, several with Down syndrome. We have several with uh, with uh, just general learning disabilities. There's right. some. Tourette's. Oh, okay. Um, Tourette's always seem like a fun one. We see all yeah. of my cousins with Tourette's are brilliant. Right. They're very smart, but they're just, it's just, it, it's, Fuck a, cocksucker! it's like when we were kids, it was very crazy. They used to take their clothes off too. I mean, so did I. Yeah. When I was, I was a naked little boy. Yeah, I used right. to take off all my clothes and run around the supermarket, which is why I had to be chained to the cart, <laughs> which is actually true. I had two leashes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a leash around my waist, wow. and a, to, a leash around my waist to my mom's purse, and a leash on my hand to the shopping. Well, cart. it makes sense that you're Hong Kong Henry Zabrowski <laughs> right now because as a child you sounded like King Kong Henry Zabrowski. I was a little naked terror. That's amazing. <laughs> now I'm a big naked terror. You look beautiful. <laughs> you are. I'd, um. So, so you did some research, Henry, and you found four. Actual uh, mentally uh, disabled serial killers. Well, a lot of it is, or the, just killers in general. A lot of it is like the controversy of executing uh, people who are mentally challenged for doing heinous, heinous crimes. I mean, because w- we started talking about it, you know, it's just like, and it's true. You guys were talking on roundtable in sort of general terms about how the mentally challenged are very nice. You yeah. Know? I remember I had yes. a teacher in high school who believed in God for the first time in his whole life because a retarded boy at a birthday party made this big sloppy piece of shit birthday cake. I mean, you know what I mean? It was very sweet. Yeah. But, you know, it's not a good cake. It's not going to be on Cake Boss. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> you know? But it's like... It might be on Cake Boss. But you know what I mean? But it's yeah. like it had fl- they had like candles all over it with like sort of like jammed to different places and he's like, I love you. And like he started crying and he believed in God, you know. And very easy to convince this guy of God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just in terms all it of took was a retard cake. But he was like, it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's all weird. it took was just one retard cake, and that's all. I'm one retard cake away from being fun again. <laughs> um, but the uh, you got to tell Pastor Joel Osteen about this. All it is is a retard cake. You don't you don't got to fill Yankee Stadium anymore. But I mean, he saw it as an evidence of uh, universal love. Is what he right. said, and they, but, and, and that's just the truth. You know, it's like my cousins are 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 incredibly positive, good people, very strong, um, <laughs> but they are like incredibly good people. Strong when happy, reverse of the Hulk. Where they're they're active in their community, they're volunteers, they have jobs, they do. They graduated right. from high school. They, I mean, they 
not really, but you know, like they, they special high school. Yeah. The, the mm-hmm. same high school I graduated from. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah. Now, I only in, in my whole life, I only encountered one violent, uh, retarded person. Yeah? Super violent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this little girl that was uh, that kind of got, she was a lot younger than I am. She had Down syndrome. Yeah, uh, and she it would angry Downs. She would rip her. Fuck? She would rip her hair out by cl- with like. But that actually clumps. is probably a sign of abuse. Yeah. Are you just talking yeah, about oh, Mick well, Foley? Oh, or, if you're uh, talking about, if you want to talk about abuse, here's what they used to do to her. She would get so like nutso and crazy, out of control. They had this small room built. I may have told you guys about this before. Mm-hmm. They had this small room built with one way glass in it. Like no, this. I never heard this. And yeah, with a one way glass know. in it, and in the middle of the room, the room was about the size of our recording studio, maybe Ooh, like good. like ten by ten, something like that. Oh, so uh, it's bigger than our recording studio. Yeah, bigger. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there would be this <laughs> raised platform. And on so the raised we wait a second, wait a second. The room that we record many podcasts in Most them, is yeah. smaller than a retard's punishment room. <laughs> yeah, it sounds that way at this point. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Absol- absolutely. Much smaller. Good to know where we are uh, <laughs> in life. And there was a, a raised platform in the room, and on the platform was a wooden chair. Uh, kind of somewhat of a throne, and on the wooden chair on the arms were leather straps. Sure. And fuck? on the legs, leather straps, and they would strap her in, uh, like with on these leather straps whenever she was bad until she would calm down. They would leave her alone in a dark room strapped to a chair. Sometimes I feel like I need that to calm down too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd love to just, I'd love to just have some time to just sit in a chair. Strap down, right? Just to relax. I think it's gonna <laughs> you know. throw, you know, smoke, uh, smoke some bong hits around yeah. her though, and blow it right in her face. Sweet, that would yeah. also help her. Yeah, she was a biter. You got to do oh, the yeah. ear. She, though. Yeah, her name is Sabrina. Sabrina. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. Sabrina. I'm sure she was a really nice gal. Did not like to be tied down. Retarded people have. They're very smart in a lot of ways. Like we were talking about on Roundtable, uh, this fellow that we know takes care of the slow pokes, and he yeah. is life all figured out. Mm-hmm. Says yeah. kiss him, miss him, kill him. Yeah, the kiss that's him, love. miss him, kill him thing is pretty. They got it all worked out. I would, Um, but uh, but I just say I I guess that um, when when you're low functioning, you are a direct mirror of what your circumstances are. Right. And a lot of these stories have probably involved people being pretty heavily um, heavily uh, abused. And for the record, the Supreme Court did take up the case of killing the Tartar children, and they decided in 2002 in the case Atkins versus Virginia against it. They yeah. don't like the idea of killing retarded people, so I think it's n- it's no longer legal they in try all to 50 do it. states. But that's where the, now a lot of these like death row cases will come down to if it's even no, hedging on that. They will they will do constant sort of visits to like the psychological experts to like right. judge them. That's what happened with maybe we can go to the first one, Let's Johnny talk, Paul Penry. You want to talk? Okay, so yeah, Johnny Paul Penry. Now this fella was so he was borderline retarded. He was a Texas man born in 1956, um, and he was convicted of stabbing and raping. 22-year-old Pamela Mosley Carpenter. Who was also the sister of a famous... Um, American was, football star Mark Mosley. Yeah, so it's like so it was a huge case. She, uh, he, he committed a, a heinous, violent crime against this woman. Right. And basically they used, it, they, they used his, his mental state to sort of... Uh, to, to try to jockey him into innocence. Right. And we were kind of like talking about this before where it, it's just hard. You know, when it comes to a, a heinous crime, a heinous a sexual crime mm-hmm. that it's like how can you wh- what can you say how can you defend this person it's tough i was just thinking like well you know does, how could he be retarded in rape because it's sort of an intellectual thing to do but then i realized that's a totally stupid thought because it's a, probably as, it's as primitive as you can get well yeah. we were talking so about I, I guess retarded people can rape oh yeah like if you look yeah. at um just serial killers and how like they're normally classified so you have a lot of um <clears throat> they generally fall into like organized and disorganized. Like, this is just in serial killers, right, in terms of methodology. And so it's like, uh, organized serial killers are normally very high IQ. Like, the common example is Ted Bundy. Right. Ted Bundy was a genius. To he, some, he wasn't a total idiot. He wasn't, a t- but he had, like, an above-average IQ. Right. He had above-average IQ. It was, like, 112, and he did, um, you know, he would plot out a highly organized killing. Same thing with Jeffrey Dahmer. Highly organized. Yes. But it's like, what he would just, or he would have a, what you could call a playing space in his house that he could allow himself to really let his hair down right. and be as disorganized as he wants. It's inside of his apartment. Um, and disorganized killers are spree killers. They're normally, these are people people that have um, very low IQs. Like, yeah. like, And a lot of those killings have to do with, like, 
sexuality. It's like stuff like, um, what's his name, the Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo. Sure. Except, I mean, like, he would dress up as a delivery man and then just rape 90-year-old women. You ever heard that story? That's what he used to do? No. He used to rape 90-year-old women and then kill them, strangle them to death with their pantyhose and then oh, leave them yes. in grotesque positions, like, in their house. Like, leave sure. them, like, sitting up in a chair with their legs, like, spread up on two tables with Watching a big Watching Murder, fancy She bro. Wrote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. <putting on> his- <laughs> That's nice of him to do that. It's like half-filled-out Sudoku that he just did, you know? Right. <laughs> and just put it next to him. You know? Really detail work. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's what... Um, so so I think that sexual little- crimes, it, it, it's really prevalent in low IQ um, criminals, which makes sense, you know. No one's no one's having sex with John Paul Penry. He's well, got to get. Have you ever had out. a retarded man get hard while hugging you? Uh, I have. Then how does that? <laughs> so how does that feel? Um, uh, disturbing, and awful. It and feels like a, the saddest and worst story in the world. Do they have like kind of? It, it's it's like if you scratch a dog too much and you watch it get a boner and then you sit and watch it. How long were you? No, hugging? Henry. How, you how don't long watch were you it. in embrace with this man? It was just quick, but he was hard. Do you feel like it's because <laughs> your body is just sort of one big tit, t- and he was Could just be. like rubbing against it? No, I have it? a saw. I mean, like you literally, know, I, mean, I would get hard if I just rubbed my you dick. Could literally a- fold hey, uh, my belly. Henry is now lifting up his shirt and <laughs> showing us where we can fold a pussy into his stomach. You could maybe. <laughs> I'm not that fat. No, you're not that <laughs> fat. But I'm just enough to get a dick in. in right, yeah. a, a nice sized dick could fit in there. Or a small, well, retard's tiny yeah. little one. You, you know, have the kind of oi 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 oh the belly I made what? pudding. Yeah. You have the <laughs> Oi oi I made pudding. Did he have a boner before you started hugging him? Yes. Or okay. Yeah. That's okay. that's why Henry went in for the hug. But that's uh, what he really but, wanted to feel that but sweet. But like bone. you remember when you got you got in trouble for hugging too much in school. I was a lover, yeah. yeah. So I it's was like I think it's the same exact thing where they're just vi- I've heard that they are hypersexual. Yeah. yeah. You have the like male belly equivalent of Kim Kardashian's ass. Yeah, like it is just you want to really mm. stick a nice. Now that you think about it, I like me more. I like you more now too. <laughs> Ooh, where's that Ray J, huh? <laughs> I don't know. Get I wanna, me a TV show. I want to see that sex tape. So uh, <laughs> front butts. <laughs> front Henry butts. Zabrowski presents front yeah. butts, and it's just dudes <laughs> fucking my belly, <laughs> and they're just like within writing me a check for fifty thousand dollars afterwards, and I'm like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Marcus He's and fucking I, my uh, belly and playing video games on my phone. <laughs> Marcus and I were watching some Brazilian fart porn. You saw the Brazilian fart porn. Man, oh man, those are some strong farts. Man. Yeah. It blowing looks like it. a ghost. Man, they're blowing <laughs> hair back. Uh. It looks like paranormal activity. <laughs> like, it's like... <laughs> I, wish they were all, I wish the chick was dressed like royalty and be called Queef of England. <laughs> which would be fun. <laughs> um, so let's go on to the next one. Oh, you don't want to talk about him anymore? I mean, that's really just... It, that was just more of an example of... Someone okay. who, like a heinous crime done by someone who can't. Think. Okay, and he was he ended up being, being executed in yeah. 1980 for his heinous, heinous, heinous. Okay, crimes. so let's move on now. There's another fellow which I must give name of the decade. Uh, Triple R, Ricky Ray Rector. Ricky Ray, no, Ricky Ray. Rector, I just killed her. You know, something <laughs> like that. So See, you this can just is imagine actually, that. This is not a full mental retardation, retardation, jazz. <laughs> but this is more a um uh, so Ricky Ray. Uh, was a bad boy. He, he was. was the naughty boy. Um, <laughs> he robbed and killed a man uh, at gu- and shot a man. This, right. he, d- uh, he shot the man at Tommy's Old Fashioned Home Style Restaurant. Come on, guys. <laughs> it's my Old Fashioned Style Restaurant. Ain't no reason to kill people in Conway, Arkansas. Come on, guys. Ain't no reason. Why can't I kill people in my right. restaurant? Old Fashioned that it doesn't pass any health inspection. <laughs> and, and what you got to do is get a it. big old iron pot. I took I took the bottom of a tractor. You make stew in it. <laughs> um, that sounds like a good stew. Yeah, I would eat that. Tractor that stew. So um, this guy, born in 1950, uh, Conway, Texas, his crime took Conway, place. Arkansas. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Conway, Arkansas. Arkansas. <laughs> and this all happened underneath, uh, uh, pre- uh, at the time, Governor Bill Clinton. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And so he um, he shot and killed a man, and he went. To, he escaped. He, he ran and hid with his family. And he's not retarded at this point. No. And so he... And, um, by the way, the reason for the murder is uh, that the bouncer at Tommy's Old Fashioned Home Style Restaurant wouldn't let Conway... Or wouldn't let... Uh, Mr. Rector's friend in because he couldn't pay the three dollar cover charge. $3. Ah, God, that is just uh, <laughs> uh, you get to the door. Do you have three dollars? Uh, no. Oh no, sir! I was like, I do agree. you have three dollars? <laughs> Why the fuck is Tommy's old fashioned home style restaurant charging a three dollar cover charge? Cover charge? That's what is this Studio Fifty Four? Shitty restaurants? Like, <laughs> it just sounds like bit, Big Chet is out front of the door and they're going in. He's like, come on. 
Give me a three dollar toll. <laughs> yeah. It's like we well, ain't no three dollar toll. Well, it is today. <laughs> and so, no, come on, man. I don't want to get no three dollar toll. No, there's a dance hall uh, attached to it. I agree. Oh, right. Can you imagine though. Ricky Ray at a at a dance hall oh, and what Ricky Ray my is doing God. there? He don't yeah, dance. And he, Ricky don't dance. And he killed uh he killed a guy with a thirty eight cal. Thirty eight caliber. So he goes home. He talks with his family about it. They're like, "You got to turn yourself in." They have a family friend who's a police officer. He comes to take his turning in, and uh, they talk for a while with the family. And then the police officer turns around, and Ricky Ray shoots him in the back a couple times, and um, escapes in, and then is eventually caught. So what happens okay, is but right what before happened to he's the caught, officer that he shot, did he end up dying? Yes, he okay. murdered the so officer. So this is two deths so on this man's hands. And two other uh, assaults. Okay. Yes. he's This guy, is he has ruined his life. This is like one crazy night <laughs> in Ricky right. Ray's life. And so he uh, decides to end it all and shoots himself in the head, but he fucks it up and just destroys his entire frontal lobe, right? So he gives himself a pretty professional lobotomy. Yeah. And so what they're saying, this this end up using as a, as a giant... Um, example for Bill Clinton's um, uh, when he ran for president right. and talking about like why we can't severely punish the mentally retarded. But it seems to me as if Rector made himself retarded after he already committed the crime. If you he made wasn't yourself retarded. retarded, that's just points against you. You know what I mean? It's yeah, you I'm lose. Sorry. If you did it, then you're the problem. You know, you're, like, you, you're, you're one of the problems in this scenario. Man, and I'll tell you, there is nothing worse than a botched suicide, especially when a gun is involved is and so it's aimed at your head. There was a fellow who lived across the street from me. He was in high school. He was a rabble rouser. He was drinking with a bunch of friends, brings out the family shotgun, accidentally cool. shoots his friend. This girl, she dies. So all of his friends leave. He has a police standoff for hours. And my parents, had to, we all had to go to my grandma's house. Whoa. Next thing you know, around 5 in the morning, they hear a shotgun blast. The police rush in. He shoots himself in the head, but she fucked it up Ugh. with a shotgun. Blew off his entire face. He's uh, still in prison. He's uh, on suicide uh, watch. No and he looks like the woman who got her face tore off by the fucking uh, ape. He's arse face. He is. He is literally arse, arse face. face from The Walking Dead. Oh, my Dead. God. No, 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 no. Preacher. Oh, from Preacher. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, from oh Preacher. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. That's and, uh, number one bad story. Yeah. Number one bad story. <laughs> so, Rector uh, so, actually sort of got off easy. So, on his last meal, he got his, like, traditional... It doesn't say what his meal meal was. I think it was, like, you know, it's like it's it's like roast beef and something. And a big slice of pecan pie. He probably ordered. He probably ordered something from fucking Tommy's old fashioned home style <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> I just want to get you the Georgian. Um, okay, he, Ricky uh, Ray. They sent him. Um, yeah, they sent him. Uh, they gave him the piece of pie, and then he didn't eat it. And they're like, Ricky Ray, you didn't eat your pie. And he's like, I'm saving it for later. <laughs> saving it for later. God, that is the saddest thing I have ever heard. Uh, they're like, Ricky, you're. You're gonna, You're gonna go. Never, never mind. mind. Just, <laughs> so we'll just hold we on go, to it for you, Ricky. Where we go, on Grandma's house. Very where soon. we go, on Grandma's house. Soon, Ricky, you'll be reunited. I hope you can eat my pecan pie tonight. No. I can't wait to eat my pecan God, pie. Your, re- your retard voice is making me want to cry. Right now, I'm just so full. I can't possibly eat pecan pie. Why don't you guys give me so much food? You're right. It, is. <laughs> it's, it, it was their fault for feeding him too much. Yeah. Come on, yes. He's like a goldfish. He'll eat himself to death. Hey, guys, it's so much fun being here in this tiny room. Hey, you got him some of those beef? I, it sounds You know, you're, you're right. It does make me very sad. Yeah, it really yeah. is kind of shaking me up, <laughs> yeah, to be honest with is. you. Well, the, what the listeners at home can't see is the look in Henry's eye. <laughs> really? And, uh, the, the, and the hunched stature that he has while he's doing it. What I'm really hoping is that I will win an Oscar <laughs> one day for playing the, the very inspirational, retarded locker room boy. Just like... I know if you guys, you, you guys don't feel so high about the game, but... I think you guys can win it. I think you are. <laughs> you're channeling a bit of uh, of your young. What's oh, the, Mikey uh, Shatz. Mikey yeah. Shatz, which Shatz. is the greatest yeah. character yeah. ever. Uh, um, the funny thing about Rector's um, lethal injection, it didn't go very good. It uh, took them 50 minutes to find a suitable vein. And then so they're yeah. saying he was like moaning and like. Whoa. Yeah, they said the moans. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the uh, oh. the State Department guy said the moans did come as the team of uh, two medical people. Oh, the moans did come. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the moans Five did worked. come, and lo, the moans, moans did, did come. come. Five people worked to find a fucking suitable vein in this poor bastard. I don't understand why it was so difficult. I guess he was a bit he of a chubby arms. monkey. Yeah. That's no, you true. imagine doing a lethal injection on me is going to be really hard. I have a hard time with a doctor. D- yeah, I guess it is harder to find a vein with a chubbier person, huh? 
Makes sense. Yeah, you got to be stabbing them three or four times, and I'll tell you what, chubby people are just not good getting stabbed yeah. over there's, and over Well, again. there's a reason why, why we... skinny folks are so good at heroin. That's yeah, true. That's very look true. That. It's a vicious cycle. Oh, yeah, look at that big, thick fucking main line. Yeah, your veins are just cording a needle. <laughs> They are just romanticizing <laughs> with that needle, putting a nice little uh, last waltz with it. And we're going to use this last guy, but I actually like the idea of talking about Ed Gein. Yeah. Um, Ed Gein, yeah. Let's talk about Ed Gein. Of course, he was uh, of retarded movie fame, Leatherface. Also, was, uh, he had based Leatherface of, based on him, and then Psycho, which is more of a high IQ version of him. And then also uh, the movie Deranged, mm-hmm. which is based entirely just on Ed Gein's life, which is awesome. Right. Deranged is so creepy. And when but, we say intelligent, it's in the context of serial killers. We're not talking about like intelligent, like in the context of like people who built the highways. Yeah, like or great mathematicians. Neil yeah. They're still Tyson. stupid yeah. people, you know? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they have, I don't know if it's stupid, they just have a missing part of their personality that like is the governor for normal behavior. Right. Like Ed Gein, well, but Ed Gein was seriously retarded. There's yes. just certain things that you have to do. There's certain things where it's like, in, we talk about it with serial killers with like, you know, Dahmer, and I, I think Dahmer and like Gacy, right? They created alternative worlds where it's just like mm-hmm. they lived in their alternate world and then when they go out in the real world, they shut the door in, on their secret world right. and they can just live their life and go out and act normal. I mean, Dahmer worked at a chocolate factory, which is the, uh, most, be- uh, it's the most beautiful <laughs> job a serial killer could have. Still, you imagine the droplets of blood that he puts in every spine. fifth like piece oh, of chocolate. The fucking bone fragments under his fingernails. Uh, uh, all in the chocolate. It's in the it's chocolate! Right. <laughs> but I would say... In, in defense of no, it's in the chocolate. Don't eat the chocolate. It's in, there's bones in the chocolate. I like this one. It has hazelnuts, huh? There's not supposed to be hazelnuts Just one in that. Man screaming outside the factory. There's bones. There's bones in the chocolate. Oh, mommy, I've never had chocolate before. I can't wait to eat my first bar of chocolate. No, there's bones in the chocolate. Okay, we'll go somewhere else. <laughs> Apparently they have bones in their chocolate. <laughs> That's fine. My empire is crumbling. <laughs> My chocolate empire is destroying itself. Why um, don't we why can't we get rid of him? It's a free country. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a goddamn free country. <laughs> You're right. We can't fire another white man. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so I um really wonderful chocolate. But Ed Gein, um Ed Gein lived in his world of horrors simply he because he was so stupid. He was very, very, very stupid. He and was he, beaten into retardation, though. Well, that's what that's a big that's a big thing where it's like you talk about like the, 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 we were saying before about how like I think that when certain mentally retarded people are are abused, that's all they that's all they know, mm. you know. And Ed Gein lived that very perverse, fucked up lifestyle. He lived with his mother until the house until she died, yep. and then when she died, he let her stay in there. Yeah. Now, how long like, did he let her stay in there and rot? Years. I feel like. No, no, because he had to bury her at some point. Because didn't he bury her and then continually go back to the grave site and sort of yeah. dig her up at times and play with her bones? And because I think that her head was used for an ashtray and her skin was used to yeah. to make the woman suit. And, and her bow arm was used as a flute. That's nice. He was a nice musician boy. <laughs> Who's playing that crude, disgusting music next door? <laughs> This goddamn arm sucks for a flute. Is this um, a Jurassic Park theme? <laughs> but Ed Gein, in his defense, he only killed two women, right? He, he's not really like a very he. He's not a notorious killer. He's not. And uh, I think that what he did, as far as like grave robbing and and putting, you know, uh, making lampshades and, and, and other throw rugs out of people's skin, why not? You know, I think it's more <laughs> respectful to the human it. body than just letting it rot underground and get eaten by a bunch of bugs. I feel like if Native Americans did it. Like, it would be sort of a thing where I'd be like, Native Americans, it's natural. It's you nice. Know? They're yeah. out there. They're already doing it to a buffalo. Do it to grandma. You yeah. Know? <laughs> but Ed Gein just started. When you, I think there's like, when you make a suit out of your mother's entire skin. Really amazing. And you put it on yourself. Yeah. And you masturbate. While it's on you, mm-hmm. well, that gets a little bit weird. That's more like <laughs> I mean, he can wear that is no longer that is no longer a beautiful tradition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a, in, in nowadays though, he'd be on some reality show like Project Runway or whatever show yeah, they yeah. design all those uh, skin wearing freaks. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> show. This way, what if Ed Gein was one sixteenth Navajo? 
Oh, fuck, man. That throws my whole argument in the toilet. He I, wasn't, so don't worry about <laughs> it. Okay, good, good, good. I'm just a hy- hypothetical. Hypothetic. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, smashing from Wisconsin, up, there's a lot of Native Americans. But once you right. start mashing up bones in order to make your furniture, right. it's mm-hmm. just like, come on, man. I know it's a hike to get to Ikea. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I would rather do it this way. People, it's easier to put together a human bones and make them into a couch than it is to buy a couch from Ikea and try to put that goddamn thing together. Those Tell Swedes me about have it. no idea what they're doing. <laughs> it's all the way out in Red Hook, dude. Jesus it's all the way out in Red Hook. <laughs> I'm just going to kill my mother and use her vagina to make a bunch of little belts. All right. Might as well. Anyway, think of it this way. All right. I live right next to the biggest cemetery in all of Brooklyn. Yes. Just imagine the amount of I sofas live you can make. a long way from Red Hook. <laughs> right. I got to take a train and two buses to get there, or I can walk over and dig up some Civil War veterans' bodies and have a whole new rug. Yeah, I mean, it would be... <laughs> you just keep calling into the rug, and it's just a loose pile of bones on the right. floor. So if you're rolling like around, rug. And it's a rug. <laughs> well, time to vacuum the rug. Yeah. No, you believe it. You won't believe <laughs> it. <laughs> you, you, you step on anything enough, and it just turns right into a rug. It really it's does. It's really remarkable. And you know what? Hair lasts a long time. Well, uh, it never Marcus, dies. Never goes. Um, never leaves. It's been a really fun afternoon. I gotta be going. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I'll be seeing you I'm going to be podcast. making a new rug later. Uh, you want to say? I'll be seeing you at the podcast. I'll see you at the podcast. No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> here, 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 here. I've always dreamed about growing up and becoming a rug. But, like, uh, then we were going to talk about sort of, like, famous, like, r- retarded cinema killers. And, again, and a lot of them are based off of Ed Gein. You have, you know, a lot. Leatherface, man. The yeah. number one. The fucking patron saint of this well, podcast. This is, yeah. Like, yeah. the, the man, the man himself, again. Like, this is someone who was born into his crimes, but was like Michael Jordan in the fact he was born into the environment and excelled in it yep. because he was born to do it. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, to some degree, Leatherface yeah. was more coddled and cared for than Ed Gein could ever imagine. Have been. You know, uh, Leatherface, for all intents and purposes, you know, he was a little bit of a slow dude. He had a terrible face, but his family loved him. You know, That's and they true. gave him a job to do, and he did his job. And when he did his job well, they clapped around the table, and he's a good boy, Leatherface. And, he's, <laughs> <laughs> and that means let's he's, give her to Grandpa. Of course, you give him to Grandpa. Uh, is that like what went down in your house? Yeah, At your, when you did well <laughs> in school. <and> stuff <laughs> like that? Yeah, it was weird. I sounded like a dying lamb. <laughs> yeah, I saw that new picture of you on the wall. Oh, the fat one. God, man, well, I was fatter than you. Yes. Much fatter. I was fatter than you too, Marcus. I've looked like this since I was 12. <laughs> You're creepy. It's nice to know your girlfriend is a quasi-pedophile. <laughs> bit. A bit. Um, and then yeah. there's also Tiny from the Firefly family. Yeah. Another retarded person. Again, fun name for a big guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That guy's got some serious problems. And also in real life, that actor must have some serious problems. He does. He has a lot of very serious well, health dead. problems. He, he, pa- pa- he passed, yeah. He oh. didn't. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He died. Mm. Yep. He died? He died. Yeah, he died like a year and a half ago. Mm, of what? Being huge and monstrous. They, they didn't have any makeup on the dude. That's how he looked. I mean, he, they put I face mean, they, makeup yeah, on him. Yeah, face, face makeup, but his fingers were like that. He had yeah. giantism or gigantism. Yeah. Was, he, was he taller than you? Oh, yeah, and he never Can stopped growing. Up? Can we see how big he is? Um, the internet access yeah, isn't yeah. working. Uh, God no, damn he was, it! He was something like seven. He was like seven three by the time he died. Seven four. He's one of those who never stopped growing, you know, and that's why damn. his hands kept on moving the way they did, and they just got long and fucking weird and shit. Mm-hmm. Do you think anyone made love to him? Yeah, probably. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Hollywood actor, but like out that, of just, but just for freakish purposes, for money. Like with, he gave them money, and then they yeah. like had prostitutes. Sex with them. Prostitutes yeah. had sex with him. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, you think he could have had a wife? He could. Yeah, have. he might have. You know, with the 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 with freaks, they you know they find their people. Dude, women don't care what you look like. It's really kind of true. It's freaks really do. Like if you look, I mean, I, I know. Like, there's one thing I know about circus freaks, that and pyrotechnics. But mm. circus freaks tend to find mates uh, throughout life. Like they tend yeah. to find each other. People tend. I to, think like, it's if you're just that. literally doing because what you want to do. Are beautiful yeah. people. But they can be so aggressive. They can be extremely aggressive. Yeah, but we're really aggressive, so that's nice for us. But now when you meet me, I'm like, hi. I know, and then you're a terrible. You were just yelling at your phone. I, I'm going to get a recorder. I need people to see the the <laughs> demon side of you. What's wrong with like, me? Henry's so nice. It's like, no, he is not nice. I'm nice. Henry's, you are a mean man. You what yell are you at things. About well, when I, earlier, whenever you were trying to look up the Ed Gein quotes on your phone, you had a bit of a hissy fit. I was yelling at my phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I yell at things. I can yell and be nice. 
Yeah. Fuck yeah. you. Whoa, man. Whoa, uh-huh. man. Fuck you, Marcus. Don't fucking Hello. make me into a goddamn <laughs> recliner. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like we pretty much covered the retards. It's a bit of a quick episode, but I can't think of any other retarded people right now. I mean, besides us. Uh, besides us, besides yeah, but us. we're not yeah, serial yeah. killers up to this point. I'm They're, just, I, I just don't want one to kill me. No, you know? I, yeah. I think that we're going to be fine. I once worked uh, at this uh, day camp uh, with a high school girlfriend. We did this thing for volunteer. We, we had to do volunteer hours for this like program. We were in high school, and I uh, volunteered at this place for the emotionally disabled. Okay. And the thing was, I was put in the group of what they called the high functioning males. And these were all guys that were like my age, you know, like seventeen or so. Um, and this one guy who was huge looked like a human wolf man. He was like a foot taller than me. Like sit there, massive, massive, so sweet, you know. And that was the whole thing. You got it. You get this big sort of like talk of like avoid sarcasm. They don't understand sarcasm. Okay. The one thing they love is wrestling because it's like it's like one of those things. <laughs> and he's not like like he could have been. In, he was like totally normal. Like we were sat and we were talking and he was just like really normal and we're kind of like hanging out and it was just like why are you here, man? Why are you in this like special school? And he's like, oh, I just got in some trouble in my like, old school. And it's like, what did you do? Like, why would you be here? He's like. I just like got into this fight with his kid and like I broke his arms. <laughs> arms. <laughs> Plural. I love that guy. <laughs> I was just like, you broke his arms. I mean, that's the thing. As a big guy, you just get punished for winning. He <laughs> won the fight. He should be awarded. I mean, he was also r- a rage monster. Right. Well, don't make into... him angry. I mean, the thing is, that I think it's like really easy to make him angry. Like, it's also, that was the toll. They kept wanting my phone number. Everyone wanted my phone number, so they called me on the phone. Everyone's like, don't give him your number. Don't give him your number. And then finally, I end up giving them my number. Sure. And um, they just would call and call and call and call. And then, like, you know, and then it would just be, like, I'd see them. They'd be like, you didn't pick up my phone call. You know, it's just like this like, weird thing. And it's like, like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> they're all like Wayne's ex-girlfriend from Wayne's World. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Wayne. <laughs> if you're not careful, I'm going to break up with you. It's a gun rack. <laughs> I even own a gun. We can do waiting rules all day. Much uh, less enough to necessitate a whole rat. <laughs> I gotta watch that movie. It's so funny. God. Um, no, just uh, be careful around retards. Don't get a mad. They'll kill you. All right. Well, I think that's the lesson for the episode. Be careful around retards. Mm-hmm. They may or may not kill you. All right. Well, good, Marcus. How do you feel? I feel good, Ben. How do you feel? I feel great, Henry. I'm not mad. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, really make sure the brown sauce in the packet is not chocolate. It's soy sauce. <laughs> no! <laughs> There's bones in the chocolate! <laughs> All right, guys. Magustalations. <laughs> Magustalations. Hi, me. Okay. <laughs> Good. Today's episode is brought to you by Bunk on IFC. You can find Bunk every Friday on IFC at 1030 following Comedy Bang Bang. Before he was expendable, he was the law. That's right. We saw the futuristic action Stallone Rob Schneider vehicle, (laughs) Judge Dredd. So you know what that means. Hello, people of Earth, and welcome to How Did This Get Made, the Bad Movie Podcast. I am joined, as always, uh, by my co-host, June Diane Rayfield. How are you? 
Good. And Jason Manzukis, how are you? What's happening? Um, if you uh, are just tuning in, well, I don't know why I'm saying I'm just tuning in. Let's edit that out. Uh, <laughs> just go right from June. <laughs> no, let's keep it in. Yeah, if you're just tuning let's in. Just tuning in. If you're just tuning in. You're just joining us. You are just tuning in. You're just joining us at the very you're beginning just, of this podcast. You are just tuning in. If you're just tuning in, all you've missed is the theme song. <laughs> you have just <laughs> tuned in to miss the uh, <laughs> If you fast forwarded your podcast to this point and are just tuning in, you will know that. Don't we, touch that dial. You <laughs> well, we're just back. Play it from the beginning. You really should. I'm just, just tuning in. Something happened to your iTunes. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> We are joined by a very special guest today. She is the writer, creator of the brand new hit web series, Burning Love, uh, which you can find on burninglove.com. Please welcome Erica Oyama. How are you? Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Well, Judge Dredd, boy oh boy, Sylvester Stallone, his Judge Dredd, the movie takes place in the third millennium, where much of Earth has become an uninhabitable wasteland, and the majority of humanity kind of resides in these giant megacities, and basically... All justice is in one person, uh, these judges, who are a police officer, judge, jury, and executioner. It seems a lot, it seemed, it seemed a lot like Game of Thrones. Like, the setup to me was like independent cities and just wasteland in between. Yeah. And, and, well, It's and, exactly like Game of Thrones, right, guys? Okay. No, not, not at all, Run actually. the end credits. No, run the end no, credits. No, well, no. Wait a second. Show's over. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think we got some more to, uh, to cover here. Uh, a little bit more. Um, it, the movie, yeah. So, I mean, it's based on a big premise that could be executed really well. It's based really on a well. comic book, too. Right, yeah, comic book. <laughs> and uh, so the first thing that I realize in this movie mm. is that even though it's a third millennia, Cargo shorts are still in. Oh, yeah. Because the first person we meet is Rob Schneider, and he's in those cargo shorts. Classics. And he, he, classics. They it's last. The test of time. <laughs> the other thing I noticed, I was like, I genuinely feel like they shot this entire movie on the same set as Pluto Nash. Yes! Oh, it looked it just was like that. Exactly like yeah. Pluto Nash. And I was like, how dare you? It, it, it so w- sound stagey. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's that same idea of like everything is like, it's the buildings on top of buildings, and all of a sudden the Statue of Liberty is in the middle of yeah. of the city. You know, it's like it just nothing makes sense. But it's like trying to be cool. It's trying to be like the Fifth Element, but or, with or, no budget. I was gonna say everybody wants to be Blade Runner. Yeah, yeah. Yes. nobody is. No. Yeah, you're right. It is like a, a lame. It's like a lame French Blade Runner <laughs> that took place in two different hallways. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're like, well, let's just do this one in the other hallway, but shooting this way. <laughs> And everyone also, the futuristic clothes, everyone looked like they were, like, reject costumes from Back to the Future 2. Like, I was expecting, like, Griff Tannen to come out. Like, hey! like I'm wearing this, like, there's, like, in these, like, crazy, like, very bright colors. So we follow Rob Schneider's character, who is like, very excited to be living in a mega city. Uh, and is, oh my God. is uh, He's just been released from prison. Exactly. Uh, and he's now being moved into his new facility. Well, at Co- first he thinks he's going to... Heavenly Haven. Yes. We have about a five-minute scene where he's in a, uh, a spaceship looking out the window. Ooh, cool. Yeah. Ooh, neat. Because when I go to a movie called Judge Dredd that's a, like a shoot 'em up action movie, what I want is for the first eight minutes to be with <laughs> Rob Schneider. Just having a good time. We don't know when Judge Dredd just is coming in. Just exploring things. Yeah. Just fucking. Just reacting. Just digging in. <laughs> digging in with Schneider. So uh, Schneider winds up at this apartment complex where there's a full-on riot. Yep. He goes to Blo- his... Uh, block Wars. Block Wars. <laughs> he arrives in his apartment, finds out it's taken over by these three people who could be in Biff Tannen's gang and back to no, the future. And it's, 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 it's James Remar. Yes. Well, oh, really? Both, that's James Remar, who, right? Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, wait a second. That. Wait a second. Look at, city, I'm right? almost positive it's James Remar, who is the bad guy in... Um, Warriors? In, uh, well, wait, yeah, but no, he's also... I'm thinking of uh, 48 Hours. Isn't he the bad guy in 48 Hours? Oh, I know you're talking about. Yeah, let me see. I don't see his name here on the credits. Yeah. Is it not? I'm wrong. God damn. I, I mean, it's very hard to decide who's who. It's Squatter 1, Squatter 2, yeah. uh, Zen, Zed Squatter, Aspen Guard. It's like, oh. yeah, no one has really good names Hold here. Hold on. I'm, I'm getting... <laughs> um, somebody else talk. I'm going to well, figure this out. Well, here's my question, though. Was Rob Schneider... That wasn't his old apartment before he was put in jail. No, he, was, he didn't know what Heavenly Gate was. Like, he was living... He was moving to Heavenly Havens. So he was excited when he thought it was those hot girls by the pool. He thought that was Heavenly Haven. Yeah, and they're like, no, 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 Heavenly Havens is a scrap so area. he, so after, okay, so after you get out of jail in this world, you you are given an apartment and a place to live. 
Yeah. That's not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. everywhere looks too bad. equally bad, though. I mean, like, I yeah. can't, like, what was he expecting, really? Yeah, he was. Yeah. I have great news, guys. What? Uh, he is uncredited <gasps> block warlord in Judge oh, fantastic. Dredd. Fantastic. <laughs> Fucking He's like, nailed it. Do you it. guys mind not crediting <laughs> <laughs> him? Yeah, He's like, I <laughs> am ashamed of this. <laughs> So if I'll you could it. <laughs> not put my name in it, that would be aces. Wow. I'm sure that he did it as a favor to somebody. Like yeah, you know, right? like he owed the studio something. Oh my gosh, man! All right, so yeah, he he goes in there, and then all of a sudden, you know, he goes to this crappy apartment, and a, a gang a war breaks out. A gang is just in there. Neither they're not really fighting anyone. No, yet. they're about to. They're about to fight the people in the building across the street. Because then what happens is the apartment building. This is apparently what block wars are. Yes, the apartment buildings just start shooting each other across the street. Yes, is That's there just, any sense like what started this, or it's just like senseless? Dude, violence? I'm sorry. Did you not me hear me say block wars? <laughs> Because I I'm pretty sure block, block wars, wars explains everything, even though <laughs> it explains nothing. A block war is going on. It is the new form of uh, gang street warfare. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And now here come the judge dreads or the judges. The judges. Judges. One led, of which led by, in this instance, Diane Lane. <laughs> Diane Lane. <laughs> Fucking... Judge Hershey. Judge Hershey. <laughs> judge Hershey squirts. Diane Lane comes in, and I have to say. It is their their costumes are ridiculous. Like they look like characters out of like Toy Story. It's like yeah. it's too like they look like super. I don't like, know if you saw in the credits that Judge Dredd's costume specifically was designed. There was a costume designer, but then his costume was designed by either Giorgio Armani or Versace. No. Oh. Yes, I'm dead serious, Paul. Look it up. They I'm designed it like up. the name tag, the the yeah. just, <laughs> gold other things, those gold plates. Oh, that looked like watch straps. Uh, yeah. well, Yes. I had a problem with the Judge Dredd costume. First of all, uh, so... Wait, you did? Yeah. I, uh, I did it. I, I thought it made perfect sense. Nope, I had some problems. With got, it. Like, you don't like Armani? 25 pounds of gold on his shoulders. <laughs> they have protective gold on the shoulders. Yeah. On the shoulders. Why? The rest of his body totally open yep. to being The rest of wounded. his body was like spandex. Yeah, yes. Like Navy spandex. Yes. He's like, load my shoulders up with metal, but leave my <laughs> chest and head basically uncovered. Because you know bad guys go for the shoulders. <laughs> Protect my shoulders! Oh, and, and also, uh, when you first meet Judge Dredd, he uh, arrives on a motorcycle that's so lame. It's so lame. The kickstand goes down, yeah. which makes it even lamer. And then he Did comes. You mean his lawmaker? Oh yeah. <laughs> Because that's what they're called. The motorcycles. Uh, the the camera goes up. He hit his cot. Slow mo. Slow mo. You get to see that he has like some protective knee knee things on to protect his knees. A big old cod piece. Yeah. And then it goes up to his gold his gold things. It's all about shoulder accents pads. for that costume. And Just I feel accents. Like <clears throat> accent one pieces. of the one of the shoulder things appears to like end in an eagle's head or something. Yes. Yeah. Right. It comes to a bit of a point. Oh, man. And There's then also, but wait, the best part is, the best part is, just because we passed it by for a second, is when Diane Lane and her rookie partner show up to the block war, she's like, we got to call for backup. We got to call for backup. So she calls for backup to their location, which is the intersection of Abbott, Cost Abbott and Costello Avenues. What? What, <laughs> what are you I saying? I did not hear that. Okay, and then later... They call for, there's a call that goes into some, there's some sort of disturbance at Burns and Allen. What? <laughs> All of the streets in this city in the third millennium are named after people from our era. Can I get some backup at Nichols and May, please? Back up at Nichols and May. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, we've got a fire at Stiller and Mara. <laughs> uh, we got a robbery at Smothers and Smothers. <laughs> I mean, it is crazy what's oh, going on man. in this movie. Wow. That is hilarious. I thought for sure you guys would, would have heard I that. I know. Um, so they go in and... Because <laughs> uh, I wrote, did she just say on the corner of Abbott, <laughs> Abbott. and Costello? Oh, my God. They, you know, So basically the judges go in, they're fighting, um, and then uh, Stallone comes in and he decides the best way to like take down this block uh, gang is to go above them, shoot holes in the floor, 
and then fall. <laughs> Fall from above. Now he's not a robot. He's not super powered. He's just a man. Or all these. Well, he's still well, alone. Yeah, he's still alone. He's still alone. And we don't want to give away the twist just yet. But he. Uh, but he, But all these judges are just. But human. prepare to be disappointed when we do. Yeah, it's gonna be pretty <laughs> great. Um, and he just. He just. Shoots out the floor like a cartoon, like a, almost like a cartoon coyote would like saw out a circle and, go, Foom, and he comes in and he's like brruh, brruh, and he just kills everybody in the room. Well, but he kills them in very specific ways. Yes, he has specific, I guess, gun settings. Yes, that settings he, yeah. on his gun. voice control. Voice that control. Are voice control. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. And like when he wants to take out two guys at the same time, he'd run out into the hallway and say to his gun something like. Double, double whammy. Yeah. <laughs> double whammy. It is double whammy. <laughs> double whammy. <laughs> and then come back in and sort of take them out in a one-two. Well, yeah, like one, the two, gun five. was very, like, grenade. The gun was <laughs> yeah. shooting grenade. Now, this gun did not look, it was not a very big gun. It looked like a, reg- a regular handgun. It looked that like could, a Nintendo gun. <laughs> it did. It did. It looked like the duck hunt gun. Yeah, and he was like, and he would just be like, grenade, lasers. <laughs> and the gun was like, okay, gotcha, there here we go. There is nothing that could be more disadvantageous to you in war than having to tell your gun what to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like that, because there's no way that's helpful. You know what I mean? Like, just right. shoot your gun. You, you shouldn't have to prepare your gun for battle. Well, he also has to, he can't just like he can't be firing and go grenade. He has to bring it to his. He has to bring he has the to hand go to, piece. A cl- go to a quiet place. <laughs> yeah, uh, grenade, grenade. <laughs> yeah, armor he's piercing. He's got to talk into it like it's a microphone. It yeah. is not helpful. Well, these guns are interesting because they also can sense when someone else is someone else picks them up. Yeah, uh, who's not a judge? Who's not a judge? Because then they explode on that person <sighs> immediately. Well, they shock him first, don't they? they? They shock him, and then I think they explode. But if you're wondering at this point in the movie where Rob Schneider is, because he was in that apartment. Oh wait, yeah, wait. Oh, can I just say one <laughs> thing before we reveal yeah. where he is? So then the rookie guy goes, "I'm gonna take on the other room of bad guys by myself." Runs there, one shot, killed. <laughs> that was it for all that armor, for all that headgear. One okay. shot, the guy is done. It wasn't a massacre. It was, it was like, bang. Oh, it and was like, he it, opens it, the door. There's like there's like four bad guys in the room with machine guns. One guy just shoots him. One. Just and like, it, bop. No, boop. Bye. See you later. Bye. And Diane Lane's like, no! Why? <laughs> She's ah! so annoyed. He was my responsibility. I was supposed to look out for him. And Judge Dredd's like, don't worry about it. He knew the risks. <laughs> <laughs> then we never hear about that guy again, though. No, that guy is like, gone. Diane Lane moves on pretty quickly. By the like, way, yeah, Diane, yeah. <laughs> Diane Lane is a stone-cold slut. I love it. <laughs> um, I think Diane Lane was the only person here really committing to this movie. Like, I, I like Diane Lane in this yeah. movie. <laughs> oh, right. you know what like we got to do, everything. too? We got to do the one that's the, what's the Stallone-Julianne Moore movie? We got to oh, do that yes. too. That's a good one. Um, you know, we were saying that we uh, we feel like Stallone is an untapped world that we have to get into. On we've been we've been blinded by Nick Cage. Yeah, and have forgotten about Stallone. Stallone has some been classics. hiding under Nick Cage's shadow. Well, Jean, I didn't want to cut you off, but Jean, you said that you want to talk about where, where Rob Schneider was hiding because this is pretty great. Well, before <laughs> I think before he goes into the apartment, I'm not sure. Rob Schneider sees this little robot walk by. That's... Eat recycled food. It's great for the environment. Good o- for you. Okay, okay no, no. for you. Okay, uh, oh, okay. For you. Yeah. <laughs> me... Coors. I was just gonna say, but but is that the the robot is not sponsored by anybody, right? Oh, oh, just Coors Light. No, Coors regular. Coors, Coors regular. Coors, regular. Yeah, of course. It's like a course sign, like circling on top of the robot. But does recycled food mean that it was eaten? thrown up and Pooped. then yeah <laughs> like what does that mean because ultimately during this the shootout we find out later on that Rob Schneider somehow hid himself inside the robot and Stallone seems to be a covered finds, in spaghetti he's covered, he's covered in, in spaghetti, in spaghetti. <laughs> and he's eating that spaghetti so that I don't understand what that spaghetti <laughs> was I don't understand how what, he got covered is in it is it trash it, it seems poop. like it's trash <laughs> No, I'm guessing it's trash. Oh, okay. Like but to it me, it's like food. It looked like spaghetti. He was eating yeah, yeah, yeah. Spaghetti. No, no, no. Like, they like, like thrown away food. Oh. Uh, 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 I was guessing but that's that it not was recycled. You know, you're well. It is like if you could say if I saw a half-eaten hamburger in the garbage and I picked it out, I could say I'm recycling because I'm giving right. this hamburger a second life. Right. It doesn't need to be processed to be recycled. Right. Right. I, I mean, that. I love that this is what we're trying to figure <laughs> out. <laughs> okay. But that was my guess, is that this was like a, basically the equivalent of a garbage can. 
Yeah, he was. I don't know. I really don't know. Well, because here's the thing. Now I'm now I'm almost thinking that, you know, he has all this food like sort of in his mouth and all these spaghetti strands all around him. Now what I'm thinking is because <laughs> later on there's such a big deal out of him being able to of Rob Schneider being able to rewire a thing yeah. that he was actually moving that robot with those spaghetti strands. Okay. Like those, no. those were the no, innards. No. Wait a minute. You are <laughs> overthinking this. Let's let her figure this out. Let <laughs> June, June, wait a second. Those were sort of the inner like okay. workings of that machine, and so he wasn't so just saying- sitting there eating. He was actually trying to move. Work that robot so that it so would the work. robot is run by on the food that that's it itself. That's wow. correct. Okay, it's so, a self-sustaining. So this robot, robot is so, powered by spaghetti. So, yes. And Rob Schneider was manipulating because, the spaghetti. Yeah. What we know about Rob Schneider and June, you have now posited one of the most insane <laughs> theories in all <laughs> of how did this get made history. But because what we know about Rob Schneider is that he's a hacker. Yes. Like, right. we, we are told he's a hacker. That's and why that's, he was in prison. That's why he was in prison. That's why he can rewire a robot later. Spoiler alert. But you're saying that he's able to hack the food robot by using the spaghetti, spaghetti. within correct. it. Okay. That's correct. Uh, do we think, I don't want to rain I on think your you're brain, wrong. June, yeah. but do you think maybe he's like moving the spaghetti to get to the wires? Maybe there's real wires in there, From too. what I remember, he, he didn't even need to there. hack it. He didn't even need to <laughs> hack it. He was hiding. He did. He was just hiding out in an r 2 really So you think, though, because it's not aligned with his character that he would just be sitting there while all this is going on and just what eating is, the wait, spaghetti. It's not in line with his character? <laughs> on what planet does like character motivation fit any of this movie? <laughs> Like it. No, no, this is the- <laughs> no. To me, it was he hid in the robot because the robot was going to keep going away. Yes, no matter and what. he saw it as a way out. It's basically the equivalent of jumping in a garbage chute. And so he yeah. was also right. he happened to be hungry as well, and then just started I, do, eating I don't spaghetti. remember him eating the you spaghetti. He did say he was eating it. He, <laughs> he yeah, he had it in his mouth. Yeah. I remember it. <laughs> We no. spent five <laughs> full minutes of this 35-minute show talking about the most irrelevant scene. <laughs> It's what? It's why? Well, guys. it's not irrelevant because this uh, scene the is the Judge Rosetta, Dredd, <laughs> the Rosetta Stone for the movie. It's not irrelevant because Judge Dredd judges him, yep. finds him guilty, and sends him to prison. When we lose Rob Schneider for a bit, you don't think he's going to come back? Oh, we'll see. He'll come back around. <laughs> so in the meantime, um, and why does he send him to prison? Because he was h- hacking the pasta robot. Okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Okay. And so then we cut to a prison in Aspen. Uh, the Aspen prison, where uh, a very uh, intimidating Armand DeSante is <laughs> is being uh, in a special uh, a special cell. The warden comes in. This is what I didn't understand. The warden gives him like a gift, a yeah. present, yeah, a present. Your, your anonymous benefactor, right, has sent you a gift. And hey, I, guess what you don't do. When you are the warden of a maximum security prison and you have an incredibly dangerous prison, yes. allow anonymous people to send them stuff. <laughs> exactly. Because or like not look at what not, yeah, not even open it. Because like, he opens it. He opens it. There's a picture of the benefactor who's a news reporter. No, no, no. That's the picture of the person he's supposed to kill. Yeah. Oh, I, what I it is? Same thing what it is is the, a, the judge dread badge. Yes. And the picture of the person he's supposed to assassinate. So who sent him that? But he had a Rico badge in there, I thought. The guy. No, I thought it said Dread. I thought that was so that that's why he was. Remember? Oh, I thought right. it said Rico. Because his don't... name. All right, we'll no, His it name is say, Rico. His it name had is Rico. To say dread it had to because say Dread. That's who he walked in as. But who sent him that? The, oh, the guy who takes over for Max von Sydow. Oh, all right, all right. Because right, remember, right, he right. goes and finds that guy, and the guy's like, "We were supposed to meet. We were supposed to meet in secret." Meanwhile, okay. all the all the council members who run America now are foreign. Yes, which is bizarre. <laughs> well, the, the, we, yeah. we don't even know if it's America. It's just the world. They're all living in Mexico. I, yeah, I guess know. so. So I even this know isn't it, like Aspen, Colorado. Oh, I oh, I guess is. you know. You're right. Actually, you're 100 percent right. It is Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> um, they go. So he gets this like credit card. Whatever that turns into a gun. Now this is my issue Wait, with it's not a credit card that turns into a gun. <laughs> I mean, it was That's like, it super was, confusing. It was like it was like a little like credit it card. It was like thing. a box. It was, it was like, like a box, a like, very thin tiny. box, a very thin yeah. box that turned into that had stuff in it and then turned into a gun. Yeah. Yes, you're right. <laughs> um, but this is where I was most confused. The it war- would have been a huge problem if it was like a Visa card that turned into a gun. <laughs> 
<laughs> the warden walks into the you know the the high the uh, the prison and cameras scan him up and down. He's like voice activation. He's like a warden so and so. Okay, and it lets him go in. And then later on in the thing, once he gives uh, Rico the gun, Rico shoots the guy in the throat, so he can't voice activate uh, voice activate the security systems. But the cameras then shoot him. But it's cameras. <laughs> And voice activation. So you'd think there would be a stopgap at one level. It wasn't just like the cameras were. The cameras shoot the warden. And yeah. So like the, it, it's not <laughs> constantly looking for voice recognition. No. Yeah. You know what I mean, like it's not a constant test. Like he's already passed. Yeah. But then when he says to the things like, shoot him, or what does it say? It says voice not recognized, and it shoots him, the warden instead. Yeah. Which again, we've been established that these cameras are on the guns too. So. <laughs> There's a, one, there's a fail safe that went wrong here uh, when the guy gets shot. Well, again, I have to go back to it. I know we just oh, discussed boy. it, but... The pasta that's robot? spaghetti. <laughs> no. The, the warden... <laughs> the warden maybe is the, bringing... Maybe the spaghetti short-circuited in the camera guns. <laughs> maybe, maybe. The warden is bringing, I would say, the most dangerous prisoner in this entire prison, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just a... Okay, a he's gift. so dangerous that he's got this like protective shield around. He's him. like in a magneto like Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. yeah, it's essentially Hannibal Lecter, and he just drops off a present for him. Yeah, and That's- also not only that, but like in when he goes in, the guy's in like a protective shield, and he's like shields down. There are no other guards in yes. the room, no. so now the warden is alone in a room with the most dangerous, like but he's got murderer. his voice activation. I guess those guns, yeah. Guns behind. I guess that's it. Yeah. You know, that's what he. But I was like, why would you do that? Why would you? And then also, again, why give an assassin, like an assassin or whatever he is, like a murderous maniac, an anonymous gift? (laughs) I. And then the warden goes, "What is it?" (laughs) The warden goes. What, what is, is it? it? Hey, guess what, dum dum? If you should know what you're giving what the murderers <laughs> in the your most prison. Hey, scary person. Oh, hey, yeah. someone dropped this off for you. What is it? It's a gun. Boom, you're dead. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> damn! I should check that. Oh, there, bananas. No, no X-rays. And no I one gotta playing say, with I gotta it. I got to ask another question. Why is it the warden's responsibility to drop this off? Hey, the warden likes to deal with his prisoners. He's a hands-on okay. warden. He's a All hands-on. Right. He wants to make friends. Okay. Now. Uh, meanwhile, Judge Dredd's in trouble because he killed all those people on the street, um, uh, in the street wars, and now he's being sentenced to... No, no, no. No. No, no, no. That's not why he's in trouble. What? He's in trouble. Oh, oh okay. So, so he's in trouble because then Rico, Rico, Armando Sante, yeah. leaves. He has the Judge Dredd badge. Uh-huh. He goes. He gets a judge uniform, and then he goes and he assassinates... No, no, no. But before this, he was... Uh, Getting a talking to he's, he's in like, trouble. You have to go teach. He's getting, yes, he's getting Because he killed the people, yeah. I'm sorry. I he's thought you were jumping ahead. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Yeah. You're right. No, no, you're 100% right. Yeah, I thought so, you were jumping ahead. No, no, he, okay, he, he killed some people in the street, and they're like, hey, you got to go teach class now. Ethics. Yeah, you got to go teach <laughs> ethics. So he goes to this class with a bunch of, like, young judges. Cadets. And they start firing on people in Judge Drake. Like, they're... Their target practice is people in Judge Dredd costumes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize Which that. Which is yeah. also odd. It's like, why would cops be firing at cops? Like, <laughs> get think- it, get it, get it, get it. Yeah, yeah, you killed it. You killed the yeah. judge. He was supposed to be demonstrating, like, the protective gear. That but the, he was like, this yeah. will be yours when you graduate. <laughs> Wait, but like how we have we gotten somebody... this far into this before you bust out your Stallone impression, Erica? How dare you hold out on us? I just wanted to make it special. Um, but like, we just saw somebody die very easily. Wearing, yeah, do that uniform. Wearing that uniform. Very uniform. If you're a very bad shot, you may hit some of the armor that's, that's oddly placed. If you shoot at kneecaps, cod pieces, and shoulders, this will protect you for the rest of your life. Anywhere else you are, you are done for. Oh, man. So he's teaching classes and then give this really depressing long monologue about, you know, the, uh, the, you know the, the life of the judge is that you judge and then you judge. And then we find out that if you're a good judge, then you retire by being sent out into the, the, uh, cursed, the earth. cursed earth. On the long to, walk. On the long walk to just dole out judgment for the rest of your days. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah, you I don't... Uh, was confused about that. Well, we see, <laughs> we see Max 
Von, von Sido. Sido. Von, how do you pronounce it? Oh, I say Von, von Sido. 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 Oh, yeah. Von Sido. I'm Sido, not yeah, Sido. whatever, either way. On the long walk later on in the movie. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like he's, like, going out to die. Like, yes. There's, yeah. Right. Well, okay. I think that's part of it. I think that oh, you that's don't, a part of it. I think that the idea is that you will die. Like, you judges don't die. They are killed. I guess, right? I mean, it seemed to me to be like a like a kind of like uh, almost barbaric. Like you've outworn your purpose. Now wander in the wilderness. Wander in the wilderness. (laughs) As long as you survive is how long you survive. But the presumption is you are now walking to your death. So that's sort of like the Native Americans, how they would just, you know. It's when you exactly got, like when the Native you, Americans. When you got to a certain age, it's you're, based not, you're, on not gonna, you're not going to be yep. a burden on this your community, a, yep. and you just go for a walk. Well, to yep. me, it was like. That's kind of beautiful. To me, it was like Marley and me when the dog knew he was going to die. He oh, goes yes. out by that tree and then and, and, and lets it all happen. You know what we've oh, not beautiful. talked about? Is the fact that the judges have co ed locker rooms. Oh, yeah. Yes! They have co-ed locker rooms, and at the beginning of the movie, Diane Lane comes up to Judge Dredd, and she's like trying to talk to him like a human being. He's like, I don't, I don't understand. And she's like, haven't you ever had a friend? And he goes, yes. And she goes, what happened? And he closes his locker, and he goes, I judged him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, here's what I, I thought about him. that, though, the locker room situation. I actually think that I mean, my, world, my impression isn't as good as Erica's. I'm sorry. No. I'll, do a, I'll do it again. Yeah, do it. <laughs> but I think that I'm not sure that in this world, judges or anyone have genitals and that there's like, I'm serious. I'm dead <laughs> well, serious. Well, they have a giant cock piece. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. wait. Piece, so let's let June chase this right. down because this because, is interesting. First, the foster first robot all, now. They're filled with spaghetti. <laughs> they, <laughs> they're made of spaghetti. They've got they spaghetti those, genitals. They wear those spandex outfits the whole time in the, yes. in the locker room. Mm-hmm. So we never see anyone's body, really. And then later on, when Rico's making clones of himself, those clones, from what we see, do not have genitalia. Well, they weren't from fully formed. In so the last thirty the minutes, last, yeah. <laughs> the last thirty minutes was saved for the sex <laughs> yeah. organs. But and oh, by God. the way, Judge Dredd uh, uh, and Rico are the only—I mean, spoiler alert—are yeah. the only artificially made judges. Everybody else is just like right. they're Human just like the being. police force. Yeah. basically. they're just people who signed up to be judges, and now they're cadets and blah. Like Diane Lane. Has a stone cold vagina in this movie. Like she's looking. Well, she would use it. She wants, she wants to, get, to use it on she Judge. She wants Dredd. to get plugged but, by Dread. <laughs> she wants her to judge him with his dick. <laughs> he's like. Okay. He's like. Okay. He whispers to his dick, "Come," and then just fucks her so that that's what comes out of it. <laughs> Okay. His dick is like his gun. Right. Guys, do you get it? Oh, so yes. hopefully, hopefully he doesn't say to his dick, "Signal flare." <laughs> Right, guys? Uh, Signal, absolutely. Signal flare? Absolutely. All right. my so, thing, I, I don't understand sex. My favorite thing about their <laughs> locker room conversation is that she's like, that was really depressing what you told them. Like, the, yeah. the cadets, like, yeah. what, how do you want to sugarcoat it? This world is so depressing. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody yeah. dies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you don't want, you want to sugarcoat the world where everywhere is desert, and in the desert there are cannibals, and in the mega cities it's like, it's, yeah, it's, you, you shouldn't be alive. And There's, she's like, I have friends. Like, I hang out. Like, where does she hang out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we never see her with friends either. She well, let her to... partner die, and she never talks about him again. She's never like, grieves. I've got friends. We go to that Pluto Nash bar all the time. We're having a great time. We go see Jay Moore sing his song. Yeah, we're going to go to Lunar Beach. (laughs) Uh, I got one of those Randy Quaid robots to keep me company. Guys, why is there a giant robot in this movie? Oh. Like from Real Steel? Yeah, Real Steel. Why is there a fucking... Rico Rico decides to pull out the old big giant robot to do his bidding. Now, Rico is a judge who was judged by Stallone. They were brothers, but not really brothers. And but really brothers. They're like test tube brothers. But they didn't know that. It's like right. twins. Yeah. They're like <laughs> they were twins. They are twins. Um, uh, do you feel like that Armand DeSante was trying to do a Stallone impression? Yes. A little bit. Yes, yeah. But, yes. But I got to say, that's the one thing about this movie I really bought by the end, that they, to me, they were starting to look a lot like each other. And <laughs> sound like each other. No, I actually thought it was good casting. Yeah, it was you really know, good like casting. They, were, they did seem alike Related. in a, in a yeah. good way. Their eyes were spaced yep. in the mm-hmm. same, like this exact same distance from each other. Yeah. Um, that's well, what I noticed to the eye spacing. <laughs> I was like, are they related? Well, let me check out the one marker of relatedness, eye spacing. Ooh, they did a good job. The I casting d- director was like, we're looking for the same eye spacing. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, all ethnicity. If but... you can please submit actors who have 23 <laughs> centimeters so between their right and left eyes. 
<laughs> Look, oh. you would have gotten the part, but it, you had 19 Not centimeters. Not gender specific. <laughs> eye spacing, eye spacing. specific. Um, I fucking lost it again <laughs> to that guy who's got perfect eye spacing. <laughs> uh, I would like to actually play this clip. This is a clip of uh, just Armand Asante and Sylvester Stallone just yelling at each other. And this is like a perfect <laughs> example of them both losing their voice. So take a listen to this. Why did you judge me? You killed innocent people. The means to an end. You started a massacre. I caused the revolution. You betrayed the law. Law. I love that clip. I love the fact that there's like just Armand Asante is going, <laughs> doesn't even make any, like Armand Asante out Stallone Stallone to his face. He's just vocalizing. These two brothers. Anyway, so Stallone's framed in his, uh, for killing this reporter who's doing stories on the fact that these judges have too much power. Now, here's my question. When Stallone is framed for killing this reporter, how come he himself is not judged and executed right then and there? He goes to a court. It um, defeats the whole purpose of the movie. Well, no, I assume because the judges can't judge each other. They have to be judged by the council. But he judged Rico, who was a judge. Oh, oh good God, call. And sent Rico to prison. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. guess there are some situations where there are trials. But 90... 98% of the time. When you kill news reporters, <laughs> that calls for a special trial. <laughs> a special tribunal needs... Because it was... There is... You know, there's a videotape of Judge Dredd coming in, killing... By the way, a really shoddy videotape. Like, but in a thousand years... Videotape footage should be flawless. Well, well also, weird thing about why would this guy movie? have a camera in his living room? Don't know. <laughs> Here's the whole weird thing about the movie. Because he's a pervert? Yeah. That's for his home sex tapes, and he was like, oh, good thing it caught my murderer. By the way, I felt like when he was shot up in that in his apartment with his wife there, who we've just gotten to know, who's like this kind of sweet lady. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was just dark to me. It was like... Why do we have to put her in there? I don't know. Oh, upsetting. why does she have to be sacrificed? Why so, do they have to kill Vargas? Well, okay, well, no, but you know what, though? <laughs> to be honest, she was cheating on him. So, you know, with she, the was pasta cheating robot? On him. she was cheating on him <laughs> with a pasta robot. So, really, to be honest with you, Jean, like, she kind of deserved she it. She deserved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She well, was I'll a real bitch. That. She was no, a real I feel a lot better about it. She, and she was here's, a racist. Here's the fatal flaw of the movie, though. We're supposed to. This the, one? This the, is the, fatal the only flaw? one. The only one. There, we're supposed to be. Okay, so there are these two brothers, one who doesn't believe in the law at all, and wants this sort of lawless land, right, right, of just complete chaos. Yeah. And the other who abides by the law and whose whole life is the law and the code of ethics around the law. But the problem is, is that Stallone is actually a very trigger-happy cop. He's not <laughs> at all, like, this fair, reasonable, ethical cop. Am I right? Well, I mean, he only no. kills people that are killing people. Yeah. Yeah. But he's very quick to judge people. He sent Schneider to <laughs> jail for being in that. But that's the law. He has the, the book. You know, he's the got book. the he, but what then, he but is, to, is. Okay, but riddle me this. Then why is he sent? Me this. Why is he sent to cadet school to go over the code of ethics? Well, I not think to go over it. Not, not to go over it because the, I think Max von Sydow. Okay, because here's why. This is what I think. So, <clears throat> Judge Dredd and Judge Rico are brothers, right? Their cr their <laughs> yes. test tube, uh, the test tube. They were created by the council to be the perfect judges, right? Yes. But what they accidentally did was create men without remorse, right? And what Rico turned into, what one of them says at the time, one uh, one of them says, instead, Rico turned into the perfect criminal. Right, and Judge Dredd turned into the perfect judge. But I, I think I, he, think, the, I think that's exactly judge. how it's described in the movie too. It's like yeah, something happened, and he became the perfect criminal. Yeah, and that's like all the explanations. Yeah, but I think what they, it I is think like he twins. Him to one do. became the perfect genetic person, and the other one was the sloppy <laughs> Danny DeVito. I think, I think Rico's DeVito, sad. and uh, <laughs> and Schwarzenegger is Stallone. I think he sends him to do ethics because I think Max von Sydow is worried that he lacks some humanity or some human empathy or something like that is the problem, and he wants him to attach more to people. He's so wearing are you, colored so contacts, though, right? Is, oh, he? is he von Sydow? No, Stallone. 
Does he oh. have blue eyes? Oh, wow. oh, man. I, I like, only know how that. far apart they are. I do not know the color. I think you're, you're probably the right. The amount that we're talking about <laughs> eyes in this podcast is unbelievable. Um, For a movie that takes place a lot of time with people wearing visors. <laughs> yeah, Stallone guess, is wearing a helmet. By the way, in the comic book, Judge Dredd never takes off his helmet. In this one, Stallone's like, all right, yeah, I'll take this yeah, off. I'll take this off immediately. It um, just doesn't seem to me that Stallone is the perfect yes, he is wearing judge contacts. to begin with. Okay, good. He's the one everybody... Okay, this is what I think. Judge Dredd is essentially RoboCop. Right. Yeah. right. But he's not a robot, and he's just a good cop. I mean, all those judges are like that, right? I guess. No, no, no. They're all just like regular police. That's what I'm saying. But he's, I mean, to his knowledge, until later he in the movie... He is too... I think what the point is, he's too severe. But he's That's not what killing, I'm saying. But he's, he's not killing severe. normal people or anything like that. He's just... He's too, he's too by the book. He judges Rob Schneider and sends him to prison because that's what the book For says. For he didn't really commit. Yeah, he did. He did monkey with the pasta yeah. robot. <laughs> he hacked the what? pasta robot. What? <laughs> <laughs> this is the most insane conversation. <laughs> you really want to make a case out for Judge Dredd. He's the good guy. He's, <laughs> he's a little like, look, he's emotionless. He's, just, he's, he's a just little by the book. by the book. He's too by the book, and the book says he violated his parole, and he was tampering with a fucking poster right. robot. So he goes <laughs> back, to, go back to, jail. to jail. Those are the rules. What Judge Dredd doesn't have is the ability to make in the moment decisions about like, oh, extenuating circumstances right. tells me you were trying to escape a murderous situation. He just is going by the book. Right. You, you fucked with the poster robot, right. and you got to go to you jail. You got to go to Aspen. The... <laughs> you got to go to Aspen, which jail. is now a terrible place. Yeah, Aspen really went downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, this is the best conversation we've ever had. Uh, so Stallone is uh, is found guilty of killing Vartis, the reporter, not his wife. And by the uh, way, Diane Lane represents him. Oh yeah, Diane Lane yeah. is his top lawyer. Of her cla- top because, of her class in law understanding or whatever. Because she's a judge. They're all lawyers. I mean, that's the other thing. They're all lawyers in this world. They yeah. don't need right. lawyers. He, he really could represent himself. Right. Yes. And then he's found guilty. And when he's found guilty, he gives this speech. And what was the result? of the computer check of the DNA coding on those bullets. The DNA is a perfect match for Judge Joseph Dredd. It's alive! The evidence is impossible! It's impossible! I never broke the law! I am the law! Which is, I think, Oscar-worthy at at best. I'm shocked he did not. I'm in his other law! You gotta believe me! You gotta believe me! So he is now... Say it! Say it! (laughs) So, you know, he is sent to Aspen. And the and, reason why he's found guilty is because they find his DNA. Yes. On the on bullets. The gun. On the yeah. bullets. On the bullets. On the bullets. Which the bullets. makes sense when you find out that he is actually genetically mutated in Armand DeSante's. Gene- the yeah. same genetic. Yeah. Oh, same, same genetic. Same genetic. This is my favorite. Spacing. Perfect yeah, crime. Yeah, spacing. Perfect now, crime. This is where, this is what happened. This is my favorite part of the movie. Found, found guilty for similar eye spacing. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes are 20 <laughs> centimeters apart. <laughs> my favorite part of the movie comes at this section. He's sent to Aspen. He gets on this flight uh, with Rob Schneider. The plane is shot. Reunited. Reunited at last. It feels so good. Uh, <laughs> the plane is shot down by some cowboy cannibals. Yep. Who decide they're going to eat everyone on this flight. Yeah. And they're so excited to and shoot down this plane. <laughs> because the harvest the- has come. Yep. Yes, exactly. Oh, that my gosh. That's upsetting. So these cowboys are going to eat eat everybody. Rob's, Rob Schneider is like, don't eat me. Don't eat me. I got warts and eczema and zits. That was his defense on not getting eaten. We, we've also not... Please, I mean, it is it is like an inbred... It's basically hillbillies. Yes. Is yeah. what it is. It's like an inbred dad, his two sons, who are like gross animals, and then a cyborg. <laughs> and then a half-man, half-metal machine cyborg... Yes. ...who has an arm that is like a gun and a blade and like scissors. I don't even... Ball, a ball at the end of the... I literally... <laughs> There is a giant round ball at the end of it. First generation, what was going on? First generation Edward Scissorhands. It was so crazy. It doesn't have another arm at all. No, missing one full arm. If you can make that arm a robotic insaneathon, but you can't give him another arm.
arm no. at all. <laughs> the other arm is just amputated. Like, what are you doing? You're doing some things wrong. Yes. You're definitely doing some things. Now, they... Now, uh... There's some like there's some logic jumps from this part of the movie on which there I there are uh, yeah because up until one. this point it's made perfect <laughs> logical sense I do feel like there are some big cuts made like oh we gotta get this done in 95 minutes <laughs> you know and there's one glaring one coming up but um, what happened to the rest of the crew of that ship did they all die they all died remember and then the judges send judges the secret the black suited judges and they're like the pilot's still alive and the, and the, and the council they... member is like no one leaves that plane alive find dread uh, okay alright so they shoot everyone died on that plane and then yeah. the guy shoots them but we're not to understand that the council member had anything to do with that plane going down no, the plane no, no, going no, the, down was just a fluke no the, the, not, no, it's not it's, it's a cannibal right, shot okay. they, cannibal no shot it down and just and it's also a fluke that Max von Sydow on his walkabout finds Judge Dredd find in a in cave in the middle of the earth <laughs> yeah, I j- thought that they were in charge of the plane going I down. Did, I oh, wasn't really? sure. And the the hillbillies sure. were like, yes, God is bringing us uh, I don't think so, though, because, no, because that allowed Judge Dredd to get away. And that's when that was, right, like, the hillbillies shoot Dredd it with a rocket. They want Judge Dredd to get killed. But they but shot it with a rocket. To prison. But you know what I think? Maybe, maybe what they did was they <laughs> told the coordinates to the <laughs> cannibal no, cowboys. No, I'm not buying And they go, this. hey, guys, if you want to eat good... There's a ship coming no way. by. Come check it out. It. Coming in. I'm not buying it. So they have this big fight scene with the cannibal cowboys. They defeat them. Max von Sydow, uh, or Sydow dies. And, uh, and very now, quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> He's like, oh, dead. Like, <laughs> saves the day and death. There's nothing better than a death scene between one of the greatest actors of all time. Yes. And Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> Like, that conversation is next level crazy. Like, it is the most bizarre set of acting styles I've ever seen. (laughs) Well, do you think that he brought the A-game out of Stallone in that scene? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because that's, you know what, you know what's a great scene there? That is like a a, a trio of powerhouse actors. Von Sydow, Stallone, Schneider. (laughs) Armand Asante. killing it in that scene. So amazing. Um, did they go, uh, is this one of the lines I'm looking at quotes on IMDb? It goes, the blind lady. Who is she? Oh, sir? my God. It's justice. Yeah, yeah, justice before your time. We should have never taken justice out of her hands. Will you put order to chaos, sir? Yeah, we solved many problems, but we created many more. Yeah. Now, the blind lady, blind, the statue of blind justice is just happens to be in this little cave area. Yes. Weird. In okay. the hillbilly's and, house. In the hillbilly's in the, house. Yes. In the hillbilly's house, there is a statue of justice, right? Who has huge tits? Oh, yes. I didn't notice that. I didn't the notice that. The statue of Lady Justice is stacked. Well, we all From know what I remember, that. Remember, that's ca- always the case, though. Really? Yes. Cannibal cowboys have one allegiance, and it's to the Lady of Justice. That's uh, that's why they keep it in all their their <laughs> caves. By the way, in that death scene. It was thunder and lightning out, but yeah. they're deep in a cave. Like yep. it was, the cave is illuminating. Like there are like windows throughout this cave nope. the entire time. Like it's like, psh, yeah. psh. like they're like, oh yeah, we make it dramatic. We'll put some thunder. Yeah, and lightning just put in. some sound effects of thunder and lightning. Um, we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back to discuss the end of the third act of this movie. Hey everybody, I know you're watching Comedy Bang Bang, but did you know there's a show on after Comedy Bang Bang that is equally hilarious? It's a brand new game show called Bunk, hosted by my friend Kurt Brownholer, and he is. Hilarious. Um, it's kind of akin to those old remote control style game shows. Everybody on the show is a comedian. They compete for nothing, uh, just really for pride. And, you know, they have the uh, like dumb games like uh, Untramp the Stamp, you know, Whose Crotch is Hotter, Give That Bitch Some Arms. It's, it's actually one of my favorite new shows out there right now. And you never know what you're going to see. There's like modern dancers, puppies, babies. Anything and everything goes on this show. Give it a chance. I think you will like it. Uh, so watch Bunk every Friday on IFC at 1030 after Comedy Bang Bang. All right, hold that thought for one second because now it's time for a word from our sponsor. Today's sponsor is Audible.com. Audible.com is a provider of audiobooks, comedy albums, and other spoken audio entertainment. What does that mean, other spoken audio entertainment? Um, I don't know. How about Charlie Rose interviews? Even Terry Gross interviews. If you want, you can go back, check out an interview that Aziz, Rob, and I did during Human Giant with Terry Gross, asking us the best questions about very dirty Human Giant sketches. But that's not all. Audible.com has over 100,000 different titles. That's a lot of titles. It's a more than you could possibly listen to in your life, unless you do it all the time. I don't know how you live your life. But uh, they have long previews. And today, as a special 
part of their partnership with us in Earwolf, we're going to give you a free audiobook. That's right. Just go to audiblepodcast.com slash how. That's right. H-O-W, audiblepodcast.com slash how, and get your free Audible book. You can go on. You can find out how movies get made. There's a great book that I'll really recommend called Down and Dirty Pictures, Miramax, Sundance, and the Rise of Independent Film by Peter Biskind. It's great and even better because that book is big. So listen to it in your car. They'll tell you how movies get made, but good movies, not the bad movies that we talk about here. Audiblepodcast.com slash how for your free book. All right, so uh, Judge Dredd now has to make it back to his city. Make it back to his city. The only problem is the only entrance to the city uh, emits fire every 30 seconds. (laughs) So like a video game, they need to run inside the fire tunnel and time it. There's a straight line. Rob Schneider trips because he's so, in nothing. On nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Well, he trips just, on not nothing. Not just trips, but trips and stays down. Freezes. Yeah. Stays down. Ah, help! Dread! <laughs> like, what? I really what? did want to know what was going on with him in that moment. Like, he just, would you think he was just frozen with panic? I guess. He trips over nothing and, and then stands, and stays stands down. there, but stands there like he can't get out of anywhere. Yeah. But we don't see anything. His character changes to whatever the scene needs him to <laughs> yes. like. Again, funny, mean, like sarcastic. Yes. And they never understood why they needed to be teamed up together. There was never a no. reason why they needed. Only at the end does his purpose come in. But there's no reason. Like there's not like come with me. Like there's no reason why I need to come with him. And their big plan to escape that fire tunnel was. They'd run about 30 feet in, and then Judge Dredd would shoot the floor again like Wile E. Coyote, carve out a little hole, and then drop down. <laughs> but, like, they, why couldn't they do that right when they got in? They're, like, they were like, no, we'll run, we'll make it really dramatic, and then shoot out the floor and then dive in. Oh, wait, uh, can we go back to when he was stuck in the hillbilly house, and yeah. they're, like, tied up, hanging from oh, the yeah. thing. And then all of a sudden, like, whenever he feels like he needs to, Stallone can just get himself out of his oh, yeah. robes. <laughs> Easily. Never, not a problem no to get out of the room. He's at like, all. okay, I'm going to get out now. Well, and what Schneider keeps, <laughs> keeps on doing throughout the film is calling him by his Christian name, <laughs> Judge Dredd, <laughs> which people go crazy about when once they realize who oh, he yeah. is. Yeah. But he does yeah. that a number, a number he's of times. All in, and so, so much so that Judge Dredd at some point is like, will you shut your mouth? <laughs> yeah. Or something like you that. You talk because, too much. Yeah, you talk too much. That's exactly what it was. Because they're on the prisoner transport, and, and, and Schneider realizes it, and is like, Dread? And yeah. then the other prisoners are like, huh? Because Judge it, Dredd apparently put every prisoner yeah, into prison. And it also uh, it activates one of the prisoners on that prison transport, who happened to sneak a knife yep. in. Uh, and can and, get out of his restraints. Yeah, easily. Sneaks a knife out of his and leg. he walks around freely on that. <laughs> yeah, they, no, one, no one patted down these criminals before they got on their prison like transport. a full knife. Yeah, it was like Con Air-style prison transport. <laughs> no one ever checked these guys. Like He pulled out a knife, cut his restraints, and then tried to stab Judge Dredd. Oh boy! Um, oh my God! They uh, so now this is where I got confused. They get this, <laughs> this is so they get they get into this they get the back pasta into, robot. They get back into the city and then all of a sudden Judge Dredd's in full costume. Yep. You don't understand <laughs> how get, that happened. I don't. They get know. easily. They get so easily into the the craziest part was like when Rob Schneider. They're in the judges like they're in the locker room and Rob yeah. Schneider's like, am, "Am I in the right place? What's going on? Like, how did you? It would be like if it would be like as if you snuck into the most uh, protected city and then yeah. made your way into CIA headquarters. Exactly. And, and we're yeah. just like, "What's going on, guys?" By the way, were we led to believe or um, that the entire Judge Dredd headquarters is in the Statue of Liberty? Or is that just yes. with, okay? So yeah. The ent- <laughs> oh no 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 no. Oh, just sorry. That that was just the, the secret lab. Yeah. The secret uh, lab, I believe, was under the Statue of Liberty because that's where the power surge comes from. I Got thought it was it. on top okay. in the crown. It was in the crown because oh, they, they, yeah, oh, okay. they shot out that part of the Statue oh, of Liberty. Oh, you're face. right. You're right. You're right. Oh man. So what was Rob Schneider talking about when he was like, "What do we do? Just say cursed Earth pizza?" Like, yeah, that was my favorite line. Get into the headquarters that they easily get into. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, "How are we supposed to get in here?" Cursed Earth Pizza, and then they were in. Yep. You never saw how they got in. <laughs> there was no reason. And then all of a sudden, and basically, constantly, just Stallone's being framed by Rico. Rico kills every member of like the uh, the council. It's like, ugh, I thought politics were boring. And then Stallone comes in like two seconds later. Like, hey, wait! And then like, and then and then Rico runs off, and then someone's like, "Hey, Judge Dredd killed all these people." It's like, "Oh no!" Like, it's just. Like, I also con- love these members of the council because every time one of their ideas isn't passed, and this happens with Max von Sydow too, they just resign. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, 
<laughs> They're like, I'm out. I'm, I'm out. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so, man, oh, man. I don't even know so where. Terrible. To... <laughs> this movie is terrible. And by the way, the Statue of Liberty, they established, has been moved from where it was yes. to the middle of the dystopian Pluto Nash style city. Yes. <laughs> this is right. there. So there's like skyscrapers all around it and just the Statue of Liberty. Right. Um, where it's holding a secret lab. No one ever thinks, uh, thinks to look. Like, oh, they can only be activated by Judge Dredd things, and he touched it, and then the robot came on. And he's like, mission, bodyguard. Yeah. He's like, you know, <laughs> oh, like, I didn't catch whammy. that. I think, I, maybe. Okay. I don't know. I couldn't figure out I what the purpose was. Or maybe it was just a bodyguard were. robot. I don't know. By but the way, it, but the he robot was is having, like, a love a affair fucking... with that robot. Oh, oh yeah. He, he is, had so many tender scenes. He is straight up that. fucking that robot if he had <laughs> genitals. And, and by the way, that robot is real steel. Like, just a picture yeah. in your head. It looks like a robot from real steel. It's, like, really lanky and big. And the the whole last section of the movie, the rope of Diane, poor Diane Lane, I can't imagine what the action was. She just had to be... She was being held in place by her head by the oh, robot. Oh, that was terrible. Yes. Like, that act... Those days, acting must have just been brutal. Oh, no. just, just, like, just make... Just pretend like it's holding your head. Okay. <laughs> but, but it's not hurting. You're just stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then you know, uh, Rico knows he's outnumbered, so he goes, unleash the clones. Like, well, look, it's too early. The clones are, like... They're half formed. It's four more hours. Yes. Like, all right. So they release these like zombie clones that are all coming out of goo, and, and they're like just slimy kind of, mummies. Yeah, they're slimy mummies. It's got in muscles and like. And how do they even get rid of those guys? That's never explained. Who knows? Yeah, they don't. The right? Clones never come back. Sequel. <laughs> sequel. Sequel. The clones come back in the that sequel to fight baby Godzilla. Cursed Earth Pizza. <laughs> And so, I mean, then basically, of course, there's a huge fight scene in the front face of the Statue of Liberty. Judge Dredd hangs outside the window, and Rico hangs outside the window, and then... Well, Schneider die. turns it around, turns the robot around. Oh, right, around. yes. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he sudden, it. Oh, Finally, the, he the robot a... paws Armand DeSante gently in the face, and he falls <laughs> to the ground. And we're like, what? Oh, that was the thing about those fight scenes. You could see everybody clearly, and it was clearly like, okay, we're gonna stage like all stage fighting. I was like, I'm gonna punch you, but I'll be five you know feet away from you. Like yeah. every punch was not coming anywhere close to the actors. <laughs> it was like everyone was like, Bleh. but yeah, you're right. That that robot just pawed our mind. It's like. He get, ripped get down. everybody else's get down. limbs off. <laughs> then Rob Schneider gets in the back. Yeah, Rob Schneider basically tweaked the robot. He too. hacks it. He hacks it. Spaghetti he gets styles. inside. Spaghetti <laughs> spaghetti. Uh. He gets into the spaghetti guts of the robot. <laughs> All robots are made of spaghetti. <laughs> he he <laughs> finds a bunch of rigatoni in there. <laughs> oh, that's why it's rigatoni. Oh, it's rigatoni. It's I do al dente. I know. Rig I know. I know this. I can do this. Uh, you can do this. Connect, man. The, connect the rigatoni to the ziti, <laughs> and I just have to. I have to. I have to upload. The pen, eh? Um, they're uh, obviously, obviously, it's we... got a bad Noki core. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta make a movie where all robots are run on pasta. <laughs> the pasta robots that should be a sequel to Judge Red. I will say, um, Sylvester Stallone had uh, some complaints about this movie. Uh, in 2008, he said, I love that property when I read it because it took a genre that I love. The action morality genre, all right, it's a total genre that we all know, <laughs> and made it a bit more sophisticated. There's a lot of action in the movie and some great acting too, but it wasn't balls to the wall. Mm -hmm. I look back on Judge Dredd as a real missed opportunity. It should have been more funny and fun. <laughs> what I learned out of that experience was we shouldn't have tried to make Hamlet. <laughs> we should have tried to make Hamlet and eggs. Oh my god. Wow. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, what now? <laughs> we shouldn't have tried to make it Hamlet. Oh, boy. We, we should have made it Hamlet, Hamlet and, and eggs. eggs. So he misjudged it. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the worst. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of wordplay around uh, judging in this movie. Um, there is a, obviously we had a, a opinion about this movie, but there were some people who uh, thought more highly of it. So now it's time for a second opinion. These are all reviews culled from Amazon.com. Right here, there's a, a theme that I want to see if you guys can pick out in these reviews. This is from NM Nems. There are a few films that everyone in my family can enjoy. And a film that my father isn't complaining about at the end is the rarest thing I can think of. Judge Dredd is one of these very, 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 very <laughs> few films. My father isn't complaining about this movie, but he actually praises it and wants to watch it again. 
Even with our incredibly high expectations, everyone in my family, including my father, <laughs> loves this what? movie. That's five-star review. Now, that would be interesting, but here's the second review. <laughs> Whoa, what a great Stallone film. I haven't seen a great one since Ants. Stallone may not be the handsomest guy, but he is a good actor. My father especially loves the line. Oh. What is going on right now? What's happening? What is happening? For real, I'm freaking, I'm freaking out right Unsettling. now. Unsettling. My father especially loves the line, I knew you'd say that. As a matter of fact, it's become one of our family's favorite sayings. So these are two reviews about dads. This is, so is for that? Father's Day, pop in Judge Dredd. Yeah. And, it's um, really uncomfortable. And bond with your dad. Uh, and then, and then this, I only picked out this review. <laughs> 2013. After a year of silence, Cicada is back. New puzzles, more clues, and even more questions. Today, we will finish our analysis of the internet's biggest mystery, Cicada 3301. We'll also discuss stories from those who claim to have solved these puzzles and attempt to answer the ultimate question. What is Cicada up to? Welcome to Red Web. The week is over, Fredo, you no longer have to wait. Audience, you don't have to wait. We're concluding our saga of Cicada 3301 this week, and I'm really, really excited about it because it, we get into some very weird details, man. There's mm. this. You thought Puzzle 1 was weird, Puzzle 2, she's out here, man. We she's are ready. back. You left me with a big cliffhanger, and now, <laughs> and now you've rehooked me. There's, I've uh, rehooked you. Supposedly, people, uh, uh -huh. testimonies. Yeah. Of people who have solved these cases. We've got some interviews. One was on Rolling Stones, so if that adds what? any credence to it, man, okay. it's, it's out right. there. I mean, I would assume they have done they would have done some research <laughs> or there's some amount of uh, you know, certification attached to these people. Yeah, do they send out some sort of badge or maybe a sticker like I completed the puzzle? Who's to say? I'm Trevor Collins. I'm your local resident mystery enthusiast with me as every week, Alfredo Diaz. Hello, I'm the I'm the person that likes to stay away from such <laughs> <laughs> nefarious deeds of the internet. I keep them awake at spooky. night. <laughs> not not a fan. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, we last left off. The people, mm -hmm. some people solved it, got through the uh, <laughs> time gate. There was a time gated website in the dark uh, web. People made it through. Had some leaks as to what happened after puzzle one. That's where we're at. Not seen again. Not see well. Who's to say? This yeah, is the well, internet. I mean, last I was, <laughs> last I was told, and uh, and then Cicada came back a year later. Mm hmm. Much like a cicada, they come back. And uh, what's worth noting here before we dive neck deep into puzzle two is that there are a lot of methods within here that are very familiar. So I'm going to do my best to focus on the new styles of puzzle, the the new types of clues, and kind of gloss over the methods that we went into detail with on puzzle one. So if you haven't listened to part one, I encourage you to do so. But if you haven't, you won't miss a beat. We'll pick up where we left off. And here we are with puzzle two. One year and one day later, January 5th, 2013. Puzzle 2 drops on 4chan with another image that says, quote, Hello again. Our search for intelligent individuals now continues. The first clue is hidden within this message. Find it, and it will lead you on, to, on the road to finding us. We look forward to meeting the few that will make it all the way through. Good luck. End quote. So we're starting off the very same way as, uh, as Puzzle 1. And people with the same method, dug into that image to find the next clue using outguess. And with that, they found a book code and another riddle, which again, glossing over these familiar paths, so these familiar solving methods, uh, people were able to decrypt that book code, which led to a new type of clue within these puzzles, a Dropbox link, which contained a 130 megabyte ISO image for download. And if you're unfamiliar, an ISO image is sort of an archive file and it contains everything that would be written onto an optical disk. It's essentially a uh, desktop way to boot up a copy of a CD, I guess. That's the only way I've ever used it. But if you booted that up, if you loaded up that ISO image, it had three directories in it. Data, boot, and audio. 
Now, if you looked into the boot, it would what? initiate the boot sequence. And long story short, it showed a lot of prime numbers, ending with the quote here, the key is all around you. Good luck. So that's the boot sequence. But what I want to focus on here is the audio directory. Now, we haven't seen much audio so far with Cicada outside of the voicemail from Puzzle 1. But within the audio directory was an MP3 file entitled 761.mp3, which is interesting because it's yet another one of these prime numbers that Cicada seems so obsessed about. And a prime number, just in case I haven't defined that yet, is, is a number that is only divisible by itself and one. 3301 is actually yet another prime number. Mm. But this MP3 file had a short music track featuring a guitar. People continued to analyze that music track along with the other clues here in the ISO image, and that led somebody to a Twitter account. And now this is the first time a Twitter account has showed up, but oh. there was a, a JPEG image on that Twitter account with a rune table. It had what three columns with 29 individual entries, each column labeled rune, letter, and then value. Now, of course, up until this point, I want to note we haven't seen runes at any at any point. So what are we decoding here? Yeah. Well, maybe that was a misdirect because once people looked into the back end of that image using a familiar method without guess, they figured out that it actually contained yet another hidden message. However, the message at first appeared to be blank, containing nothing but spaces and tabs. But if you converted those spaces and tabs into binary values and then converted that again, you would be able to figure out what the true message is, which then pointed to a dot onion address, which is essentially an anonymous dark web address. Oh, oh, oh. So we're back. We're deep back oh, in the dark oh. web already. Just like that. <laughs> Here we go. The dark web. The place you... Get it? Oh, man. See, at first I was like, if I was smart enough to sure. get through this, imagine getting like an email with an address or, or, or you know, or something, right? Because I'm right. sure big chance they'd want to contact you, maybe even meet. Uh, like the adrenaline rush you must feel like also the yeah. danger behind that the fight or flight which is pretty crazy again i'm still surprised like no one's like hey i got through to this thing this is kind of sketch uh mm -hmm. y'all you know police hello Help. yeah right also like do you want to like wire me up maybe keep a tab on me i don't know i might go missing shit might happen right i'm gonna install a camera just for you cops because like i need you watching that camera while cicada's likely watching through my webcam right now yeah, um, but now like you're, you're talking about dark web stuff, and that's mm -hmm. that's a that's a no for me. Well, this is only going to help your feeling of trepidation here, because once you went to that address, it had nothing but the simple message of quote, "Web browsers are useless here. Welcome," and it also had a text image of a cicada, so that was nice to see. But mm. interacting with that page revealed another hidden message, which pointed to yet another onion address, which had the simple message of quote, patience is a virtue. So this is the second time that we've heard patience is a virtue. So I don't know if this guy's a fan of the mummy uh, <laughs> and he's quoting that, or if this is something that like he's, they are trying to indicate. I should say it's probably a group at this point from our analysis in part one. But looking into the HTML of that website, they were able to figure out, okay, well, it's not literally being patient. It's moreover that something's going to happen to this web page, And that was figured out because of the quote, which means come back soon. There was a hidden line added after patience is a virtue. So the full quote for clarity is patience is a virtue, which means come back soon. So of course, after people figured that out, the site temporarily went down only to come back with yet another message. Quote, you already have everything you need to continue. Sometimes you must knock on the sky and listen to the sound. Good luck, end quote. So ultimately, you know, I, I again, going, there's some similar methods here. So glossing through some of the details, ultimately this led to a third website with a message telling everybody to stand by for coordinates. Now this should sound familiar because we got to this point last time. And just like the first puzzle, these coordinates span the globe across three different countries. Though I am oh. seeing on different sources that it might've been four countries and I wanted to note that, but the three countries we know for sure, the United States, Russia, and Japan. Oh. So, again, we're back at a very familiar step. People set out into the real world to figure out what is at these coordinates. Again, these posters were right on point. 
This time though, the Cicada posters had a unique phone number and access code on each one. People then called those numbers, an automated voice message, asked them to enter those access codes, and those then led to yet another dot onion address. Jeez. And each poster actually had a different address associated with it. So everybody had to go to these different pages and combine the results from all of these addresses in order to find one final dot onion address, which just like the first puzzle asked for the user's email address. And this is where we end once again, the public facing facts of the case at this point, whatever happens beyond this, I have to uh, say we need to take with a grain of salt because they are just leaks. They are supposedly stories from people who had made it past this point. Mm. One thing I also thought about while researching this is that while Puzzle 1 made it a point to say we don't want everybody, we, we want the best and not the rest. We yep. want the first and not the followers. So what's strange to me is that they forced people to go out across three or four countries, find these I guess, steps to a puzzle. And then they essentially forced everybody to share this information together. You needed all the information from all of these different posters in order to find the final page. Yeah. So strangely, they are now kind of asking for people to work together. So I'm wondering why that is. Changing it up? I don't know. Like Maybe. Huh. Be. Yeah, I don't know. Or, or maybe they found something, you know, it's just tweaks and stuff from the first time they ran this. And they went, okay, like... Not everyone can get to these different things, and mm -hmm. we want the best and brightest. And you know, if they are, if they are able to get to this, then they could uh, share that information. No problem. Maybe I don't know, but sometime later, again, someone leaked what came after this, and it actually was a test sent to those who did enter their emails. The test supposedly contained abstract questions on philosophy, math, emotions, and things of that nature, almost like a personality test. And someone actually noted, and this is a very specific thing to, to have noted, but someone noted that these supposed questions were very, very similar to those that Google asked of its interviewees. So if you were interviewing for a job at Google, they would ask you these personality questions ultimately to determine what your personality was and to see if you would work well on within the company or with a certain team or with certain individuals. I haven't personally done anything like that, but I've heard of tactics like that before. So maybe they're just trying to say like, all right, here's the test. What is your ideology? Will you fit within whatever Cicada is putting down? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's got to be a team thing. You don't really have personality tests unless you need a bunch of people to work together. Right. So you either have a team or you have a very strong ideology. Yeah. I can't both. imagine. Yeah. Yeah. That could be, it could be that as well, but I would assume that they want the best and brightest and they want them to work together on something, which is also kind of scary if you think about it. Yeah. It's it just like, honestly, in the back of my mind, it just keeps reminding me of that Die Hard movie with the uh, fire sale, right? A bunch of brilliant minds made pieces of code that were all unified to make this scary thing that could uh, basically break the country's infrastructure. Yeah. But those who took the test said that it saved two cookies on the computer. Cookies, just pieces of data. One started with 167 and the other started with 761. Two prime numbers that are the same forwards and backwards. And you're going to start seeing that even more so as a trend as we continue to step into this arena. But prime numbers keep coming up. And I don't know if that's just kind of a uh, like a signature style thing or if that is some sort of hidden message within that. I, I'm not sure. But it does relate back to that music track that I discussed earlier that was entitled 761.mp3. After completing the test, each person was then emailed a message asking them to build a TCP server using specific protocols, then share it via Tor, which is the browser that you would use to visit an Onion website, and they were also given a deadline. It's also worth noting here, much like some of the leaks in Puzzle 1, the usual 3301 PGP signature that verified that it was in fact from Cicada was missing. This That was not on this email address or at least not on the parts that were leaked. However, multiple people claimed that this is the case, that these are the emails that were being received. Oh, and that makes me skeptical. Mm -hmm. like, why right. wouldn't they? I don't. Why wouldn't they verify it? Up until this point, they've, they've made it very clear. Trust no, at least they've said it about clues. I don't know about emails, but they've said, trust no clue that doesn't have our PGP signature. There's been a lot of false paths up to this point, you gotta remember. And I know for a fact that they've been trying to ensure that people don't take false paths or, 
you know, follow fake cicada individuals. In fact, it's obvious, it's so obvious that this is important to them that it's a part of their initial image that kicked off Puzzle 2. So it's deeply ingrained with what they've been doing. For those who successfully completed their server or their part of the server, they were then met with silence for two weeks until they saw activity on those servers. Some people say that after this, they received an email very similar to the first puzzle's leaked email, but this specific email was never leaked again, so we don't know what this Puzzle 2 end email looks like, which makes this even more mysterious. And so at this point, we're at the end of Puzzle 2. This is the conclusion of Puzzle 2 in the year 2013, and the trail officially goes cold. There is no final public message oh. like there was at the end of Puzzle yeah. 1. It's, oh man, I mean like things can change in a year, but why why change up their tactics? I, I right. don't know. Like there's no code, the like signature essentially. They didn't say goodbye. Well, the signature could be because it, it's leaked info. You know, maybe it's because it was lost in the leak or that someone's making up the fact that this was an email. But you, you raised a good point earlier. It might be that they learned from Puzzle 1 that certain tactics, certain messages, certain methods either gave too much information or not enough, maybe didn't find the right individuals. It's really hard to say. We just don't have a whole lot of information. But um, I want to recap Puzzle 2 because it is convoluted. There are a lot of steps, but I want to go step by step in the simplest way possible. So that way I can also recap not only Puzzle 2, but highlighting some of the key pieces that I want to focus on that will come back later. So the puzzle kind of went like this. There was the initial image that had a hidden message within it. That led to a book code and a riddle, which then led to a Dropbox link containing that ISO image, which contained an audio track. This audio track led to a Twitter page and a JPEG image of a room table, whose hidden binary code led users to an onion address. After a series of onion addresses, users then found a series of global coordinates, Posters located at these coordinates then led to phone numbers, which led to even more .onion addresses, which finally resulted in one final .onion webpage for users to enter their email addresses into. And that is the whole simplified, very simplified look at Puzzle 2. The pieces to note, the Twitter page. So now there's a Twitter page actively in play that we know is factually a part of Cicada. There's a rune table that was either a misdirect or we have runes that otherwise we haven't used yet. And there was an audio track. Obviously we had voicemail, which is sound, but we haven't necessarily had a straight up MP3 file up until this point. But that's the end of that. And we have heard nothing else through the course of 2013, flash forwarding yet another year and a day again to January 6, 2014. Boom, puzzle three is upon us. Whoa, okay, so some time's passed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're uh, it's throwing me off. It's just so different. It, it's weird that it gets different. And I, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but Puzzle 3 is a monster. It is completely different up until this point. It's almost like Puzzle 1 and 2 were appetizers for the main course because, man, does Puzzle 3 go off the rails. Oh, there, there was no way in hell we wouldn't... <laughs> I wouldn't even got him close. Oh, no. Many people would have gotten close, uh, but no, no more spoilers. All right, so January 6, 2014. Remember that Twitter account that we now know about? Well, it seems like Cicada has started to look at their Twitter account to initiate their puzzles because on that Twitter account that very same day, a link to an Imgur image was made. It's the same Twitter account as the second puzzle to be fully clear, and that image contained the following, quote, Hello, Epiphany is upon you. Your pilgrimage has begun. Enlightenment awaits. Good luck. Signed, 3301. End quote. Now, again, it starts off very much like the other two puzzles, with mm -hmm. a black background image with simple white text. So, of course, using the same method as the other two puzzles, people were able to figure out the hidden message within it, and that went as follows. Quote, The work of a private man who wished to transcend, he trusted himself to produce from within. This message was signed with that very same PGP key, verifying that this was in fact Cicada 3301 and that oh. Puzzle 3 was officially started. Oh, so there we go. It's just weird that, that it's not every step of the way like last time. Like I I still don't know why you would change it up, right? Like, cause I would think, okay, you know, you're, you don't put it in, you're changing it up. 
but then to not put it in, then put it in later. I will say that I think the PGP key has been a part of all of these web pages and all of the clues. That's that's my supposition, I guess. Uh, I haven't made that very clear, but Cicada themselves, looking back, made it very clear that all clues should have this PGP key. Um, I think it's important to note at the beginning of these puzzles, so that way you know for a fact that this is starting with Cicada themselves. And I think it's also important to note that these leaks lack the PGP, so that way you know that the validity there is still in question. Otherwise, I think it is worth assuming that these steps have the PGP key attached to them. It's just that at that juncture on step two, three, four, five, or whatever, it's not necessarily worth noting every time. Okay. But yeah, it is interesting if they are leaving it out of their email correspondence. That would be very strange to me. Now, before we get too deep into this puzzle, I want to recognize ahead of time that this puzzle, puzzle three, is incredibly technical and much more convoluted than even puzzle two started to get. Many methods used in this puzzle are very similar to the methods already covered, so I don't want to spend too much time getting bogged down in the puzzle details. Uh, I'd rather focus on the mystery at hand, such as who is Cicada 3301 and what are they ultimately up to? If there's interest, I'd be happy to cover the detailed steps of Puzzle 3 in a bonus upload sometime outside of a normal episode. Purely for those who are curious, I'd, I'd be happy to go through all of the steps of Puzzle 3. Um, but with that said, let's quickly distill Puzzle 3 into its major components and the pieces that we'll need to proceed with this mystery. So again, we have the inciting image and its hidden message as well as the PGP key verifying that this is an official clue that Puzzle 3 has officially started and the rest of the puzzle continues as follows. And I'm going to distill this kind of like I did at the end of Puzzle 2. Again, this is extraordinarily complicated, so uh, I think it's, it's worth doing. The image's hidden message led to a book, which then led to a dot .onion address containing four paintings, which led to yet another web page containing a document filled with characters. Analyzing that led to the title of a book called Liber Primus, a list of runes, as well as the text entitled Chapter 1, Intus. So those are three pieces of information that we have at this point. Oh, okay. This is... Ooh. Yeah. At this point, a user would be left cycling between web pages, images, and runes over and over again, leading then finally to an MP3 file, which then promptly went offline once it was found, only to be replaced with a painting. Several more images and another MP3 file later were left with a message from Cicada asking users to decipher the runes and upload those solutions. Cicada then went dark after this. Now hit me with your questions, just in case, because I know that was a hyper, hyper truncation of Puzzle 3. I'm soaking all this in. Yeah. And I would not even touch any of this. My God, it's just, it is such a wild goose chase. It, it gets weird, man. And the paintings are old timey style, like as if they're paintings of George Washington, there's one that almost looks like an inverted painting with a faded cicada in the background with a, with a bunch of prime numbers. Very eerie looking. Again, as always, any visual elements that you want to see will always post over on our Twitter page at RedWebPod. So please follow us there if you want to check out any of those. But um, the things to note out of this, the, the facts to pull away, are that book called Liber Primus, mm -hmm. the list of runes, because remember... Runes came up in Puzzle 2 and were never addressed. And then we also have text that was offered to us that said, quote, Chapter 1, Intus. So some, some Latin in there for those of you who studied that back in middle school. But ultimately, it's worth focusing on that book called Liber Primus. It's a book written by Cicada in the very runes that we saw back in Puzzle 2. Now, looking at that Latin, it actually translates to first book. So this implies that Cicada might be uh, writing some other books down the way, maybe giving some further clues in other books, but who's to say? At this point, this is where we're at. We have this book of runes that we can finally activate that rune table from Puzzle 2. That's crazy. We're going back to something that was there and turned out to be nothing, but is actually something. So, oh man, are they really thinking this many steps ahead? I don't know. I really don't. But you know, with a, a year of silence to yourself and a giant or potentially giant secret society going on, there is the opportunity for this to become very convoluted. Obviously, Puzzle 1 was entirely self-contained. Puzzle 2 had a couple elements that weren't really addressed. And now Puzzle 3 is enormous. I, I, I can't 
convey to you appro appropriately just how big that puzzle got. I yeah. very, again, I simplified it a lot for time, but it's it's reaching backwards now into puzzle two. It's probably projecting forward into what we don't even know yet. But what's weird it, or even creepy is like people started to translate this book and many of the translations still came up cryptic yet philosophical. And I thought it would be appropriate to read maybe the first two pages of this book. Um, oh. it, it starts with a warning. No less. Of course. And then it goes into chapter one entitled Intus. And just as an aside, my personal conjecture here is that they gave us the text chapter one Intus, as well as the runes, as well as the book, almost as a key, as a starting point in order to start our translation, because I don't believe chapter one Intus was written in English language or in English letters. So I feel like that's how people started to get their foothold on translating this book. But anyway, Let's read a warning from Cicada at the beginning of this book. Quote, a warning. Believe nothing from this book except what you know to be true. Test the knowledge, find your truth, experience your death. Do not edit or change this book or the message contained within, either the words or their numbers, for all is sacred. So they are taking this book extraordinarily seriously. Almost like sacred. Yeah. They're, they're definitely calling it sacred, and uh, this is almost like a light threat to those who have led false paths up into this point to try to steal attention away from Cicada. So chapter one is entitled Intus, which translates to inside, and it starts with the following. Obviously, it's longer than this, but this is the first passage from chapter one. It says, quote, Welcome, welcome, pilgrim, to the great journey toward the end of all things. It is not an easy trip, but for those who find their way here, it is a necessary one. Along the way, you will find the end to all struggle and suffering, your innocence, your illusions, your certainty, and your reality. Ultimately, you will discover an end to self. End quote. That's getting, it's getting kind of cultish now. It's getting weird, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's sending uh, goosebumps up my spine. What the hell? Okay. I mean, yeah. at first it seemed like maybe it's kind of like government-esque, but this is, this is very much steering me away from that mm -hmm. train of thought. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I think it's worth at the end of all of this to reassess the kind of the theories that we established back in part one to see where we land on, you know, those very same ideas now that we have a little bit more information. But, you know, beyond the runes, there also appeared to be many clues and codes within the book itself. This is where we start discovering loose ends in Puzzle 3. For example, there is a page instructing users to find yet another page on the dark web, or another website, I should say, on the dark web. That website has yet to be found. Furthermore, many of the runic translations are obscured by encryption on top of the translations, leaving many pages to remain untranslated. What that is to say is they might have encrypted it into a different code, before converting it into runes, or they could have converted it into runes and then used some sort of cipher to change the runes from there, if you know what I'm saying. Jeez, all above my pay grade. That's gonna make this much more complicated. It's not gonna be this symbol is A, this symbol is B. What they might do is they say, okay, A becomes H, B becomes I, and then you convert it into runes. Or maybe they somehow shuffle up the alphabet before then. So they're adding essentially more cryptography on top of their already strange translation to runes. Well, yeah, they need the best of the best, so. I, that's very true, actually. They do need the best of the best, and so that makes a lot of sense. And this reminds me now of like World War One and Two days when, when people were trying to decipher Germanic codes or, or vice versa, when they were trying to decipher the United States codes because Morse code was just able to be pulled out of the air. You could You could listen to the radio waves and hear what people were saying. But anyway, that's something I'm not an expert in. But currently, yeah. all the way up to today, by the way, that website hasn't been found. And to today, wow. only 19 of a total 74 pages have been successfully translated into any meaningful language. What? Yeah. This, uh, it's weird. And and I, again, these are, there are a lot the of pages. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a ton, but it's also like out to the public though, right? Yeah, like, it's out to the public. You can go check out those runes if you want on that rune table. You can go find all 74 pages if you want. You can read even further into those 19 pages. I read two of them, obviously, but you can read the rest to, to see for yourself. This is what I like about some of the mysteries we touch on is that some of them are tangible. Some of them you can actually take part in. This one is just 
it's uh, so comp complicated that this is where this puzzle kind of ends, you know? I think it is a, a small note, but worth noting that the 19 pages that were translated, I think 17 of them were at the very beginning of the book, and two of them were at the very end. So it's in the middle that we don't know what's going on. But this yeah. is officially the end to Puzzle 3. Again, skipping over some minor details along the way, but that's the end. And people were caught up on translating these runes. Obviously, obviously, it's very difficult. It's so difficult that even in the public realm, people are not able to come forward translating these pages unless some genius is out there slowly making their way through it by themselves. Yeah. You know, people just kind of waited to see if anything would come from Cicada through the rest of the year. I think it's insane that, like, the world has had their hands on it and hasn't translated it. And, and maybe it's just me and... You know this you know i don't i'm not one to like try and decipher stuff like this this has never been my wheelhouse but i would assume if you had a handful of pages it kind of snowballs and you just start plugging in pieces to the other pages and you know what i mean yeah you, you would think and maybe that's what happened with the first 19 pages you know i that's where i think people started with chapter one intus being the okay that's where you can start because you have that language you know that this is at the beginning of the book so it's likely the words chapter one and so that's where people got their foothold and you can start yeah doing what you're saying where like all right we're picking up the pattern here we're figuring yeah. it out but then who's to say that every page after these 19 isn't somehow encoded in its own cipher that it doesn't have its own unique way to translate so you could either figure out the cipher and, and unlock the rest of the pages or you might figure out a very difficult cipher and suddenly only get one extra page. It's yeah, it's just hard to say. I think the crazy thing too is, is I don't know, I mean, this is just me just speculating, kind of just throwing stuff out there. But imagine, you know, everyone's like working together and piecing things bit by bit. And, you know, someone gets a little bit further ahead, sees a little a message or, you know, one of the pages and is kind of like forced to change their way of thinking mm -hmm. and go the solo route you know could be like we don't you don't know if people just are kind of like oh okay this is where i'm supposed to branch off by myself yeah right because the last episode we there was i was waiting for it right that beat to drop of like right. everyone's working together cool but like if they want the best if they want the brightest where's that cutoff right this could be that cutoff yeah and we just wouldn't know it because it's translated behind a very difficult code. It could literally say, yep. from here on, you are by yourself. It could yep. say that. That's very true. But there's also Puzzle 2 where they started introducing teamwork, essentially. And so maybe that was as a prelude to this book. So it could go either way. It could be like you're saying that there's some secret message within there that is saying, hey, stay by yourself. Or... They could have set us up to say, all right, maybe maybe they do want some teamwork, people that can work together to figure this stuff out. Because it's one thing to develop a cipher that to you is very simple. It's another thing to, out of thin air, figure backwards figure out that cipher to re-uncode it or whatever. But again, yeah, that's that's the end of Puzzle 3. The book's still unfinished in its translations. So Damn. let's like flash forward. There's a couple updates between then and now that I'd like to cover. Hey everyone, Trevor Collins here and welcome to the ad break. That's right, we have sponsors for the show and we're very thankful for that. But before we get into it, I want to read a couple of reviews and thank you all for your suggestions and your kind feedback. It has been integral in our podcast performance. You guys have been sharing the podcast and reviewing it, thumbing it up, subscribing to it, you know, all the options. Regardless of where you listen, it has helped us out tremendously. So thank you very much. I want to point out a couple of recent reviews here on Apple Podcasts, if that's where you listen, uh, such as the one from Anonymously Dumb, who left a five-star review on September 2nd, saying that they were very excited to see that Cicada 3301 was the season finale. However, it made them shout, what? Because the season is too short. That's right. It is too short. I agree with you. We'll be taking a small break, a four-week break, uh, to kind of realign. You guys have uh, shown such support for this podcast, and we al almost weren't even prepared for it. Um, so we have a pilot season that's concluding right now. You're listening to the, the finale here in Cicada 3301 Part 2. We're going to take that break, and we're going to come back, hopefully, uh, weekly without seasons. That's right. You'll hear us 
weekly in perpetuity with mysteries moving forward. However, uh, that's going to take some legwork on our part. So we'll keep you informed here in this little midsection break that I like to put the ads in. Huh? Right. Oh, isn't this nice? Another great review from The Hit Dude from September 1st. Another five star. Thank you very much. Says, great podcast. Been a Chimo Hunter fan for a while. If you don't know, this is a great time to tell you. Uh, Alfredo and I are from the team called Achievement Hunter. That's right. We make videos on YouTube and other comedy gaming content like that. So if that's your interest, uh, you can check us out over there as well. I should also say that we are part of a bigger company known as Rooster Teeth. This is an opportunity to inform you guys on a little bit of behind the scenes of Red Web if you're new to us via this podcast. And, uh, and welcome to the greater Rooster Teeth family. If you're new to us, we appreciate having you. But why don't we dive into some of the ads? So the first one here is from the mind of legendary filmmaker Ridley Scott, the visionary director of Alien and Blade Runner, films you might recognize. They're very classic. This is his next sci-fi masterpiece. It's an HBO Max original series called Raised by Wolves. In this epic new series, two android guardians are tasked with a singular mission, to raise the last of mankind as their own, and to protect them at any cost. Don't miss Ridley Scott's highly anticipated U.S. television debut, Raised by Wolves, streaming only on HBO Max. And you can subscribe to the official Raised by Wolves companion podcast on iHeart, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or just like this podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. They're out there, in the airways. So thank you, Raised by Wolves. The next sponsor is uh, AT&T 5G and Samsung. So Rooster Teeth is a company that we work for, as you know, but they also have a show, an anime called Ruby, R-W-B-Y, if you weren't aware of that. So Rooster Teeth is joining forces with Samsung and AT&T 5G to kick things off for our upcoming RTX at home virtual event. RTX is something we do every year to meet with the fans and the community. So AT&T and Samsung are helping us bring RTX to you at home virtually this year in quarantine. So with this program, we are creating a Ruby Outdoor mural that you can add art to from the comfort of your own home using the Mark Augmented Reality app. Just download the Mark app and start creating your own Ruby art right now because each night, fan designs will be projected onto the mural wall and you could see yours come to life via social media. If you're on the AT&T 5G network at home, you can also access the plus mode through the Mark app, so it will allow you to get higher res videos and crystal clear images to explore on the app. But you can check out the new Samsung Galaxy Note 20 Ultra 5G in order to do that if you'd like. It's also powered by AT&T 5G. Now, I want to say AT&T 5G requires a compatible plan and coverage is not available in all areas. So be mindful, look up that 5G map, see if it's available in your area, get that device, and you'll be able to uh, contribute your art to the Ruby wall. Here's a couple of the new features that you can come to expect on the device, like cloud gaming. That'll be available through the power of 5G. You can try out cloud gaming with high performance experiences brought to you via the newest Samsung devices powered by AT&T 5G. The Galaxy Note 20 Ultra 5G also has 120 hertz adaptive display that automatically adjusts the refresh rate according to the content that you are viewing and an intelligent battery life that optimizes for your gameplay so you can keep playing or watching for long periods of time. Between the 5G support and the Wi-Fi optimization and the advanced processor, okay, you get smooth gaming experiences with virtually no lag, which is excellent. That also has the S Pen, so you should check that out. Uh, when it comes to Samsung Notes, you can create your own works of art right there on the phone with this very intelligent S Pen. So head over to att.com slash Galaxy Note 20 Ultra 5G so you can learn how to get the Samsung Galaxy Note 20 5G for free or the Galaxy Note 20 5G Ultra for $299.99 for a limited time. Again, that's att.com slash Galaxy Note 20 Ultra 5G. Head there, get yourself some. It's a great phone. They didn't ask me to say that, but they did send me one. I got hands on with it. It's a lovely big screen. Looks beautiful, nice and smooth. So head on over there. You can learn how to get that phone. So thank you again, Samsung and AT&T 5G for the sponsorship. We really appreciate it. But without further ado, let's conclude Cicada 3301. So this was 2014. So essentially, some people are like, all right, this book is very difficult to translate. Let's just see if something comes up in another year from now, January 2015. Because obviously, up until this point, every January, Cicada shows up. Mm -hmm. Well, January came and went, and there was no new puzzle. So some people started to speculate that Cicada maybe got what they wanted. 
Maybe they found the individuals that they needed. Uh, some believe that the book, Liber Primus, and its runes from Puzzle 3 hadn't been fully solved to the necessary lengths. And it's important to note, and this is a sidebar here, but people continued to act on Cicada's behalf, right? They wanted to take credit for being Cicada. And yeah. in fact, there was a digital attack on Planned Parenthood that happened, and whoever did that claimed or supposed that they were 3301. So Cicada wasn't silent in 2015 purely because of this, and on July 27th, they tweeted a pastebin link or a text storage site link containing that PGP signature and a message that distanced themselves from that attack saying, that wasn't us, and here's our PGP signature to confirm that. But again, outside of that little mishap, they were silent for 2015. 2016 comes around, again, no puzzle. So people are starting to go, okay, well maybe this book has something to do with this. Eventually, Cicada did post the following message once again with that very same PGP signature and this was via Twitter, and it said, quote, Hello, the path lies empty. Epiphany seeks the devoted. Liber Primus is the way, its words are the map, their meaning is the road, and their numbers are the direction. Seek and you will be found. Good luck. End quote. So this again, uh, this essentially confirmed to people, all right, we need to finish that book. Yeah. Or we not, we're not going to get anything else. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're just like, okay, we might have went too far with this one. This right. is extremely difficult. Like, oh, uh, here's some clues. Uh, <laughs> uh, you got to go back and finish and the it. The numbers and the, oh, crap. Guys, we overcooked it. Our intern we overcooked spent it. way too much time <laughs> on this. You got to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And at this point, I'm starting to go, all right, if this is a, uh, if, this, if this is an ARG, this business is willing to wait quite a while before dropping its final whatever it is. Right? Yeah, it doesn't seem like they're in a rush whatsoever. No. I mean, just coming back when they choose to. And interesting that they're, you know, actively watching yeah. the attack on Plant Parahood that claimed to be them. And they're like, nah, it wasn't us. That's good. That they, yeah, they came out and said, hey, I know we're silent, but that ain't us. Yeah. Don't stop with this false stuff. And, and of course, randoms on the internet are, you know, hey, you're trying to essentially take action, claiming to be a part of them or to be them. Because mm -hmm. that's just the way the internet goes. Right. People just want attention. They want to be like, I'm, the, I'm that strong cryptographer, man. Look at me. I'm the one with the clues. But yep. since 2016, there has only been one further update. And that came on April 29th, 2017. A member of the community attempting to solve Cicada claimed to find a new PGP signed message from the group. And it said as follows, quote, Beware false paths. Always verify PGP signature from 7A35090F. Signed 3301, end quote. And this individual claimed to have found that on the Pastebin website that I mentioned earlier, where they distanced themselves from that Planned Parenthood attack. But... After this point, and again, this is, I take this part with a grain of salt, um, but at this point, that's it. That is everything that you can know about Cicada at this point. Everything else has yet to be uncovered or uh, deciphered or solved or figured out. You know, you have the book of runes that has most of its pages untranslated. You have supposedly one of those pages pointing to a dark web page that has yet to be found. And you have Cicada periodically stepping in to say, you need to focus on the book and finish it. God, what did they want? Also, I'm like baffled that people that are, I guess, just to like simplify it, as powerful as them, like hackers or mm -hmm. other groups on, you know, I mean, they're on the dark web, essentially. Um, yeah. Haven't uh, tried to bring them to light Right, like they haven't any, been counter hacked or, yeah, or doxxed or any way, shape, infiltrated. Or form. Yeah, that's actually yeah. a really good point. Um, maybe they have been using cutting edge tech and cutting edge methods in order to stay away. Maybe their websites are so simple. I mean, that's why you use a dot onion address. I mean, we've talked about some of these techniques as far back as episode two with Satoshi mm -hmm. Nakamoto and the Bitcoin thing. Yeah. Um, but again, those dot onion web pages are designed to be anonymous and untraceable. And so it's clear that whoever was doing this is very knowledgeable in that arena and kept themselves safeguarded away from 
you know, exactly what you're saying, but that is a very good point. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They're smart. But yeah, why don't we, uh, let's, so let's revisit some of the theories that we discussed in part one and see how they hold up to the new information, to the new revelations, starting with the idea that this is a government agency looking to find, identify talent in the world, uh, cryptographers and, and the like. So obviously- a weird way to do it. It is a weird way to do it, but we, we discussed in part one how a couple military groups from uh, the UK as well as the United States have done similar things to, to much simpler degrees, of course. Uh, for example, the GCHQ created the Can You Find It campaign, which was in Britain, and that was looking for cryptographers. And then what's interesting, as a development now that we didn't talk about in part one, because it would have been a tiny bit of a spoiler, in 2014, the U.S. Navy released Project Archit... <laughs> <laughs> that sounds Ar like an Archituthis? Archituthis? I digress. It's a challenge inspired by Cicada, essentially to identify talent within the world. Wow. And, uh, and so that's interesting, you know? So there is like some inspiration being taken up. Yeah. And then also in 2014, the NSA tweeted a series of ciphers for people to break. So it's like the military is taking some notes, but mm -hmm. they're kind of giving it to their intern and saying like, do what they're doing. And then they're like, yeah. it's a word search or something, you know, in comparison. But it's interesting, you know, the fact that this is global makes me kind of still question this, right? Like, if the United mm -hmm. States is looking for brilliant minds, they, for security purposes, would probably want to look exclusively inward for citizens, not necessarily individuals from Japan or Russia or right. Poland as of Puzzle One, you know. So, you know, it, it's interesting, and it's interesting that agencies are following similar patterns. But to me, that is probably a, a maybe, but not nearly as as the probability is a lot lower than, than I probably previously you, thought. You know what's interesting about that? Because the whole time it's like, okay, what if, is it another government? If it's not another government, how are other governments aren't like trying to track this down or keep an eye on it, you know, because it could yeah. be malicious. But if there's parts of the government that are just like, you know what, we'll take, we take inspiration from this. Let's go ahead and give this a shot too. That tells me that they just don't see it as a threat you know what i mean yeah maybe the kind of just be like ah we, you know take inspiration from cicada and then let's just try and do it our own way yeah it, that's another good point you know like if you say a couple of the wrong words on a telephone call i imagine you land yourself on some sort of fbi list or something like that this seems to fit the qualities of something that the fbi cia international agencies of that caliber would want to maybe look at at mm -hmm. least pay attention to because if this is, and I'm going to get ahead of myself, if this is some sort of hacker group, it, which is one of the other theories we discussed, there's definitely something to keep tabs on here. But why don't we dive into that? Is this a hacker group? We talked about the fact that it, it, there's a lot of cryptography and steganography going on here. Uh, a lot of ciphers happening. And of course, we talked about the cypherpunks once again back in that Bitcoin episode. But a lot of the ideals that are continuing to be established from Cicada seem to fit the idea of the cypherpunks and the old, you know, crypto anarchy movement of the right. early internet. And then I touched on this earlier, but the other theory is that this is an ARG. And this is the one I think that we can probably fully close because at this time, no one has attempted to claim responsibility for this. At this point, there have been no products, services, or anything else that have come out to try to monetize this or promote themselves off of this. And since they keep pointing back to that runic book, I, I don't know if an ARG is, or at least in the traditional sense of an ARG, is the answer. Yeah, um, I think it's just, I mean, granted, maybe, oh, I mean, who knows? My head's spinning 50 different ways in terms of, like, what they could be. Um, I don't know. It makes, me, it makes me believe that they are very grounded in their beliefs. You know what I mean? I, I, like, I don't know. Maybe older, wiser in terms of an organization um, yeah they're very, they're simply because they're just so low-key they're right. very much just like we're gonna put out what we need to get out there and then just that's it right like they're yeah. not they're not touching anything else they're not talking a bunch on twitter <laughs> you know they're not tiktok in like <laughs> right right that's the thing man is that as as public as we think that this is or, or feel that it is you could live your whole life and never have heard of this yeah. It's it's prolific only when you look for it. At that point, it's 
unignorable. It's irrefutable. It's everywhere. The footprint is enormous. But again, not until you know about it, do you know about it? Yeah. It's very strange. Um, but that kind of leads us into a newer theory that is on the table. It kind of builds oh. off the idea of the hacker group or the cult mentality that we were assessing in part mm -hmm. one. But, but this one has a little bit more credence to it, possibly. So around the time of Puzzle 2, an anonymous user who claimed to be involved with Cicada said that it was a secret global society comprised of military officers, diplomats, and academics who were, quote, dissatisfied with the direction of the world, end quote. Uh, that's some movie stuff right there. It is. That's, it's so <laughs> movie stuff. It's almost so movie stuff that I don't know if I really right? want to believe it, but I also can. But they were said, uh, they said as, quote, I was part of what you would call 3301 slash Cicada for more than a decade, and I'm here to warn you, stay away. This what? is a dangerous organization. While I agree with many of their goals, their ways are nefarious. In fact, I think it is like a left-handed path religion, disguised as a progressive scientific organization. I realize this is a strong statement, but I will provide important evidence to support these claims." End quote. Get out of here. What? Now my spine is tingling again. Whoa. It just got, you know, it just got dark again for me. And, and like the balls too on that person just be that like, that is a claim. I've got evidence like, oh, that's juicy. That's good stuff right there. Yeah. And, and Christian notes that they like personally, he thinks that these might be, or this might be one of the email leaguers that we discussed previously, but what's creepy, if not straight up unsettling is that at this point, we are unsure if that evidence was ever produced and they disappeared. So we haven't heard of these individuals again or whoever this anonymous user was. So they came out swinging hard and then they saying disappeared? some things and they, no evidence came and they disappeared. You know, you know, I was just about to say, I was like very like, whew, my goodness, bold to- Very bold. To just, I mean, why just put it all out there? Yeah. Just throw it all, I mean, like if, if this is, you know, you're drop saying it this like is it's a, hot. an various group, right? Like drop it like the hottest mixtape of the year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, put that out there. Let the world know. Yeah. And because I, you don't want to half you know, step I, into that arena. That is that you don't, yeah. you don't fiddle with a little bit of that. I'm what not you're, surprised. What you're putting down and then not finish what you're saying. I'm not surprised that this person or uh, didn't show up ever again. Yeah, I, I would think that if it's a secret organization, if it's, you know, uh, um, tied to like some type of plot I've seen in a movie, mm -hmm. like no way you're going to be. You got days to live. Right. This is where you get bag and tag. This is where you get disappeared in the morning, mm -hmm. in the morning hours before the sun rises. But this mm -hmm. makes me start to think, is this and I know that this is, a, is one of those popular theories that gets stamped on everything, but this is where I seriously start to consider the idea of a new world order, a secret cabal behind the scenes that controls internationally, right? Yeah, you're looking for smart individuals across the world, or maybe they are just individuals who, I don't know, like, again, like this guy's saying, aren't happy with the way of the world. And yeah, this might not be the best method, but it's like chaotic neutral, right? Or like, I don't know evil good <laughs> right where you're like yeah. i don't care what burns but you know this isn't right you, um, you know it's a little interesting saying that this org you know it's like hey you know i've been a part of this organization for 10 years this yeah. is very powerful people from all across the world like why even put yourselves out there in the first why? place exactly. yeah, you've been if they've been running for you know air quotes 10 years then it seems like they've been just fine like, right. who are they going to find out there on the internet that is going to revolutionize their right. their their company, right? Listen, their ways. And I guarantee 99% of the people that heard this were like, hey, man, thanks for the cool information. I'm just like, I like mysteries, but you're screwed. I can't help. <laughs> yeah. Also, damn. I mean, if that's granted, like, if this is actually true, mm -hmm. I'd be so interested just to see the steps and then, like, kind of, like, the points of no return, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. this is, some, it's like, some kind of spy movie. It's a big old conspiracy. Dang. I think it's worth diving into, by the way. He, he likened it to a left-hand path religion. I had to look that up because I wasn't exactly sure what that was. And there's the mm -hmm. left-hand path and a right-hand path. But very, very simply, and per Wikipedia, the left-hand path 
Uh, they often reject societal convention and the status quo. They tend to embrace magical techniques that would traditionally be viewed as taboo. They question religious and moral dogma, instead adhering to the principles of anarchy. And that's a point that I want to highlight for right now. And another piece that was a little weird, but they, they, I wanted to note was they embrace sexuality and use it in magical rituals. So weird because twice now we've heard about magic and magic rituals mm -hmm. don't really align with the technology oriented clues that we've had thus far. But the anarchy piece to me stands out and it kind of connects to the cypherpunk movement and the hacker movement of the early internet. Um, so that is, that is interesting. But that's what we have as far as theories. Uh, I, I tend to want to subscribe to the hacker group combined a little bit with that secret society piece. But oh. let's let's talk about people that solve this puzzle. Th this is like the piece de resistance. Let's hear from the people who claim to have made it through. What they're saying, what stories they have to unveil, what information can they help us with to convey what exactly is going on here. And then I think it might backwards substantiate some of those theories that we discussed. Yeah. So the first individual I want to talk about is Joel Erickson. Uh, he's a 34 year old crypto security researcher and developer in Sweden. He solved puzzle one, but was unfortunately not quick enough to make it to the uh, email stage. He was locked out at the, of the time gate. Oh, it wasn't fast enough. Not fast enough. And the problem is I feel like this guy was absolutely smart enough to have done it by himself and you know, Cicada kind of pointed this out, but I think a lot of people snuck through that time gate that probably didn't earn it. You know, yeah. if they just kind of slept there, eating their Cheetos, you know, rubbing their fingers while they waited for <laughs> everyone to do the clues. And then at the 11th hour, they're like, I clicked the link first. I'm in. Yeah, I'm sure they would have weeded those guys Instantly, out real right? quick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But one of his theories that I thought was interesting about who Cicada was, was he thought it was an underground society. And he said as, quote, their constant references to prime numbers and the like, they are likely intellectual, anti-establishment, ideologically driven, and they seem to be valuing logical slash analytical thinking very highly. They seem to share a lot of ideology with the crypto anarchy movement and old school hackers. So this guy kind of substantiates some of my gut instincts looking back at some of those theories. Um, but that's all we have, uh, you know, if you distill it down to the, uh, to the takeaway yeah. lessons for Joel. And again, I'll say if, if you guys want to read about any of these articles that any of these individuals have been a part of, uh, I, I encourage you to do so. But we did our best to pull out all of the facts or all of the pieces that probably have the most meat on them and have the most substantial evidence towards this, this mystery. The next individual is quite, is quite interesting. His name is Marcus Warner, and he actually had that interview with the Rolling Stone magazine that I mentioned earlier. And he had the most details to offer with regards to Cicada and their end goal. So what's interesting here, and what makes me feel terrible as a human being, or as a anybody in, a, in, a, in the workplace, was that he solved Puzzle 1 when he was only 15. Yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> the young genius. <laughs> right. I mean, like, if I when I was 15, I was, like, burning days playing video games. Yep, that's what I was doing. Seemingly, he verified the leaked email that we discussed in part one regarding puzzle one uh he made it past the time gated web page of puzzle one and wow. he began work on what was known as the cicada anonymous key escrow system of course simplified to cakes because these days everything is secretly cake yep it's all a cake <laughs> but along with a few members from cicada as well as approximately 20 people that was by his count 20 people that made it through the puzzle he was working on that project and it was software that was designed to protect whistleblowers, which is interesting because, what? you know, this is around the time that Edward Snowden was a household name. And oh, since, yeah. since that year, even 2012, you know, whistleblowing has been a, a tremendous topic in the political spectrum. I mean, I don't know if that's for better or worse, but I think in the digital age, information is flying out left and right. Some of it oh, yeah. fake, some of it real. And so... You know, there's something uh, honorable about, you know, trying to, when you combine some of the supposed messages that we heard of Cicada before, combining it with this honorable, potentially, uh, you know, mission of helping whistleblowers, there's something, uh, you know, good there, which kind of calms me down a little bit because it feels a little less nefarious. It feels a little bit yeah. more positive driven. But he was saying, you know, that the whole purpose of Cicada was to develop software systems in line with increased security and privacy 
and the like. And by the end of 2012, the Cakes team had slowly stopped working due to a loss of interest until Warner was the sole remaining developer. At that point, the site mm -hmm. they used was shut down and Cicada ceased communication with Marcus and everybody else on the team. And so that's all we have uh, from Marcus at this point. Interesting. So yeah. It, was, yeah, it was just for increased security and they put a team together to work on this. Mm -hmm. And then they just lost interest and stopped talking to him. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, you know, like, I think the allure might have been the puzzle. You know, you didn't know it was at the end. And sometimes the answers to your questions are worse than just the curiosity of, a, of an unanswered question. Right. That's why when yeah. movies have too many sequels, you can be let down because you have answers to things that you wanted. But now that you have them, you don't like it. So mm -hmm. who's to say, you know, I'm not sure if at this point they were being paid or if this was a passion project. Who's to say? There's a lot of reasons why people might lose interest, but it's interesting that we haven't heard from too many other individuals like him. Nox Populi is the next individual I want to talk about. And he's interesting because he's a YouTuber who completed Puzzle 2. Uh, he at least really? made a YouTube channel specifically to discuss oh, his okay. path. Uh, so he wasn't a, a YouTuber prior, but uh, he does have a couple videos where he goes into detail around his projects, the individuals he worked with, kind of his story, which you can check out at your leisure. But uh, he started up a web series documenting this experience, and that web series started in 2016 and I think has been updated as of maybe a year or two ago. At the end of the puzzle, he wasn't invited to a website after Cicada reached out, but instead he was told to quote, be patient. So again, we have this idea of patience coming in. But at that point, he received no further correspondence from Cicada and it kind of just disappeared. He connected stories from many supposed puzzle solvers and verified that most of their stories were identical, that there was an invite, something happened, and then there was silence, right? And they were told to be patient and yeah. then Cicada disappeared. He said that by his count that there were five other winners in 2013 for puzzle two, and that his personal guess as to what's going on here is that they are an old cypherpunk movement. So, you know, combining what Knox is putting down with what mm -hmm. Marcus was saying, we seem to have some through thread now that seem a little bit more of a solid concrete ground. Yeah. But again, there's still so much left to be answered. Uh, we have two more solvers, not a whole lot of information from them. So we'll kind of discuss what we got here. But there is a gentleman named Technology, T-E-K-K-N-O-L-A-G-I. Uh, it was another 15-year-old who happened to solve Puzzle 1 along with Marcus. But this person indicated that they were more afraid of Cicada than Marcus seemed to be. And they, quote, insinuated that they were a part of a bunch of different organizations. It was some kind of secret society, end quote. And that's all we have written down by technology. But I would love to ask Christian if there's any other pieces that stood out uh, regarding technology's story here. Nothing too drastic. He, like you said, was part of the group that was solving Puzzle mm -hmm. 1 and was part of that Cakes team. But as Puzzle 1 grew more and more detailed and they started working on that process, he started to, like you said, get a lot more afraid of Cicada. Yeah. And that was the reason that he dropped out was because he was afraid of who Cicada was, what they wanted, what the, the true purpose of the project and the puzzles were. That makes sense. Imagine this whole puzzle with an end goal of question mark and you and you get through the end goal and you find out that the purpose of it is still question mark, yet you are a part of it. There's something, yeah, there's something undeniably mysterious or like scary about that. You know, you don't know what you're taking part in. You're a 15 year old. You could be helping some sort of major crime that you don't even know of yep. that could come back to haunt you. And on the other side, the flip side, Cicada could have just hired a bunch of 15 year olds that made it through puzzle one. And they might've been like, ah, shit, we're going to, this is some sort of local law. You know, we got <laughs> yeah. a bunch of kids working on our stuff. There's so many different factors that can come into place. And I didn't even think about it. I was like, yeah, I mean, they, right. I'm thinking like, okay, you get to a certain point and you're just like, I'm in like <laughs> I am a part of this group but yeah no they could they they totally could have just put them into a group and say hey like this is you know work together we've we found the people we wanted to find mm -hmm. and work on this yeah I'm gonna throw something out there before we briefly touch on the last solver what if the matrix is real and what if these are the individuals being identified and they're being freed from the matrix and that these are just there 
d robotic AI counterpart living their life going, I don't know, I'm just a normal human and I left cicada robot arms. Like, you know, because the Matrix, they were after hackers and stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know. I'll be like, wake me up. Maybe. Take you Y'all don't need some muscles. You know what I mean? Y'all need some <laughs> some people with uh, great reflexes and attention. You know what I mean? Like, just I can play smart games. people. <laughs> Is there like another phase where it's just like, we just need people to carry stuff for us? Because I, I love hey, to be a part of that phase. Yeah, I'll help the revolution. Just like free me and I'll do, I'll do all the physical labor with yeah, Fredo. We'll, we'll get work. in there. We'll get in there. You know, we'll be a footnote in the real world's mm -hmm. revolution, but man, we'll be there. It was like, yo, we were there when, when Neo <laughs> saved everybody. He was flying we were, around. We were way in the background, making sure <laughs> that the, 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 the mess hall was cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> Obscured by a couple signs and a, and a focus blur. All right, well, the last solver goes by, or his name is Jordan Thompson. He supposedly solved both puzzles two and three, or as much as you can solve three up into this point. Uh -huh. And uh, and the only thing that we have written here was that he was unhappy with Libra Primus and the runes therein. Probably because of how convoluted and complex it was. But uh, Christian, I'd love to hear if there's any other um, pieces regarding Jordan Thompson that are, are worth noting here. Once again, not really. All I could really find on Thompson was a website had done an article, kind of like an update article after puzzles two and three in the silence following wanting to hear from people who solved it and wondering where the next update was, like why there wasn't a puzzle for or anything like that. And so Thompson was saying that basically after solving puzzles two and three, the Libra Primus runes got a little too complicated for them. So there were a lot of people frustrated with that. And then that frustration was only compounded when Cicada came out with the post and said, the answer is in Libra Primus. And so he was saying that the community kind of as a whole had slowed down because that part was just a little too frustrating for them. Yeah. Well, it seemed to like Weird. ramp up its difficulty exponentially. So it's kind of like sprinting into a wall. I feel, and that's, and that's even shown in the way that I simplified the puzzles over time. Like puzzle one, okay, digestible. Puzzle two, it's getting a little out there. Puzzle three, uh, what? <laughs> We're, yeah, it just a lot it just went to 100 and balls to the seconds. walls well i mean if i mean i forgot which person was saying that there was a group of them right after the first um yeah marcus kind of puzzle. Warner seemed to indicate that there was a group called cakes or working yeah. on cakes rather and there was a handful of people made maybe they just wanted less maybe yeah because like uh let's see it was about 20 people marcus said made it through puzzle one and then uh nox populi indicated that there was only five people that made it through puzzle two so using simple math, you could say that nobody ever will figure out puzzle three. Um, yeah, that's uh, Damn. that's that's the frustrating part, but but it's also the exciting part because it's still alive. There there are there's still information to be had. Um, anybody can go find these runes, these pages, and start to analyze them themselves. I, I think what we need is a Benedict Cumberbatch imitation game sort of situation going on where. We need a brilliant mind focused on this 100%. Mm -hmm. But then the question's asked, is this even worth it? You know, or or is this just some sort of like, I don't know, like there is still a little bit of that cult ethereal piece that it starts to depart a little bit from the scientific. So it's, it's hard to say, man, if it's worth really diving into. But I love how tangible this mystery is. Yeah. I think, I think that's one of the things I really, really like about it. Like, you can go in and get your hands wet if you want to. Yeah. Now, you know, you, you're gonna be want a, to be a dangerous group. You so, get out don't do it. I'm like, Hell no, <laughs> I ain't out there. I'm sitting my ass here. That's it. I'm good. <laughs> I will talk about this through a microphone and yep. miles and miles of distance. And if you are listening, I totally respect you and do you. Unless it's bad, then maybe you didn't maybe hear it from us. About it. <laughs> maybe rethink about it. I don't know. Yeah. You know, change your ways. I don't God, know. God, this is this is definitely oh, one of my favorite my one of my favorite mysteries. Uh, that there is to uncover in the internet. Obviously, there's a whole bunch. But in closing this, um, I tend to fall in line with the idea that this might be some sort of cabal, secret society, uh, cypherpunk-oriented group. There's a couple pieces in there that I'm not super comfortable with because like, some of these anonymous testimonies are, are not helping the image. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would think it's... <sighs> 
I think I'd probably lean more towards the fact that this is just like a group of people that are just like, okay, we're going to be, you know, we're this, we're the security group and we're trying to protect the world mm -hmm. via technology. Um, yeah. Cause the whole being some nefarious type of like organization, I, I like, why would they want to bring themselves to light in any way, shape or form? Right. It, it I, leaves I, too many loose ends for some yeah. sort of Bond villain-esque situation. Like, yeah. Eh, it's just, eh. right? I think if it was evil, what they would do is hire a thousand people and just off the people that weren't geniuses. Like, if truly they were, you know, evil and they had nefarious motivations, right? Yeah. They would just brute force the tactics. Yeah, I just, I just can't see it being some, like, super secret organization with all this power, especially if it had pow such powerful people. That they would just be like, yeah, let's just put a test out there and see if we can grab people that are worthy. And it's yeah. just, I don't know. And the it's fact weird. that this, like, I know Puzzle 3 is crazy difficult, but again, it's easier to develop a cipher than it is to back out of that cipher and figure out what is actually being said. And so there, I, I don't want to close the chapter on the idea that this is a smart individual that has made themselves look like they had a global footprint, right? Just in conclusion... Mm -hmm. There, there are still so many pieces left open. Obviously, there is a lot of similar stories, a lot of similar elements here that kind of imply a certain direction. But that's, that's the tough part, is that there's still just enough unknown that it makes the whole thing uh, unfounded, potentially. But that's it. That's Cicada 3301. <sighs> That's everything we know to this day. I encourage you all to dive into that mystery. If you want, get hands-on with it. Look at some of those pages. Get really creeped out. You know, once it's midnight, of course, turn off all the lights, read some more of those pages, and then go to bed with nightmares. But if you guys like this podcast, this is the end of the first season. We're figuring out how we want to come back, but it will probably be around October. We're going to take a couple weeks off uh, and start pre-producing the next season. We have really, really enjoyed doing this show, and it's been... an amazing honor to make it for you guys and see you guys enjoy it continue to review the podcast that keeps us on the top charts and you guys have been tremendous about getting us into those top charts and talking about us you know there was a reddit thread about us and everything that hit the front page it's just been fantastic and we love making this show but again if you guys have uh mysteries that you stumble into in your normal everyday life maybe you go on through twitter and you see a weird website or you're listening to a video and and something flickers across the screen never be afraid run. to send that our way and run. then run away screaming <laughs> run run the other way as fast as you can don't look back burn close the <laughs> close the laptop burn Slam it, it down burn it to hell <laughs> and don't forget to put tape over your webcam because they're definitely looking but we, we love hearing your recommendations. We love reading the reviews. It's been fantastic. And we'll make sure the off-season feels nice and short because I'm excited, just like you are, to get back to the mysteries at hand. But we'll see you guys in the spooky month of October for some more stuff. And, uh, and thanks for listening. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>Are you a fan of video games, social deception, and reality shows? Introducing Survive Block Island, a reality competition show set in the world of Minecraft. I'm Trevor Collins, and I'll be hosting 12 of the greatest minds in video game entertainment as they compete in perilous challenges designed to test their skills and friendships, and maybe their internet connections. Competitors will face challenges and eliminations. Winners will be granted safety, while weaker links will be voted off one by one. Ultimately, only one person will survive Block Island. Watch Survive Block Island available now by going to bit.ly slash survive block island. This is a Rooster Teeth production. In 1956, an entire town was forced out of their homes to make room for a new lake. Since their departure, the land has been plagued with suspicious deaths and strange drownings. Today we look at the inexplicable case of Lake Lanier. This is Red Web.
shuffling papers, doing business. So in, buckle up, kids. This one's a death lake. It is. Throw that on like a VHS cover. Death lake. Death lake. You swim, you die. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we got some sort of, uh, you know, Lake Placid situation. Giant alligator, giant Ooh. piranha, giant snake all battling it out. Anyway, I'm Trevor Collins. With me, as always, Alfredo Diaz. Bringing that uh, gut instinct. Yeah, I got a gut. To the dead lake. <laughs>
inexplicably, deadly, maliciously, viciously, yeah, uh, incomparable. Mm-hmm. Keep like, going. Oh, I thought we had other adjectives going on. Oh, I really yeah. like the thesaurus, Fredo. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm like a thesaurus. Crack me wide open. Well, all right. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, so this this lake is a 38,000 acre reservoir that lies in northern Georgia, somewhere around 45 minutes north of Atlanta. And, you know, we'll go into the history of this lake, but essentially there used to be a town here. And we'll go into like the, the past of this location, the dark past of this location, as well as some of the mysterious deaths that have happened at this lake. And then dive into what people think is actually going down at this reservoir. Off, a, off the top on. of my head, to me, it just seems like the reverse. It seems like you take a lake mm-hmm. and you build homes on it so that way you can make money and profit. Right. But here they're just... I don't, I don't, I don't know. They're like, take hey, out, love your all, town. Yeah. Get it out of here. Take out all these homes that are, I don't your know. Your house they're, is they're in the way of my future lake. Maybe they're renting or mortgages or whatnot and just put this lake that doesn't make money. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe it does, right? Because the plan, we can go ahead and dive in. Yeah. This, this reservoir, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a man-made lake. Yep. Uh, and it was constructed in 1956 by the U.S. Army Corps and engineers to supply water as well as hydroelectric energy to the city of Atlanta nearby. So they just said, forget this town. We're going to... Mm, in the way. We're going to demolish this them. This is the to, perfect place for my power lake. power that city. i got to have my lake. That's crazy. 36 or 38,000 acres. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. So let's talk about the land prior to 1956, the construction. This land that yeah. Lake Lanier sits on mostly served farming communities, right? And the most prominent community was the town of Oscarville, Georgia. And again, we'll kind of dive into the history of that town in particular. And and it has quite a dark history as well to it, which plays into some of the theories as to what's going on here. But the U.S. government bought out hundreds of families from their land. And those who refused to sell, go figure, were eventually forcibly removed from their homes. Did they still get paid? I think in modern times, right, if you're up on a city street, you know, and you're like, I'm going to keep my my house. It's good prime real estate. And then eminent domain comes through, like, they have to give you fair value, but under these circumstances, just by the way it sounds, yeah, it they probably like got they bottomed just, out, right? Oof. They're like, you didn't take the deal, you're going to take the scrapings now and yeah, get the heck out of here. Scraps. Which sucks, too, because, I mean, this is a whole different conversation, but this was nice farming land. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's like, farming's important. Absolutely. I wake up. Healthy soils. I eat eggs, bacon. I came from a farm, I think. <laughs> I was just thinking about egg plants. <laughs> Wait a minute, that is a plant. <laughs> but I'm just thinking like, you know, I go out to my egg tree and pluck a couple of fresh ones. Yeah, it's a couple. <laughs> and I pet my chickens and I thank them for planting the tree. And then I strip off some of the bacon bark. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's like some mm. kind of Willy Wonka type tree. Ooh, now we're now yeah, we're cooking. There we go. Cooking eggs. But there's a lot of buildings on this land, right? Not just the farms, but the buildings that were made out of wood were entirely torn down. Probably salvaged for for whatever purposes, but if they were made out of brick and concrete, they were just left abandoned, eventually to be at the bottom of this reservoir. Damn, they really didn't give a damn. They're no, just, they just gutted whatever was left. Oh God, no! At the bottom yeah. of it, and then just put water on top of it's it. It's all gone. Establishments oh. in the city were entirely torn down to make way for this lake, including the cemeteries. During this process, it is said uh, that many graves were shifted, no. and s- that you know were where this lake was going to be. They were shifted to the surrounding lakefront property. Essentially, and and some reports were saying, they were essentially moving upwards of 700 bodies from 25 different cemeteries in this area during the deconstruction period. There is 25 different cemeteries in this I guess so. Maybe that just tells you how big of a landmass this is. What was it, 38,000 acres? Right. Now, there are some small plots, right? If you have some historic cemeteries, they're mm-hmm. probably on family grounds. Right. Maybe a 20-odd graves or whatever. But then you think of these, like, massive kind of more corporate cemeteries that have, like, thousands. And I don't yeah. think that's what we're... You're smirking. What's going on? No. What are you cooking up <laughs> no, here, bad man? Nothing. Nothing. Huh? nothing. Okay. This is, this is huh? a, this is a, I was just thinking to myself. I was like, Trevor, how many acres do you think you are? <laughs> How many acres do yeah. I think I am and I'm like, as a not, person? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, point zero, zero, yeah, point zero. two acres. It, it's a question that did not need to be asked, <laughs> but it just crossed my mind. I don't know. This We're man talking measures about, people in acres. Yeah, I'm like, how many acres is man? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, listen, I'm I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. I'm working on my, my acre gain. I'm going to be a point zero zero one more. There you go. <clears throat> but Caesar Yabor, a spokesperson. <laughs> you say your boy. 
<laughs> He's your boy. <laughs> yeah. uh, a spokesperson for the U.S. Army Corps and Engineers has said that it's possible, very possible, I would add, that many unmarked graves were never uprooted and subsequently moved, right? So, so it stands to reason that there's a lot of buried bodies that weren't marked that are just kicking it at the bottom of the, the this lake. And this lake is purely used to just help generate energy? That was the that's the project's goal. Yes, is to provide fresh water because it's a reservoir for the city as it grows, but also energy Wait. by flow of the so water through a dam. Also, fresh water to the city. Mm -hmm. like, like we're talking like drinking water, toilet water. All you that. just got me thinking. Like, what am I drinking? The drinking dead people water. I guess so. Ghost water. Ghost water. It's ghost water. Hold on a second though. I kind of interested in ghost water. Nick, write this one down. Ghost water. Store.roostdeep.com. New we product coming soon. No. Each bottle of water is going to have a whole ghost in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and by ghost, <laughs> it's just going to be a bottle of water that's labeled Red Web <laughs> Task Force Beverage, and then there's going to be a little <laughs> tiny no baby hand that just floats it. around inside. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm interested in the idea, and I'm interested even more so in cornering the market on ghost water. Now, dead body water, totally different. Right. Not interesting. No, that was one of the ideas. Filter that but stuff then out. We, we made it more appealing right. to the people, ghost water. I would be like, Brivia, how much body does this take out? How many acres of body is this removing? Uh, I per was gallon? like, wait, Bravia's TV. <laughs> oh, oh, Sony Bravia. <laughs> What's the, is it Brevia? What is the filter, water filter? Brava. Brita. <laughs> listen, I was keeping, <laughs> listen, I'm building my own universe of brands. <laughs> Um, ghost water in Rivia. Look, this is not a water podcast, okay? But essentially, once this construction, or should I say deconstruction site was cleared, the town was flooded, all right? So let's talk about how some of the mystery really started to begin. Okay. Since 1956, there have been 675 deaths at Lake Lanier, with 27 bodies out of those 675 kind of never being recovered, lost forever. To the bodies of this water. This is like that other mystery that was up in the Himalayas with the lake with all the bodies. Yeah, yeah, Skeleton Lake. Skeleton Lake. Mm -hmm. Tell me you got Skeleton Lake 2, the sequel. Oh my God. I love it. So a lot of people missing at this lake, a lot of people passing away. Countless more people have been injured in this lake or needed rescue in some way. Additionally, there have been many drownings and boating accidents that have uh, taken place on these waters. And the water levels have also fluctuated quite drastically due to various periods of drought in the area and as this water level has gone up and down uh, it has revealed more and more of the debris that lays beneath the surface of the water right i mean we'll talk about it but there was a, a car wreck that went into the water eventually as the water levels went lower they found the car but again a lot of the concrete and brick buildings that were a part of this town this area were just left so you got to imagine that there's some stuff just kicking it at the bottom of this lake and i mean you don't want to bottom out your boat on the top of a Wendy's, you know what I mean? No, not at all. You don't all. want to scrape Even your belly. Even though Wendy's is so delicious. Eat right. fresh. Right. Hashtags, you can sponsor us. <laughs> Man, get the Wendy's Task Force <laughs> meal deal. Oh. Comes with, comes with, what's, what's the food we'd make? Oh, we know what the beverage is. Well, here's the thing. You ghost water. You <laughs> the beverage is ghost water. $3 premium. Okay. All right. Then you get a half and half with the fries. Okay. Oh, half I was fries. Thinking Half cheese sticks. And then the burger's also half and half. Yeah. Half burger, half, half chicken. chicken. Wow. The mystery is in the burger. The mystery is, the mystery is the, what am is I eating? It's in the chicken burger. The mystery is I don't know what I'm eating right you now. You have no clue. It, is this, Close your mouth, take a bite. Right. Is this real meat or is this that beyond meat? What is it? Solve the case. <laughs> oh, which side of the... Oh, God. Anyway, I don't know why it's half and half, but I'm into it. But meal deal aside, now I'm hungry. And ghost peppers aside, you know, coming back to the debris that continued to show up, I think that this added to the lack of visibility within the water, which not only put people in precarious situations, whether they were diving or snorkeling or what have you, water sports just become difficult in murky waters. But even more so, rescue missions become more difficult. And if there's a bunch of debris and you're swimming underwater, stands to reason, you're like, oh, I'm going to explore this building that's down here or, or accidentally get caught on something that's down here. Bada boom. I don't want to swim in like person. any lake anymore because of the very little I've heard of this so far. I didn't want to swim in a lake ever since summer camp one time and I jumped off the pier. That was where we did all of our diving and swimming competitions. Yeah. You got the diving board, it goes out to this lake, you're like, huzzah. And then, it, well, first of all, the ticklings of the, 
the seaweed down there didn't like yeah, it. yeah but then I when like i looked feeling. up and i'm like and i i come up out of the water mm -hmm. like like a model right Very slow motion right now yeah. sun like glistening off of me like a merman and i and i pff, spit some water yeah. out of my mouth yeah. in slow-mo like all sexy like right. and then i then i look over still in slow motion my long locks flowing Everything over else, my shoulders motion, just you in slow mm -hmm, motion mm -hmm. my my rippling shoulders and then i look over i'm 12 and i look over boy shoulders yeah my boy shoulder i look over and i see one of the counselors just like with a squeegee just shoveling all what the goose off the deck no. into the water and i'm like i don't want to swim here anymore shoveling all this poo in yeah, here and then you look at yourself you have goose all over you wow. and you're like oh Ugh. so yeah anyway i don't th for those reasons i'm out I don't yeah. like swimming in large bodies of water. There's something... I'll, I'll, chill, in a, I'll chill in a bathtub, which yeah. I'm sure it has its own issues, but whatever. This is not goosh in my bathtub. Right, right. It's just your own it's my human own. stew. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just Boil me up, eat me. <laughs> You're just like marinating like a bag of tea. Yeah. Piping hot. Ready to drink. You want some, you want some mystery boy water? Fresh and ready. <laughs> that, now that's ghost water, because that, that's going to make me see my spirit. Um... But let's let's come back to this. <laughs> We've been doing this. All right. So it's estimated that 10 to 20 people die at Lake Lanier every year, which is a pretty high average. And in 2017, there was a study conducted by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which concluded that Lake Lanier, while only 7% more popular than the second, so it's like the most popular lake to, to visit in Georgia, it's 7% more popular than the second most popular lake. But despite that, it's twice as deadly. Ooh. So 7% more popular, 100% more not deadly. not a good trade-off. Unless, mm -hmm. unless there's 20 people that have already died that year. Because if it's usually the average is 17 to like 20 or uh -huh. something like that. I mean, if 20 have passed away, what are the odds? Right? 21, 22. Probably safe. So you're saying once they hit the average for that year, yeah. you're, you're guaranteed I'm safety. I'm sure that statistically it drastically right. I've drops never heard a mathematician that lied. Yeah. Right, hey, math doesn't lie. It's math like, doesn't it's lie. Dealt in absolutes and exactly. averages. Exactly, and they're written by some real buff people. Yeah, buff maticians. So, so here's the thing, and I want to talk a little bit more about these stats. So Lake Lanier is the one we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Lake Alatuna is the second most popular lake. So from the years 2005 to 2015, uh, a lot of statistics were averaged out, and Lake Lanier experienced about 90 deaths in that 10-year period, ending once again in 2015 while Lake Alatuna saw about 45 during that same time frame. Jesus. Literally twice as much. Lake Lanier has on average 1.2 deaths per million visitors, while Lake Alatuna has 0.64 deaths per million visitors. Once again, almost exactly twice. Lanier welcomes about 7.5 million visitors per year, while Alatuna sees about 7 million people per year. So it's, it's interesting that this one seems so much more lethal given that it has only right. just it's only barely edged out on popularity right i mean it could be anything that the water is terrible there's they got graves in there exactly that's all bad there i mean like just the history alone as far as the construction is concerned yeah. shows that there's a lot of i don't know cut corners mm -hmm. a lot of dangers left within the waters but there's also a storied and dark history that play into the supernatural elements of this location. Uh, but Kat, is Lake Alatuna also a reservoir or is that one a natural lake? I'd be really curious about that too. Yes, Lake Alatuna is a reservoir also constructed by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Okay, so this is apples mm. to apples. I was gonna throw away my Ain't suspicions no and be like, it's, in this it's nature versus nurture, baby. Yeah, it's no, not. no, 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 no. They're going around building these cheap dead lakes. Right, right. They're scooping people out of there and being like, give me your fertile land. We don't need food, we need water. We need dead water. Yeah, dead water. What stops someone from just putting like, you know, it's a two for one. If we put more water here and it kills people, we need less food. Evil. That's evil. But you got to say that there's something there. Uh, what stops someone from just like putting piranhas in the lake? Nothing. Oh, okay. Laws. Yeah. The promise of holding, upholding laws, right? I mean, yeah. if it's an invasive, here's the thing. You could probably put in a bunch of piranha and the Maybe. water might not be. Right, it might conducive right. to their living conditions it, it also could be toxic right or, or true who knows? it might just die right away and then you have a yeah. bunch of piranhas just floating this might be a bit of a tease but like this just reminded me of one of the theories that is kind of a revisit what from the, a couple weeks ago what the hell 
that I'm really excited to okay. dive back All into. Right. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Because it. it shook you to your core, and I've... Okay, we'll get into it, but I anyway. swear if Squonk is in there. Oh, yeah. No, it's not Squonk. So, okay, so let's talk about Oscarville. There's a history of Oscarville I want to talk about, and then there's a dark history, again, that I keep alluding to, that I want to dabble with, because I, I want to, you know, because I don't want to, like, skirt over some facts here, but trigger warning for the darker history of Oscarville. Anyway... Lake Lanier resides partially in Forsyth County, Georgia, and up until the 1830s, the land was owned by the Cherokee Nation. Around that time, the U.S. government forced out the indigenous community, and it would become one of the southeasternmost origins of the Trail of Tears. This is kind of where the darker history of Ooh, Oscarville begins. Okay. Over the next 80 years, the land became known as Oscarville, Georgia, and was subsequently re-inhabited by a thriving African-American community of about 1,100 people. And things only get darker from here. But suffice to say, and, I, and I'll keep it brief because it, it, we could go on a very long, dark tangent. So throughout this time, again, starting in 1912 is when it really seemed to all kick off. There's a lot of racial tensions. There's a lot of ideological groups of problematic background. There's sexual assault happening during this time period. There's a lot of jumping to conclusions with potentially wrongful yeah. punishments being initiated. Uh, there's there's hangings going on and, and all sorts of things in between these. All the bad um, stuff. That right. People of color there's an angry militia in play. Again, things. there's a lot happening yeah. in this area. And many believe that it's this horrific, tragic past of Oscarville that contributes to the series of tragedies that continue to occur on the lake's waters today. That's just giving you some of the background yeah. for, for kind bad of bad energy, some bad energy land. happening on this land. Again, not only just from kicking people off the land, but literally what people have done to themselves and each other on, the, on this property. Yeah. So let's start talking about some of the mysterious deaths that occurred at this lake. We'll go through a handful of some of the key stories that have a lot of the most intrigue, a lot of the most detail. But again, there's a lot of other things happening between these ones. So let's talk about the Lady of the Lake. This could either be one of two people, Susie Roberts and or Delia Parker Young. So let's talk about them. In 1958, Susie Roberts and Delia Parker Young crashed into Lake Lanier after losing control of their car on the Dawsonville Highway Bridge. They were last seen at a gas station nearby where they had left without paying. Some bad energy there. Skid marks were seen on the bridge indicating that the car had slid across the center line and into the water. Delia Parker Young's body wouldn't be found for another 18 months. Jesus. You think that's a long time? Well, I'll get into the details of how her or what her body was like, but it wasn't for another 32 years. What? Until the car was found at the bottom of the lake in 1990. And in that car, once it was excavated and the mud was removed and cleaned up a little bit, it was Susie Roberts' remains that were located inside the vehicle. How did it go so long without finding the vehicle? It's when just the, just, the visibility um, of the lake, yeah, the I guess depth the of it. Visibility is terrible, and so even if you send, you divers, would think, let's just go down right here, yeah. you know, where the skid marks are. But yeah, it took a long time. But what's interesting, and before I continue, is coming back to Ms. Young's body here. It was reported that her body was missing both of her hands and two toes on her left foot. Now it's up for debate on whether these appendages were removed prior to the crash, during the crash or in decomposition somewhere oh. in that 18 month window or again if maybe like you said piranhas but maybe some other sea creatures or, or lake yeah within 18 months would your flesh really like become that fragile where pieces of your underwater body, probably yeah i think it, if it was possible it'd be because it's underwater yeah like normally that wouldn't happen but then like why not anything else just two toes and then specifically the hands. It's interesting. Maybe there's some science behind it. I'm not buff enough to understand it. <laughs> so yeah, 32 years later, Susie Roberts' remains were found. Specifically, they found her skull and other bones that were still located in the front seat of the car, which is why they believe it was Susie Roberts. There are conflicting reports based on eyewitnesses of this ghost, the lady in the lake, on which person the ghost represents. If it represents Susie Roberts, or if it represents Delia Parker Young. But regardless, there's always one detail that is certain with regards to the Lady of the Lake and that the lady is always seen floating in a blue dress. And we actually have a photo uh, of, of, of the, lady the remnants of the car. Damn. Not, not a lady floating in the water. 
Yeah, that's a card that's been in there for a hot minute. Damn, dude, you're swimming with all this stuff below. No, man, I'm not going to dive into any lake anymore. This show has ruined me. What? Like, could be anything down there. Yeah. You know what's crazy is um, where I grew up, I, you know, I grew up in uh, Indianapolis, and near there, there's a reservoir that a friend of mine lived near. And so mm. whenever we visited, that was a place to go. And it's called Geist, which is, I think, German for ghost. Either way, it means ghost. Oh, no. And we always grew up from him telling stories about how there used to be a town in that reservoir. So now I've got to know, like, my own mystery here, a, tr a real one. Yeah. Why are we burying towns with reservoirs? Uh, we, don't we have plenty of land going around? Well, that's <laughs> like, what I'm saying. Like, like I guess you need the power stuff, but that, I don't know. Especially yeah. because it just seems like everyone just kind of half-assing it. Right. This just seems like it hits close to home. And maybe it's that they're like, it's going to cost too much money to refurbish this right. town. Let's just swamp it and start over. Yeah, that's usually how it goes. The uh -huh. easier, more cost-effective route. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another story. So we have, this one's much more modern. This is Kelly Nash. He's a 25-year-old who disappeared from his home in Buford, Georgia on January 5th, 2015. So Nash had woken up in the early hours of the morning, coughing and wheezing, and he told his girlfriend, Jessica Sexton, that he believed he had the flu. So she went back to bed after hearing that he had the flu. He's right. like, I'm getting up early. I'm going to go do my thing. I think I have the flu. And she goes, aces, goes back to sleep. Yeah, That's not what she said. But she woke up at 730, <laughs> and by that time, he had left. But what, what, what's weird is that he left without his ID, his wallet, or his keys. Oh. The only thing missing from his home was a 9 millimeter handgun with a single magazine. Mm -hmm. His body would not be discovered until over a month later on February 8th. A fisherman found him badly decomposed in Lake Lanier, which is why this is part of the, you know, the lake story. Autopsy revealed that Nash died from a gunshot wound and subsequently drowned. So it sounds like he got shot and then ended up in the lake and passed away that way. However, his death was never ruled as a suicide and there was never a suspect in custody. So it's interesting that he disappeared with a weapon. So it stands to reason that there might have been ideas of you know, trigger warning, like self-harm in play. Right. But I don't know. I don't know the conditions of the body. I'm not an expert in this field, so you almost have to take it on faith that whoever did the autopsy, hopefully a, a month of being waterlogged wouldn't impact this, but if they're not Probably ruling it as though. a suicide, and yeah, they're saying... I'm saying what, like, it's, it's just, why wouldn't they rule it as a suicide? You know right. I mean? It just seems like it would be. There was discussion about how the cause of death was drowning. Right. So... Whether he was shot or shot himself. He ended up in the lake. You ended up in the lake. I feel like if you were to go, say this was self-harm, uh -huh. why make it that much more painful? Right? I don't know. Like, you experience being shot and then also drowning as opposed to just ending it. Right. It raises a lot of questions. Yeah. But even more so, I want to come back to the idea that he wakes up ill wakes up his girlfriend to say hey i'm ill or whatever was it his plan to go to this lake that day cat or was it like was he was there any reason why he was up that early to leave no so that was kind of the whole mystery behind it is that um he there's no explanation as to why he ended up in the lake and to my knowledge there was also no reason for him to be up that early as it is. just seems like, odd all it around. Was un yeah, yeah it was unusual for him to be gone after waking up and saying that he had the flu. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky one. Th did he live near the lake? So Buford, Georgia is, is relatively close. Yeah. To me, to me, it just seems like there's so many bad things. I'm sure everyone even remotely close to this lake mm -hmm. has heard stories about just like all the terrible things that have happened at the lake. So I feel like at that point, you kind of attract more terrible things. Right. Location. You start looking for them or you start noticing them more. Start looking for them. You start noticing them. Yeah. Um, if you do plan to right, uh, commit suicide, you might think of the lake because bad things happen there. Or if you decide to want to, I don't know, commit murder, dump the body via the lake. You already heard stories about bad things happening there. And then also how it's hard to recover bodies, etc. Mm -hmm. It just seems like, I don't know. You know about it being bad, so it just kind of attracts bad. Right. It becomes a hot spot for mm -hmm. ne'er-do-wells, perhaps. 
which is an interesting thought going into this next case because it's similar, similar true crime in nature. Well, hello there, Task Force. As always, this is my opportunity to peel back the red web curtain and speak directly to your eardrums. Now, before uh, we dive into it, I want to talk about a few friends of mine who also started off a podcast. I know this is where I talk about ads and whatnot, but truly, this isn't an ad. These are just good friends of mine that started a podcast I think you genuinely will like. It's called Ship Hits the Fan. If you like maritime disasters and shipwrecks and, you know, we've, we've scratched the surface on those kind of things. And so I know a couple of you out there really like this stuff. If you like that, Ship Hits the Fan features Charlotte McGrath, Patrick Brown uh, from Funhouse, and they also have Brian Gar from Rooster Teeth, and they talk all about it. They're not nautical experts, much like we aren't uh, sophisticated journalists, but they do go into detail about the mystery at hand, what went down in that disaster, and they have a good time while doing it. They're very funny people, and uh, I think you should give the podcast a listen. It's anywhere that you get your podcasts, and it's pretty much a sister podcast to Red Web. So please check it out. Let them know we sent you. Because again, they're great friends of ours, and I think you will genuinely like it. That said, there's also uh, some Red Web news I'm very excited to talk about. This one kind of snuck under the radar. I had no idea about this coming, so we haven't been able to talk to you about it yet, much like the pins and the hoodies and everything else we do. But they, <laughs> the designers uh, of our merch team liked the slanging and banging joke that Fredo lays down so much. They actually made a really cool design that... <laughs> That features uh, a, a just a nice buff scientist lifting really heavy beakers, and it looks, uh, it's modest, it looks like a normal design, like a gym shirt, kind of, and it says underneath it something along the lines of, like, physique through chemistry. It's amazing, and the design is very, very cool, and so that is up in store.roosterteeth.com right now. If you want to support the show, that's one of the fantastic ways to do it. Uh, I believe there's also a decal, so if you are a buff scientist out there, you can slap that on your back window and let the world know that you got those rippling biceps and a rippling brain. You know what I mean? Beyond that, if you want to support the show, there's a very free way to do that, and I can't thank you all enough for doing this. It's reviewing the show. We read through the reviews periodically to make sure that we're on the right track and making sure that, you know, as we develop this show and as it continues to unfold, that uh, we're still making something that you enjoy listening to. In fact... I just found out the other day that we are, and I'll tell Fredo this again later in another episode, but we are the the top rated podcast in all of Rooster Teeth in, in terms of not only score, average score, but in the volume of reviews. I think we are only second to one other podcast, but... Yeah, you can you can review us on Spotify or Apple or wherever. It is just a free way to give us a little thumbs up, and it also kind of gives us a boost in the algorithm. So that way, the task force can grow. You got more people to talk about mysteries with, and it also enables us to do more cool things like we did for our Halloween special. We've got... Um, I, I, I don't know if I can tease it yet, but we have some ideas that we want to build out Red Web with. And the more support this show gets, the easier making those pitches and developing those productions becomes. So again, I just want to say this in this moment. I, I really appreciate you. Thank you for listening to these little sidebars, these little tangents that I get to update you all on. But with that said, I have some fantastic sponsors that I want to talk to you about. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by HelloFresh. You know HelloFresh by now, but... If you don't, they send you fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients right to your home. It even comes with an easy-to-follow recipe, and right now, they've got a limited-time recipe that you can get into. With twists on cozy international classics like beef tenderloin and cheese fondue, or miso sesame shrimp, they got bacon ramen, they have so many new international classics that I just love that you can get into. By the way, hey, this is outside the ad read. You get to keep those recipes, make yourself feel like a chef. But anyway, if none of those recipes are your speed, HelloFresh even has a series of fit and wholesome meals that are both nutritious and satisfying with low calorie and carb conscious options. I use HelloFresh periodically to make my food making easy. Like they say, it comes right to your door. It's fresh. It makes you feel like you know what you're doing in the kitchen. It teaches you some skills along the way because you follow that recipe. It's got the pictures. It's not a headache by any means. And next thing you know, in a very limited amount of time, you got yourself a tasty meal. So go to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb16. That's the number 16, by the way. And then use code RedWeb16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, that's up to 16 free meals and three free gifts at HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb16 using code 
RedWeb16. This episode of RedWeb is also sponsored by Upstart. For many people, getting your financial life in order means getting out of credit card debt. But where do you start when it feels like a never-ending interest cycle? Upstart can help you pay off your existing debt quickly and easily with a personal loan so you can start living your life. Upstart's model considers other factors beyond your credit score, such as your income, employment, and other information, to help you find a smarter rate for your loan. Check your rate in as little as five minutes for loans from $1,000 to $50,000. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash redweb. Again, that's upstart.com slash red web. Don't forget to use our URL. Let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. So again, go to upstart.com slash red web. And from me to you, I want to say finances are important. So always do your research and do your due diligence when you uh, are handling your finances. I'm so very excited about this next sponsor because I know if you're listening right now that you love podcasts. And so I need to tell you that there is a podcast festival at RTX Austin this year. Podcasts of all calibers and sizes and types, including ours, will be going to Austin, Texas on July 1st through 3rd to do live recordings with their shows. And you could be there. We're going to have a Red Web panel. It's going to be phenomenal. I don't know if we're going to do an episode live or uh, hang out with you guys. I don't know. Uh, We definitely want to do a meeting of the minds as we always do at RTX. But hey, RTX Austin takes the best in podcasting and gaming and animation, and it brings it all to Austin, Texas for one unforgettable weekend. Step into the exhibit hall and be transported into another world filled with cosplayers, live gaming, indie artists, and very, very much more. I've been to this since 2013 as a fan and now as an employee. I literally can't understate this enough. I'm so excited, genuinely now to be a part of this thing. So please, if you're interested, please show up and come out. Uh, Of course, health and safety is our number one priority. Masks will be required during the event, and we will follow city guidelines as they stand at the time. And if you're unable to attend due to COVID, we will work with you to postpone your badge for the following year, or you can request a refund. We want to make sure this is nice and simple for you because we know there's a lot of complexities in the world. So head over to bit.ly slash RTX Austin 22. Just in case, I think it's all caps, by the way, when you put that URL in. Again, bit.ly slash RTX Austin 22 and grab your badge for RTX Austin and get ready for a weekend filled with the best of podcasting, gaming, and animation. And uh, man, I, I'm looking forward to it. It's July 1st through 3rd. You will see me there. You will see Alfredo there. Christian, Jillian, we're all going to be there. And I can't wait for it. So hopefully we'll see you there. And with that said, let's take a deep old dive back into that spooky lake. So this is the case of um, or the story behind 16-year-old Hannah Truelove from Gainesville, Georgia. She went missing from her apartment complex near Lake Lanier on August 24th of 2012. Her body was found lakeside the following day. So this time it's not after a long swath of time. And she had suffered multiple stab wounds. However, it's unclear, looking back, on if those stab wounds themselves were lethal or if they were less life-threatening. You know what I mean? Right. Superficial. They weren't like fatal stab wounds. Per se. Stab wounds just seem lethal overall. Right. Well, yeah. So maybe, maybe they were just, they were, I guess, residing in apartments nearby. I would assume that maybe they were going for a stroll and there was a robbery of some sort possible that's just off of what you've told me so far yeah but i mean like that's an interesting gut check because in the days prior to her disappearance you know she's got a twitter so she's tweeting giving her thoughts out there and she had tweeted about fearing that she had a stalker around her apartment complex which to me stands out immediately as um okay there's a mysterious suspect here don't go outside yeah yeah or you know report that stuff try to get a, a cop tailing you to help look after you See if you can find anything. But, I mean, her father stated, though, that her behavior didn't seem abnormal in the days leading up to her disappearance and her death. And authorities were never able to gain any leads, and her death remains unsolved. Now, this is interesting because it kind of brings me back to what your thought is, where maybe this is just a hot spot for 'er ne'er-do-wells, right? We have some supernatural stories, but we also have more true crime-leaning stories, which means, like, maybe if people catch wind that, oh, this is just where... 
you know, if you commit a crime, you dump the bodies. Yeah. And and it never gets traced back to people. So maybe that's where people go. The hot spot, right? Maybe, I mean, less people's maybe maybe when a criminal is looking for where do they do their crimes and they're Googling, they're looking at the number one top result. So so right. maybe that's why, you know, we talked about how this is twice as deadly, but only a little bit more popular. If it's the top hit. You know, and Those, everyone is, has it their name in, in its mouth in their mouth. Like they're like, that's where I'm gonna so do my crimes. In, in this hypothetical world, there's like an evil Google. There's an evil Google, and you say, "Okay, Google, where do I do it?" Or where do I do the crimes? Or what I've learned from the hit Netflix show, Us. No, you. We. You. Uh huh. As, oh, I haven't uh, seen that. You told me I gotta watch that. Uh, you remember by you look for some new uh. New uh, land that's being built, new houses, stuff like that. Throw the body in the concrete. Oh, what was that? Where it's that show he's a stalker, in Maine. But he's, a, but he's also a lover. What's that show in Maine that's based on Stephen King's place? It's like Black Rock. Is that what it's called? Castle, Castle Rock. Rock. Yeah. yeah. That happened in Castle Rock. They were, they were building a mall out there. Yep. You throw it in the. Somebody threw the, a body into in the, the concrete as it was yeah. setting. Yep. Ooh. Well, basically, Creepy. I don't show up on evil Google. You don't want to show up on evil, evil Google. Listen, that would show up. Is, is it just Google with like a little mustache? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting, though. I think I think that that theory, that idea addresses the fact that the statistics are skewed. Right. Because if you look at the number one hotspot. Right. It means that it's the name that everyone's talking about. It's the That's the destination. Yep. It's 45 minutes from a major city, which have a lot of people. And so they might be like, that's where I'm going to do my. My ne'er do well stuff, you know. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit up evil Google. Evil Google. Check off my my to do mm -hmm. list. Sign into evil Gmail. It's email. Oh, crap. Evil mail. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> at email dot com. Um, but I mean, truly though, that could be why the statistics are skewed. Oh, you know? thousand like, percent. I mean, honestly, like uh, I'm sure you're really gonna do some bad stuff. A lot of times people are just trying to research information. Boom. Probably on a list somewhere. I also damn, I'm probably on a list just for saying this stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, you um, are. Just because of this damn show. But, yeah, I would think that people would put a little thought behind it, and then this would pop up as a location yeah. of, uh, you know, of interest. So I had another curiosity just based on that. And so I looked up Lake Alatuna and Lake Lanier as the two popular destinations. They're about equidistant. In fact... Lake Lanier is a little bit further away because it's so much longer. The size is dramatically different. I'm talking like the surface area with which these two re reservoirs cover mm -hmm. is dramatically different. And I'll show you. I'll show you here. If you look at those two reservoirs and you're like, I need to hide a body, you're going to pick one you're over the other. Pick the bigger one. Right. There's much more going on. There's probably much more remote spots. Anyway, that's just my own as we kind of dig into this mystery my yeah, own ongoing I mean, that theories one's just significantly larger yeah but that does not address the more historic stories such as the lady of the lake right and the supernatural entities that have been arising around this place so let's talk about some of the theories behind some of this cuz i think these last two cases in my mind stand like i feel like there's just missing data but that one is a, a murder case and the other one is a murder or self-harm case, you know? Yes. But it's this first one that has me the most intrigued as to what's behind this. Like, why did their car suddenly veer off the road? Is this a supernatural hotspot beyond this story? And what's causing all the other disappearances at large, right? Because, again, this is just three stories. And there's a drop in the big old lake. Oh, yeah. It's full of stories. So the first theory kind of discusses the ghosts behind the unmarked graves. Because, I mean, we've seen poltergeists, and I'm not going to take it lightly. When you move a grave, there's something kind of sacrilegious about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's something almost offensive about that. Mm -hmm. uh, especially since there's a lot of religious ceremony that can go into burying someone. Right. And so to just, in the nature that this town was kind of wiped clean, moved, and flooded, it seems very just pure raw business. Yeah. Lacking the human element. You're dead, chilling. Yeah. And so there's a lot of... Yeah, and so like like you said, there's a lot of bad energy here, and if there are unmarked graves, that's even worse, right? They're just left yeah. there to their own devices, and so some people believe that the ghosts behind these unmarked graves were left Angry behind to haunt the waters, right? That makes sense. 
like you, you kind of you're buried you put the rest mm-hmm. and all of a sudden people come in and start digging you up and stuff, stuff like that or maybe not giving you a proper reburial and so you go from a sleeping ghost to, <laughs> and then you wake up angry because it moved you Whoa. Or didn't move you. Whoa. Or now that you're in a lake, you I go, felt like ah, I was there. No. Oh, ah. whoa, the history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. how angry Alfredo Ghost would wake up. Dang. I'd be chilling. And, ah, ah. Oh, I can taste this water so aggressive. What is that? <laughs> is this alkaline? <laughs> What's the pH on this? Oh, that's ghost water. Ew. But that's the thing, man. Like, and that's where I, I want to kind of really lean into the supernatural part of this because I know you and I are of varying belief i think we're both mostly open-minded though and it all depends on the particular story the goings on of each case with how much you and i believe in the supernatural and in this particular moment i think i'm a little bit more pragmatic i'm a little bit more it was humans did it but uh, just given given the nature of some of these stories however it is definitely interesting to me and my mind is intrigued by the idea that maybe some of these spirits kind of a hand on the wheel for lack of a better word right not literally shifting this car off the road, but it's literally little... shifting the car off this road. I mean, like, right. are, are these spirits kind of impacting people's energy when they're around this lake to kind of give them bad vibes? Or are they fully being possessed for a moment where they lose sight of what they're doing and they go off and yeah, commit some sort of criminal activity? Lady. Who knows? But there was a diver who explored Lake Lanier in 2017, Buck Buchanan. And I'm going to quote him here. He says, you reach out into the dark and feel an arm or a leg that doesn't move. That's creepy. Basically indicating this, this lake is pretty mysterious, pretty dark in nature. Wait, so he just dove down and then just started feeling limbs and stuff? Well, what's the story behind that? Did he actually find somebody in that way? I don't think he found anybody. He was just basically saying, yeah, that when he dove, you just, you, you know, you have a ghost touch, for lack of a better word, and you feel it. Right. And you feel these like limbs, and you kind of can feel people like mm-hmm. tugging on you, and there's nothing oh, there. Yeah. Oh, God, so it's easy to. Here's the thing. It's easy to conflate the ghosts two. in the bottom. Ah, right. Well, it's easy to conflate it because on one hand you're like, oh, like the bodies that are being found. Right. On the other hand, it's like th- there's so few stories of people experiencing ghosts under a body of water. It's always yeah. I went to this abandoned this or that, and I. Right. Witness a ghost. This guy's diving in these very murky waters, and he's it like, I feel a presence sometimes a touch me. ton of bodies down there. I mean, something could be touching him. I don't want no. <laughs> I'm good. You can't see anything. You're just going in blind. Yeah. So not only are you like going in blind, like we went to, um, what hospital was that? Oh, I always forget. Uh, Yorktown. Yorktown. Yorktown yeah. Memorial Hospital. I mean, we have flashlights. Even if you turn the flashlights off, it was dark as hell. We couldn't see anything. Mm-hmm. Imagine it being dark as hell. You can't see anything. And you're underwater. <laughs> like, and then something touches I'm, you. I'm Ooh. good. No, right. no, no, no. So to kind of, again, this is a little bit more of a general answer, but coming back to the idea of ghosts, many of the stories that we didn't cover are simply people drowning, unfortunately, right? And there's a lot of p- ways people can do that. Even a talented sw- swimmer can, can drown. But but when it becomes a high population density relatively of deaths per capita in this lake people start to wonder is it not other forces for example are these angry ghosts that have been done wrong are they pulling people under as a kind of revenge you're like you're kind of having a vacation spot where our town was yep where where we were buried and resting exactly or where atrocities have happened right to talk about the early 1900s late 1800s like a lot a lot has happened on this plot of land so it stands to Not reason a restless that spirit, a hundred percent. So in that way, my mind's kind of like, I don't know. I mean, the minute you, the minute you said people got moved away from here mm-hmm. and that there were a ton of um, cemeteries, I was like, oh, there's this this whole mystery is going to be attached to some kind of right. form of ghost story in some way, shape, or form. Right. So these stories that I outlined kind of send my mind one way, but then when I start to explore just like the thought experiment of the supernatural events going on here, I start to go, well, hold on now, wait a minute. I don't know. But yeah, that that is kind of the unmarked graves and the spirits theory behind a lot of these uh, unfortunate deaths. The next one, catfish. This is it. This is it. Wait. We're back. Catfish is back on the menu. No. I'm talking about monster catfish. You're not thinking. Oh, absolutely. Wait, I that's am. actually written down? Absolutely. Let me see it is. that paper. Local fishermen, to hold point on. Point out to me. Local fishermen have reported seeing five to seven foot long catfish. It's catfish in, in the this damn theories. Lake. Yeah. 
dash catfish. Mm-hmm. Five to seven foot catfish, Fredo. If I they if, get if, if you were to take anything from this podcast yeah. and how many episodes we shot so mm-hmm. far, is that catfish are dangerous. Now, now he's sounding like the mad one. I'm not mad. That I'm you... mad for talking about owls. No, Listen, no, no, The no. more I hear about owls, the more I'm like, okay. You're talking about owls and conspiracy. California uses owls about... to guard their vineyards. Why? Because they're better than poison. They're evil. They Anyways, plot. come back to catfish. Come on, go for uh, it. No, but I'm just saying, like, the, the catfish actually go out there and start eating people. I didn't realize they get yeah. that big. Yeah. They get huge. I sent you a clip. I will never be. I sent him a clip between as, this episode and the a, last episode we talked about catfish, where a, a, a man, a giant. What was the clip? I'm gonna pull it up. Did you, did you watch it or did, were you too fearful? No, of course like, I watched it. This was okay. This was on. If anyone wants to look this up, it was on Reddit. It's on the WTF subreddit by celebrate drobber underscore zero one. Made it to the, to the front page, and this man is fishing like ten feet away from himself. He's He's at one of those holes that one would noodle at, right? Yep. You shove your arm in the Just hole noodling. and the catfish comes out. He throws the bait right at that hole, starts reeling it in, and from the hole at the what? edge of the river, this giant eel-looking nasty Dude, catfish comes ripping it's out. It's huge. And the, they move so fast. Like, you can imagine the swallow you hole. I'm, go- I'm never going to dive into a lake now without, like, a pocket knife. I will cut my way out of a catfish. You're going to drax your way out of them? Yes. Would you voluntarily allow yourself to be consumed by one? If you, if, if I, I gave ha- you a pocket knife and everything you requested, could if, you both if, if I had like your a, way out of that? If thing? I had like a medical team, uh huh, right? That was like, like we give it a minute or two. We give it a he, minute. He's not out of there. Mm-hmm. Cut him out of the fish, right? Yeah. Then hell yeah, hell yeah, throw me in that. I'll go in there one leg at a time. One leg, dude. This thing's sucking does, you in does, whole. Does it like cut me up as I'm going in? I don't no, know. No, I think fish I think swallow, swallow you whole. Your whole. Yeah. yeah, and then what would happen is you'd probably suffocate. Hold my, I I go, <gasps> and then I dive right in. <laughs> this man's like, all right, let me. Yeah, I can just imagine you noodling. You got your arm in the water. You're like, all right, I'm gonna get this tiny little catfish out. And shunk, and you just like your whole body gets well, sucked under the. No, what's gonna happen? Surface is I'm gonna put my hand in, and yeah. then he's gonna jump up, and I'm gonna go. Surprise! That's what I wanted, and then I dive <laughs> into him. He, he's like, "Call an ambulance," but not for, for me. Not for me. And then he gets sucked inside the catfish. Someone get like, ready to. What did he yeah. say? <laughs> <laughs> My insides. <laughs> ah, I, I, I have a catfish. <laughs> yeah, I'm like someone get ready to cut some fish and grill it. We're eating good tonight. What's yeah? What's your catchphrase? Is that what it is? When you rip out of that thing, you're like, "Yeah." Anyone want a chick fillet? Wait, that's a, a fish fillet. What is it? It's, McDonald's fish fillet? It's just going to be... A Mick fillet? It's going to be... Meow. Cup, 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 cup. <laughs> that couldn't have been worse. A worse cat... Fra- <laughs> he, uh, he rips out of this catfish, <laughs> and his cat fra- his catchphrase is... Gobble, 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 gobble. Meow. Gobble, 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 Yeah. He's like, wow, he became the catfish when he came out. Oh, man. All right. Well, let's come back to... So... Come so, back to reality here. Come back to reality, but still with the catfish. So local fishermen have reported seeing five to seven foot long catfish at the lake. Some have said that the catfish are known to swallow dogs and get close to, no. to the Yeah, and they get close to the water's edge where they could potentially attack swimmers and divers. In fact, some people have said that, that dude, they what? have attacked what? fishers and divers. What the yeah. hell? They I've get never known that catfish were deadly. Mm. Why are we not talking about... Why is the media not warning us about I, catfish? That's what I'm saying. That's the conspiracy. Me? I would just go and swim in lakes and you're telling me that I could have potentially had these deadly catfish? Yes, yeah, I could have swallowed baby Fredo whole? Are you kidding me? That's the thing. The conspiracy isn't catfish could eat people. The conspiracy is, why aren't we talking about catfish That's eating people? That's what I'm people? saying. They're dangerous. 26 or some odd out of the sev- 700 so odd uh, deaths. What are the numbers? Let me find that. Hold on. Let me get what, my what, files. What are the catfish deaths? You can hear him rustling through his papers. 27 bodies haven't been found. That's 27 catfish heads that yeah. I demand on my yeah. desk by tomorrow morning. Yeah, those are people that have been eaten, digested by catfish. It's true. Possible. But yeah, I mean, like, they, they said... That some people have been attacked by them. One story describes a truck carrying live chickens that swerved off the Thompson Bridge in the 1980s. Divers were sent to examine the wreckage, and they found catfish, quote, the size of 12-year-old boys, me, at camp, yeah, in a feeding frenzy, swallowing what? chickens whole. Now, these are chickens. What? But still, but, imagine if that was a dog or... Mm-hmm. 
a little a little boom i mean here's the thing too it doesn't have to swallow the person whole it just has to get enough of them to be like i can eat this i'm confident i can put them down they're chewing on their feet yeah. they're chewing on their head or whatever drag them down under and um the rest is history right whether they get them down or not they are pulled under they lose their air i mean how, i mean there's gotta be like a professional right that kills these catfish i'm sure oh man Oh, you got to pull in the top brass. Yeah, call Aquaman. Get him on the line. The I reason mean, why I'm, I say I'm Aquaman assuming is assuming there's just someone. There's got to be like a catfish wrangler or something like that. I'm not saying that he just stands next to the lake, right? And then this, like as soon as he show, sees dude. one, he goes ha ha, and then dives <laughs> right. into it. He's but, like he's shirtless. He's got right. camel pants on. He's licking the back of the knife, going he's like, yeah, yeah. And then the, he's like I can, I can I can feel it. And he's Here's like a fake chicken. I don't understand his methods, but damn, does he <laughs> get results? <laughs> Yeah. And he's like, ha! Ah! He yeah. dives off the bridge. You're like, where he's go- he's been under for 15 minutes. And then he comes up three catfish two miles away. Yeah. yeah, he comes up wrestling a catfish. Now here's the thing. I say Aquaman mostly because okay. the last line to the to okay. the outline okay. to the note here. Tell me. Others have reported giant catfish towing their boats around the lake. I'm just picturing Aquaman up up on two catfish riding them around the lake. Now I don't know, cat, let me ask you more seriously. Are these giant fish commandeering these vessels by grabbing them or grabbing their anchors or something? Yeah, from what I read and what I picture is like, yeah, what you would use to kind of like tie your boat to uh-huh. a dock or something that these catfishers kind like of jaws. They just grab and hold and towing them. Grabbed on, started pulling. Them. These fish are a menace. This is blowing my damn mind. This is a whole TV show. This is, this is a whole TV show going around the world exploring what? giant catfish and what they're getting up to. Somebody's been releasing well, these. I just, I'm hulked out of their mind, catfish, steroided up, 32 years young, buffed as hell, and had had no idea that these catfish were a thing. I had no idea you were a scientist. I had no idea I was buff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's is a thing. I I didn't oh, listen that's, I, when I started this podcast wild. with it you. Makes sense. I it didn't realize it would be go so going so hard on catfish. Sense. That's but yeah. But that's catfish. Let's talk about the next most popular theory. And the last one that we're going to discuss for for today. And this is arguably the most common cause of some of the drownings and rescues are boating accidents here at Lake Lanier. According to the Georgia Department of Natural Resources in 1999 alone, there were 72 boating incidents resulting in 52 injuries and eight fatalities in one year. So, I mean, we're cherry picking this year, I think. But, I mean, it stands to reason that if once dangerous probably always dangerous we're not going through and taking down some of the debris that's underneath the lake and when the water levels come up and down uh it's entirely possible that you run aground of some of these structures that were once there and they're concrete and brick and whatnot so it's quite sturdy oh so you're talking about actual like the people driving their boats around get messed up yeah that, oh, a lot of, that a lot of the re- yeah, that's that these wild. are just boat accidents. Oh damn! I thought people were getting hit by boats, and it was like could just be that too. Bad. I mean, accidents featuring boats. Oh wow! It's uh, I think what it is is it's an amalgamation of these theories. You know, there's yeah, it's a it's a popular spot with a giant lake that's far removed that's kind of acting as a beacon for ne'er do wells, right? And criminal behavior. There is a markedly dark past that is not helping the supernatural energies of this place so it's already got a bad footing in the spiritual and this place realm. still exists and yeah this lake is still there and then you also have the natural excuse of the giant catfish that have factually been seen floating around pestering people this i, le- I think this, it's just this is everything an amalgamation terrible. of terrible things it's yeah just, it has ghosts and uh crime mm-hmm. and catfish and catfish everything in between baby but yeah, like I said, a lot of the the debris in this lake have obstructed boat paths, uh, have caused boats to wreck without seeing them coming because of the murkiness of the water. And in previous years, the water levels have actually become so low. We, we talked about the droughts. They've become so low that it was unsafe to boat in the area kind of at all due to the proximity of the debris to the surface of the water. And there are also reports, just lastly on this theory, of boats capsizing, catching fire for seemingly no reason. What? Kind of attaching it back to the spiritual nature of all of this. What the hell? One could quite easily say that that this land, or once land, now lake, is cursed. 
And I would I would believe that. No one should go near this lake. No. This should all. no longer be your destination of choice. <laughs> Even if this, like you don't believe in the supernatural or just, I don't know, uh, evil spirits or whatnot. I mean, damn catfish in there. Right. Maybe if you, uh, <sighs> wow. Say you don't believe in the real mm -hmm. that is the catfish. Right. You still have bodies in the damn lake. So you don't There's believe that. For everyone There's here. still buildings in there. Absolutely. You have the practical, the obvious, the reality, the true crime potential, the yeah. spiritual potential. Like literally everything about this lake is just Nothing saying about this lake not is hospitable, good. dude. Nothing. Yeah. At all. So how much money would it take for you to swim across it? Oh, about five bucks. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. <laughs> five bucks and a knife. Okay. There we <laughs> yeah, go. Yeah, okay. There you go. Uh no, to swim across this thing, assuming I could do it, mm -hmm. it would take a healthy sum. I'm saying like a couple years salary worth because huh. like whew. and and a chase boat to kind of watch me. Oh, a thousand percent doggy paddle across. this yeah. thing. I mean, the boat would be uh, a fair distance away. We want to make sure like mm -hmm. we don't want to scare off any potential catfish. Right, right. I want it to be an authentic. Yeah, it needs to real be an life authentic thing. Experience. I'm not going to baby you across the right. damn Right. I don't lake. You know, I don't want to scare away the what could happen because that's exactly. the fun of the danger, the risk. But I do need to be attached via some sort of sturdy rope, you know. And I'm not saying let's dig out one of these numbers from Grandpa's old shed in the back. Right, and the, I got some dusty like, rope. I'm talking like a chain. You're talk yeah, you're talking about us doing our research, spending yeah. a little money. I'm mm -hmm. sure. I'm sure there's rope technology and yep. and rope advancement. Right. And you got all these fancy knots and fancy ropes, Cat anti slip, anti catfish. Right. Right. Yeah. Now here's the thing. What's what, what I picture is going to happen is you're like every safety precaution. We got this man strapped on by a bunch of chain, so if he gets yoinked by something, we can try to pull him back yeah. up. We're good. What's going to happen is I'm gonna pull you apart. No, well oh, maybe okay. they're going to pull me up, and it's going to be like we got a leg. It's going to be like the goat from Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. They're going to yeah. be like we had everything. Where is it? In 2009, multiple people were sent friend requests from a mysterious woman claiming to look for her sister. For those who accepted, they soon found themselves embroiled in a story involving terrorist organizations, cults, and a secret war between factions. Today, we look at the story of Junko Junsui. This is Red Web. Welcome back, everybody, to Red Web. Trevor Collins here. A perfect way to start this whole episode because you need to put yourself back.
This is audible. Hello, welcome to number five, season two of the Ricky Gervais Show. The Ricky Gervais Show on Guardian Unlimited. Hello, welcome to another podcast uh, of the Ricky Gervais Show with me, Ricky Gervais, Steve Merchant. Hello. All right. And, of course, Carl Pilkington. All right. Rick, you'll be pleased to know we've already had some responses. Uh, you remember last week I mentioned that you can email us on podcast at rickygervais.com if you've got anything for Carl or you or I. And uh, Simon and Mark have already emailed us in this link to something that was on the BBC News website. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's a remarkable story. Um, well, I'll, just g- I'll give you the headline straight away and you can, you can draw your own conclusion. Lion mutilates 42... 42- in Cambodian ring fight. That's, that's just the headline. That's a hell of a headline. That I mean, makes me want to know more about yeah, the story. Well, that's, what headline, that's what a headline should do. That, I mean, I think we'd all read the news. We'd all take more interest in the news if, if they could open the you know, BBC News at 6 o'clock bong. every night. Bong. Lion mutilates 42 midgets in Cambodian ring fight. Bong. bong. We'd definitely pay more attention. Um, so this is the story. It's just extraordinary. Spectators cheered as entire Cambodian midget fighting league squared off against African lion. Now, I didn't even know there was a Cambodian midget fighting league. You're an ignoramus. Everyone, of course, has heard of the CMFL, which is genuinely what it's known as in Brilliant. Cambodia. Now, like you, I don't know who the Cambodian midget fighting league are normally fighting. I don't know what tournaments they I assume it's each other. Well, is I assume it, each other. It's midget fighting, then. Yeah, well, let me just give you more information, and then we'll, we can dissect it afterwards. Tickets had been sold out three weeks before the much-anticipated fight. The fight was organised when an angry fan contested Yang Shimoni, president of the CMFL, claiming that one line could defeat his entire league of 42 fighters. So this bloke is going to the president and going, I reckon a lion could get all your midgets. I reckon he could, yeah, he could destroy all of your 42 midget fighters. Uh, now apparently Shimoni, the president of the CMFL, he takes great pride in the league and uh, he's conveyed in a recent advertising campaign that his uh, midgets will take on anything, man, beast or machine. Now I don't know what kind of machine, again, midgets are fighting. But don't um, the midgets have a say in A this? washing machine. I don't don't the midgets going, all right, keep it down. <laughs> no, <laughs> they won't fight anything. Well, we won't fight anything. Let's, uh, we'll fight each other. We're, <laughs> yeah. we're sort of like equally matched. <laughs> no, yeah. you'll fight a beast or no, a no, machine. No, 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 no. I'll fight another midget. I will fight any midget. Is what, when I said I'll take on anything, I meant another midget. <laughs> Machines. So this bloke goes, I reckon the lion could take on your midgets. He goes, rubbish. Yes. Uh, and that is why an African lion was shipped in especially for the event, which took place uh, a couple of Saturdays ago, in the city's Colosseum. I mean, they've already got they've got a Colosseum, Rick, which is already brilliant. So hold on, this is sanctioned by the, the city? Well, the Cambodian government allowed the fight to take place under the condition that they receive a 50% commission on each ticket sold and that no cameras would be allowed in the arena. <laughs> we'll take 50%, but, you know, for, for, for dignity's sake, <laughs> there's no cameras. <laughs> you know, we don't want to make this, into a, we don't want to make this into a, you know, into a, a circus. A spectacle. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's just, it's just lion versus midget, but, <laughs> exactly. you know. Well, 42. Never forget, there was 42 midgets. Uh, now, this is, this is the tragedy element, and this is why we shouldn't be laughing, because the fight was ended. Don't tell me the lion gets hurt. Well, the fight was ended, Rick, after only 12 minutes, after which 28 of the midget fighters were declared dead... Right. While the other 14 suffered severe injuries, including broken bones, lost limbs, and they were basically but unable the, to fight. But anymore. the lion wasn't hurt? It would have seemed that the lion was okay. Oh, good. Because the lion had no choice in this. No. See, that's the, the, I, I, I love it when a human takes on a beast and comes unstuck. Because that lion was scared and defending itself. Those little midgets were loving it. They wanted to go What do you mean they were loving it? You don't know that. Well, why would they do it? Well, what I find out... Well, I worried, you see, I don't know the ins and outs of this. I wonder if they were fighting against their will. I got the horrible feeling, because uh, with all due respect to any midgets listening, they must be fairly easy to round up. <laughs> you could probably corral some midgets fairly easily. You know, you do need some regular full-size people, and it'd be easy to grab some midgets and take no. them away, whisk them away, put them in a cage. No, because... No, 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 because they don't, because a lot of them stand on each other's shoulders and wear a long coat. Sure, but... And a hat, and you go, oh, that's not a midget. No, Let him go. They, well, those ones are getting away with it. They're yeah. fine. They're wandering around... F- you know, fine. Because who's r- voluntarily going to join the Cambodian Midget Fighting League? But midgets who want a bit of action, who want to fight other midgets. They're allowed, they want to fight. They can't get in real boxing matches because the fellas are too big for them. But they can go, well, I'll tell you what, let's have our own little fighting league, right? But if I was on the Cambodian Midget Fighting League, I'd be living, I'd be thinking to myself, 
well, I can't believe I listened to my agent and he's put me up fighting a lion. I mean, I should have just taken Panto in, in Grimsby. I can't believe that I I've can't done. believe it. But hold on, though. I thought... I, is, uh, are they all really midgets or are they lumping in dwarves with them? It, it's not specified, Rick, but... Um, but I, that annoys me when people say, oh, look at these midgets, and I go, hold on, though, they're making up the numbers with a couple of dwarves there. <laughs> that's clearly only 39 midgets and three dwarves. <laughs> sure. Well, that's amazing. Carl, what are your thoughts instantly? I mean, you're going to have a, a take on that. I, whose side am I meant to be on there? What? Well, by well, I'd, story, be on, I'd be you're... on the lion side. Uh, if I, I'd never go to a bullfight, but I love it when I see a matador gored to death. Because, again, yeah. the bull doesn't want to get in that ring and fight a bloke with swords, okay? So I love it. I think it's disgusting. And when someone says um, a midget versus lion, I'm thinking, well, it's okay if the lion wins, to be honest, because they yeah. haven't got a choice. So, uh, And I hate it when people go, oh, I went to a bullfight when I was in Spain, but it's the tradition, isn't it? Oh, well, there's loads of traditions that we don't adhere to anymore. Mm. So, I'm, gl- I, I, you know, it, I say it shouldn't have happened, of course, but if it happens, I'm glad the lion isn't hurt. See, what's annoying me is I've sent money to Cambodia because apparently they're hungry and haven't got any energy. <laughs> so what's going on? Well, it's, it's much easier to, to, to fill up a midget than it is a regular Cambodian... You know, they, they, they're, they're I just feel like on a I'm, I'm being cheated a bit. You were conned before with a charity, weren't you? Well, a few times, yeah. With a, what about the the old lady? What was that? I got stopped. And it's like, uh, they, they sort of drag you in by saying, have you got a gram? And I said, no, they died and that. It's like, oh, did they die of the cold? No, she's, you know, ill, what have you, just, just old age. They said, well, what happens with a lot of people's grams is they die in the cold, right? So I was like, oh, that's bad, isn't it? Anyway, so she's chatting and she's showing me pictures of these old women who look cold, right? Saying, look at her, that's Edna. You know, she's got no family. She, she can't pay the bills and all that. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, yeah. Anyway, it goes on for about 15 minutes and you, you feel bad. You give them your bank details, right? And what happens is every couple of months you get a letter from Edna. Well, it's, right. it's not from her. It's typed up and what have you. But, but there's a picture of Edna, right? And it's saying, oh, this December, you know, Edna's going to be extra cold. It's cold outside. She can't afford to pay the heat and what have you. Yeah. Keep going, right? So you keep paying every month like five pounds, whatever. Get another letter a few months later, right? Edna's sat there. She's got a tan. <laughs> what do you mean she's got a tan? Well, when they said, you know, she's cold, I thought they meant for the heating, not to send her on holiday for a month. She sat there with a tan. I'm not joking. <laughs> Are you sure it wasn't just a sort of a slight problem in the printing? No, no, definitely. Sure, she, it wasn't she looked no, well happy. Sure, it wasn't liver failure. This is a terrible thing to say, but when I see those people approaching now with the clipboards on the street, yeah. I always get my mobile phone out and pretend yeah, I have a I've conversation. Done that one. The number of fake conversations I've had walking past them now. Well, I felt sorry for them because right? I thought that, that you know, to be fair, I, I, I've got about ten standing orders where yeah. I felt sorry from a court. Right, I thought they're doing a good deed. The least yeah. I can do. I find out they're on about eight quid an hour. Are yeah. they? Yeah. They're not just doing it out of the kindness of their hearts. Well, I don't want to lie I thought they were volunteers. I thought that was at least why I should feel guilty. If no. they're getting paid to do it. I don't know. I could be wrong. I think they do. What? I've heard they get, they get paid and that. Well, if someone knows, maybe uh, email you know, us. Email podcast you? at rickygervais.com is how you can get in touch with us. If, if, if you it, know if these guys are getting uh, they're fleecing us twice. Uh, you know, I, I, I heard something. Carl thinks that you you think they're not. I don't know anything, but no, anything that will allow me. But to let's not feel find guilty. out because uh, you know I don't want to. I don't want to slag them off because they're obviously doing a good thing. So we find this out. It's, uh, you know, this is an educational show. I tell you what, though, right? Because we've we've talked about homeless people before and that. And I walked past one the other day. He's always cheerful, right? But don't you think, right? If you had a company, it's worth taking them on because they never have a lie in. Brilliant. I'm finding it quite exhausting now because a lot of the homeless I've encountered recently, they don't even now, they're not even after my money. They're just, they're just looking for conversation. While I was walking along the other day, and I don't know what you're supposed to say to this, mm. we were both walking, happened to be both passing a Chinese restaurant. He glanced in, he looked, he looked back around at me, he went, woman in there with three phones, three mobile phones. Why does she need three mobile phones? Mm. Got nothing to say to that. Got no opinion. Got absolutely no opinion of it. And I was thinking, what's going to you know, and you know that thing when you sort of suddenly you got across the road conveniently? to just get out of it but and there's another mad woman who started going she, she was walking past me she went do you want to come to my church I went no I, I don't believe in God she went do you believe in God oh 20 minutes conversation 20 minutes it was unbelievable I got to a point where I was so angry with her I was shouting out from across the other side of the room I was the one who sounded like a nutter going <laughs> there isn't a God and, but, you see when, when does it become like bad to avoid people like that do you know what I mean? Because some people say you shouldn't, you know, that they're, they're people, they're people like us, they've just had a bit of bad luck. Well, of course they are. Yeah, I know, but I remember one on, on our estate, right? And she was a bit, 
what's what's the word that you can use because I don't want to offend anyone. But I'd, I'd say me, men, yeah, but sort of mental homeless. Is that a term? <laughs> that's the official term. That's, I think that is the that's that the, is the new yeah. official term. It's it's mental homeless itis. Right. So <laughs> she uh, she lived on the estate and what have you and. She aged. Pretty. How was she homeless if she lived on the estate? Well, she sort of decided to stay around there because I think oh, people right. on the estate spoke to her more than people who had money. Do you know what but I mean? Really? I was going to say, why would they? Why would she choose an estate to not to live in as opposed to a, like a, a, a walled sort of lovely community? Yeah. What? What? Why well, not go to St John's Wood or? Yeah, yeah, or I'd hang around in maybe, say, the maze in Hampton Court. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah. no, one's, no one's expecting to see a homeless person as they're trying to find their way around well, that. The, Imagine the, the, the cash you'd make during the summer. The, the rich sort of Victorians used to keep sort of homeless in there as a little folly, and they used to pay them um, at the end if they stayed there for like three years. Uh, what, where, what do you mean? Were they pay It was to fashionable what? to have a little, like a little uh, homeless little hobbit in your, in your <laughs> outhouse. Seriously. And, and what did they have? Did they have to do anything for the money? Run, dance, no, they just had to tigers? be there. No, they had to, they had to be there when they brought around. They go, look, that's our that's our little um, cat weasel fella <laughs> right. living living in our folly. Yeah, and then they were they got money, you know, at the end of it. There's just like really rich sort of Victorians and stuff. That's yeah. a great idea. They should definitely bring that back. Because you see, I would give a lot more to shelter and, and those kind of charities if I could have a homeless guy if they, and do my bidding. I could make him and dance. And they had a really long beard yeah. and rags. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, they could, I could just make them do dances for me or, you know. And it was somewhat magical, possibly. That yeah, would go, Riddle me short. dee, fiddle me do. <laughs> what is my name and yeah. who are you? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. so this mental There's a little homeless. idea for shelter if anyone's listening. Yeah. Mental homeless woman on mm. the estate. Um, and what she used to do. Right, she she acted quite normal, and she used to always push push like a, a pram 